A very good morning to all. At the very outset, let me extend warm wishes of the International Women's Day to you all present here. The dental education programs and workshops are an inseparable part of any postgraduate training. It serves to maintain, develop, and increase the knowledge, skills, and also the clinical performance. The Department of Orthodontics, ABSMIDS, since its inception in 1985, has emphasized the need to keep up with the global trends and technical advancements in the ever-evolving era of the orthodontics by always conducting professional development programs by various experts on the contemporary topics that have been of great benefit to the orthodontic fraternity. Today's workshop on functional jaw orthopedics, principles and techniques revisited is one such attempt towards the same. This will be conducted in a blended mode that is both online and offline that would enable us to connect to a greater audience. Without much further ado, I request Dr. Sanchana to start this workshop on an auspicious note with a prayer. Vakratunda Mahakaya Surya Kodi Samaprabha Nirvignam Guru Medevo Sarvakari Shu Sarvada Thank you, Dr. Sanchana. I now welcome all the guests and dignitaries onto the dais to formally inaugurate the program with lighting of the lamp. I now request all the dignitaries to kindly take their seat. May I now request our HOD, Dr. M. S. Ravi, for the welcome address. Good morning to one and all. So first of all, uh, let me wish on this precious day, let me wish a happy International Women's Day to all of you. So on that happy note, I'm here uh, to give the welcome address for this program. So respected uh, a very lovable person, Professor Shripati Rao, the pro vice chancellor of pro chancellor of pro vice chancellor of Yenapaya University, our guest of honor, Dr. Neelan Shetty, principal of AJ Institute of Dental Sciences, uh, the one of the resource persons for today's program, Dr. Nanda Kumar, professor of orthodontics at Meenakshi Dental College, Chennai, my dear colleagues. Azar and Kaushik, who are the coordinators for this program. My dear staff members, uh, invited guests from other colleges, uh, invited uh, delegates, my dear PGs, staff, and ladies and gentlemen. So today is a, 
this is the second program for the year from our department. We just concluded uh, the value added course on dental clinical photography, hands on photography course, just a couple of weeks back. So we are here again for another workshop, uh, again, hands on workshop on functional jaw orthopedics, simply called as the growth modification techniques. Uh, this particular topic is not something new or not something contemporary. Uh, this concept has been there for a few centuries together. Of course, the concepts have changed. New, new techniques have come up. New, new appliances have been designed. And a lot of additional inputs, theories have come up. More than anything else, this particular topic is selected at this time of the year, keeping in mind the MDS examination. So this topic is one of the major topics for our MDS uh, final year examinations. 25% of the practical examination is on this particular topic. So I thought it is apt to have it during this time of the year when the MDS examination is just going to be another two months from now, is going to be a revision for our PGs. Uh, not only the theory, and also we have the hands-on technique also of the bite registration, followed by the clinical tips for managing this clinical management of these patients. So this growth modification, you all know, it's either growth restriction or growth simulation of the maxilla or the mandible. So we have two experts in the field to enlighten us on various techniques, the newer developments on this particular uh, uh, field, a subspeciality of orthodontics, uh, Professor Nanda Kumar, who is a professor Professor Jayade, uh, Chetan Jayade, who is coming online from Hubli. Uh, I thought it is, uh, they are the best persons to, you know, deliberate on this particular uh, topic. So on this occasion of inauguration of this program, when we requested Professor uh, Shripati Rao, who is one of the senior most uh, dental surgeons of this region, who's been working in Manipal Dental College initially, then was in Libya for some time, then he came back to Mangalore as principal of Enapayo Dental College, which he served for quite a long time, and he's been credited for the development of that particular college to the level that is at present uh, one of the best colleges in, in and around Mangalore. And now presently he's been elevated to the post of uh, Pro Vice Chancellor. Sir, it is indeed our great honor to have you with us on this occasion. So I, uh, on behalf of the department, the college and the university, I welcome you, sir. May I request Shamikta, our PG, to welcome, sir, with the token of our love and affection. I'm happy to say here that we have received nearly 400 registrations for this program, uh, spanning from, uh, it is pan-India registration, starting from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. We have representations from uh, uh, Northeast, from Gujarat also, from all over India. And I'm happy to say that more than 100 colleges, people have registered for this program. So that shows the importance of having a good speakers. The credentials of the speakers is mainly resp responsible for this, plus the importance of the topic. Though it is not, as I said earlier, though it is not the hot topic, no, though it is not something which is recently introduced, but a very, very important topic, uh, both for PG level as well as for clinical practice. So here again, I'm very happy to have one more our uh, alumnus, Professor Nilan Shetty, who was our uh, BDS and MDS student. 
also he was the faculty for some time in our department then he has moved on to aj institute of dental sciences as professor head of the department and now he is the principal of that college nilan thank you very much and wholeheartedly i welcome you for this uh, program may i request sundar to please welcome sir of course as i said earlier the resource persons uh, i need not tell more about them the number of registrations uh, their popularity itself is reflected in the number of colleges that is being reflected in the uh, registration professor nanda kumar who was our mds student way back in 95 to 97 he has been the professor and head of the department of meenakshi dental meenakshi amma dental college he was also the principal of that college and also been the registrar of meenakshi academy of higher education he has now continuing in the same college as a professor in the department of nandu uh, in the professor of uh, orthodontics uh, fondly called as nandu uh, wholeheartedly i welcome you for this program he has traveled all the way from chennai may I request romit please welcome sir with the so this is one of our uh, university initiative called as a green initiative where we don't give uh, flower bouquets now instead thank you so we have one more resource person chetan jayade uh, who is coming online uh, sir is from uh, hubli he has been a professor of orthodontics in uh, uh, darwad college various other colleges in andhra now he is into dedicated himself to uh, the orthodontic research and education he has started his own uh, institute called as uh, orthodontic research and education so he is a director of core it is called as core center of orthodontic research and education son of a illustrious father uh, uh, vijay jayade sir who all of us you know one of the the very well respected uh, member of indian orthodontic society and dr jayade he has been continuing in his father's footsteps one of the most sought after speakers in various national and international uh, conferences uh, chetan uh, uh, thank you very much the when i spoke to him first I requested him to be the resource person the only request he had is only if you give me half an hour's time for interaction with the delegates i will accept this so delegates you know what is his uh, requirement so question and answer sessions discussion please make use of his knowledge his expertise have all your clear doubts cleared okay examination anyway is coming up so he is there to help us so he will be delivering lectures in the morning session followed by dr nanda kumar's lecture and then in the afternoon we will have live demonstration of bite registration and uh, uh, clinical tips so dr chetan welcome to this program the online we wish you were here present among us but due to his busy schedule you know i told you he is one of the most sought after persons in ida and uh, orthodontic societies so, thank you very much chetan thank you very much for accepting our invitation and being here with us today for this program our coordinators dr azhar and dr kaushik my staff members all the pgs all my other faculty depart uh, college faculty professors head of the departments and delegates i welcome you all again for this program i am sure you will not be disappointed i am sure Uh, both the uh, speakers are here to clear all our doubts you know make the concept sure what it is that is very very important for the examination point of view so i welcome all of you have a nice day thank you thank you sir for that very warm welcome 
Now I request Dr. Kaushik Shetty, lecturer, Department of Orthodontics, ABSMIDS, to introduce the speakers for the day, Dr. A. Nandakumar and Professor Dr. Chetan Jaide. A very good morning to one and all. I consider consider it a privilege to be introducing the resource persons for today's program, Professor Dr. Chetan Jayade and Professor Dr. A. Nandakumar. Firstly. Dr. Professor, Professor Dr. Chetan Jayade completed his MDS in STM Dental College, Darwad from Rajiv Gandhi University in 2001 and then did his M. Ortho from Edinburgh University in 2004. His dissertation won the national award for the best thesis in 2001. Sir has been an invited speaker at various national and international conferences in the field of orthodontics. He has also held a few positions such as Regional Dental Advisor to the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, Secretary of the Beck Study Group of Indian Orthodontic Society, Chairman of Council for Scientific Affairs, Indian Orthodontic Society 2015, and serves as an on the editorial board of Journal of Indi Indian Orthodontic Society. He has also authored a few textbooks wherein he has contributed to the book Refine Beck for Modern Times 2007, is a co-author of textbook titled Essentials of Orthodontic Biomechanics 2011, author of textbook Class 2 Correction Demystified with Fixed Class 2 Correctors, which is still in progress. Thank you for being a part of our program, sir. We have another dynamic resource person for the day, Professor Dr. A. Nandakumar. He has completed his MDS from Abhishetty Memorial Institute of Dental Sciences in the year 1997 and is an IBO certified orthodontist. He has 10 national and three international publications and four patents to his name. He has been awarded best PG outgoing student from the state of Karnataka, best PG student by Pierre Fauchard Academy and best research award by the Indian Orthodontic Society. Thank you for being a part of our program, sir. I'm sure our participants are going to have a very fruitful learning experience today. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, sir. It's my pleasure to invite our chief guest for the day, Dr. B. H. Sripati Rao, to kindly address the gathering. Very good morning to all of you. Um, Dr. M. S. Ravi, the HOD of uh, Orthodontics, guest of honor, Dr. Leenal Chitti, resource person, Dr. Nandakumar, and uh, Professor Chetan Jayade, all the faculty members of AB Shetty Institute invited guests and uh, the postgraduate students from uh, various institutions. At the outset, um, greetings from NFA deemed to be university. As a pro vice chancellor of the university, I take great pleasure in um, thanking all of you for giving this opportunity to be, to be here as a part of uh, today's workshop being held in this beautiful auditorium. <clears throat> it's always a great pleasure coming here. I always keep telling this to um, all my colleagues that coming to ABC is as good as uh, going to my own institute Be because from the very inception of this institution, I am connected with this. We are from 94 onwards, I was the Dean of uh, Enipa Dental College. Before uh, that, uh, Manipal. So I used to have interaction with the faculty and the dean of this college from the very, very inception. So this college is very, very dear to me because I'm honored to be with all my old friends and the faculty of Abhishekti. I would like to congratulate Dr. Ravi for organizing such a beautiful uh, workshop, a very useful topic for the benefit of the postgraduates in the aspiring young orthodontics. A very well selected topic, I think, is the functional jaw orthopedics, its principles and techniques revisited. 
my dear postgraduates always i believe that for postgraduates is nothing like attending any workshop or seminar is most uh, an appropriate thing to do see nowadays there are so many national international conferences coming out people encourage that you have to attend this conferences but my view is that yes if possible you attend but if at all you get maximum benefit is only through this small workshops and interaction what you are going to have as a post graduate you will learn lot of things so my i used to always encourage my post graduate uh, at a, a ydc to attend all the seminars and workshop irrespective of where it is because one beauty about this place is that wherever we conduct any program we invite all the neighbors because as the professionals as the good neighbors we always enjoy exchanging the knowledge with the students of every college because knowledge has to be shared it you know it should not be confined only to a small group so that way i think we are all fortunate to have a very good understanding between the institutions and it's going on well my dear post graduate you are all very very fortunate to be in this institution because this has carved a niche in the a field of dentistry because today people speak very high about your institution is not only speaking it has been proved that it is one of the topmost college in the country it comes within the 10th rank for the last is not one year is for the last so many years i noticed that your your college is always in the first 10 colleges really creditable because i seen the progress how it has grown from uh, you were uh, abc city circle you had that small building from there to this old building and today in this new beautiful premises because the management is always supportive and progressive that's why today i see that there is so much of development and it looks beautiful at this juncture i'll tell you in the present scenario no management will dare to spend on dental colleges but exception is your institute your management has gone out of the way to invest so much on this so you should be grateful to them and you are all that's why i said you are all fortunate to be in a college which has the best of infrastructure and the good faculty because you see all the most of the senior faculty they are there from almost from the beginning that's an asset is it not any college will not come up only with a building unless you have good the team of faculty members we make a name only if there is a good teaching and a good uh, training goes on that is there in this college and recently i think you also got one more award for uh, doing the highest rural services it is true see i tried my level best in my institution to develop rural centers i could not go beyond the five or six this institution i think uh, more than 20 22 and spread over uh, three districts i think three or five five districts excellent see dentistry is very very important that it should go to the nook and corner of the you know place that's how the abc city has developed so many centers all over and is a well recognition by the government of india i mean uh, by the national level body to award as one of the finest college giving a rural service so you all should be very very proud of this and as a neighbor i feel very very proud when i see that uh, my own neighboring college is in the top 10 uh, ranking of the uh, this national body so you all should be very very proud of that now this college has not come up just like that i have seen the efforts and uh, the you know hardship what your seniors have undergone the credit goes to the you know the founder principal of this college dr shridhar chetty he was a guide not only for your institution for all the college in the country i should say as the president of the country he really helped to develop most of the institution after that prasad and uh, today you have the dynamic uh, principal dr krishna nayak See, I have a you know special affinity for Krishna because I see him as an undergraduate student at Manipal. He was my student at Manipal, and from that day I have noticed him. You know, he has that leadership quality. And one more uh, good quality about him is, you know, he is very humble and respectful, respectful for to his uh, elders and the teachers. And that's what has carried him to this position today. His humbleness and his dedication and go-getter nature has brought him to this level today. so i'm very very proud of his achievement in his absence i would like to you know wish him all the best and uh, i wish that uh, he'll reach 
to a higher level in the profession in the years to come with these few words and uh, one word about uh, the hod i know dr ms ravi for the last few years very quiet person to look at but one of the most dedicated uh, teacher and uh, excellent clinician we are all you know fortunate to have a teacher like him in your miss to teach orthodontics god bless you ravi and do well and uh, one more thing about the i was just thinking about this. your alumni is one of the strongest body i should say you know why i know that you are uh, there are so many senior institutes in the country or uh, very old institutes in the country but when you consider the abct institute your alumni are spread all over the globe and one more thing i can proudly say that any college you go in the country you will see at least one graduate from here as a teacher that's only abct i am not telling because i come here today this i told in the past also because as a council member i used to go around and see i used to meet mangalore that means they are from abct not from any other college so that's the you know you should be very very proud that um, this institution has produced the stalwarts in the field that's how today you have nand kumar here in the mess i am sure he will be very proud to be back to his own alumni and uh, to his own uh, institute and to be a guest speaker today it's a proud moment not only for you for all your teachers if krishna was there he would have been very very happy to see you here so that's how we as teachers what we want is only that isn't it we feel very proud when our student fare well in the profession and you know do extremely well we feel very very proud about it so i think uh, abct has produced enough number of uh, faculty and when there was a dearth of faculty members in the country i think you, your people have helped indirectly uh, by you know providing the faculty members so the profession should be very grateful to abct for that dr neel and shetty is uh, one of the upcoming principal of uh, abct institute a very renowned orthodontist i'm very happy that at an engage he has taken over as the dean of the college you got a long way to go try your level best to take it to higher level you know i know in the present situation there is a limitation but still whatever you can do uh, you do it and we'll be very very proud of you and thank you one and all for giving this opportunity opportunity to be here and um, uh, god bless all of you and i i'm sure today i don't want to speak about this uh, topic because stalwarts are sitting here both nand kumar and chetan are uh, excellent speakers so he'll be immensely benefited as the chetan has been pointed any deliberation if it goes without a discussion is a useless i always feel that because you don't know to what extent you have followed and if you go back with all the doubts in your mind it's of no use is it not so please spend at least half an hour discussing your doubts with the speakers clarify and go all the best god bless all of you thank you sir for your kind and motivating words may i now request dr nilan shetty principal aj institute of dental sciences mangalore to sh share his views on this program a very good morning to one and all at the outset may i wish all the wonderful women out here a very happy international women's day <laughs> it gives me a great honor and indeed i am very humbled to have it been invited as a guest of honor to my own alma mater it was in the year 1991 i guess it was september a 17 year old boy who just walked into this college as an undergraduate student i saw my what can i say the stalwarts of the dentistry who were adorning these places dr c dr shetty late dr suresh chandra and then whom we fondly call as boss dr us krishna naik and today i may not say that i am at an young age but a maybe at an early stage in my career 
probably sitting in those places maybe destiny has taken me this into this field that into this position where i am nevertheless it's indeed an honor and humble to be here probably over the last 30 years that i have been into this profession working towards my own speciality from 91 onwards and then working in this college for almost four and a half five years as a faculty my own teachers krishna sir and dr ravi sir whom i learned something about orthodontics and today i am here as a academician come clinician because of the blessings of all of these people most revered and respected dr shripati rao sir my teacher and guru dr ms ravi sir dr nanda kumar who is my senior who was my senior in 1997 and then a good friend dr chetan jayade who again is a well wisher of personally and also of our college all these people whom you can see are here because of their achievements and over the years what they have done to the profession i can also see some familiar faces among the audience also pardon me for not naming each one of them but for the youngsters or the post graduates who are here today is an era of ideas and innovation if you don't innovate yourself if you don't learn the newer techniques if you are not willing to take those chances take those risks you will be left behind i can imagine when in 1991 when i came to ab shetty and this place was a forest we hardly used to come here whenever i used to come there was only one bus that used to take us apart from the college bus and today it has become a city like itself and let alone that the college has transformed itself like no other college in the country that's simply because that's simply because of the ideas and innovations that are coming into the fore for example this wonderful auditorium itself is again an innovative idea the college being built in such a way and even today wherever i go i feel proud about myself that i am an alumni of ab shetty memorial institute of dental sciences and as sir said it beat any part of the globe you will at least find one ab shetty at there in any of the dental functions or conferences or workshops you go you'll you'll find one of your own there that's the reach or the global reach of abcity memorial institute of dental sciences also greetings from you from aj institute of dental sciences as its principal we are relatively a young college spending uh, celebrating its two decades of existence in the year 2022 and as sir said even though we are fiercely competitive amongst each other it is also important that each one of us cooperate with each other in learning and understanding the skills that are there in the world today and for that reason if and when wherever there is a program a cd maybe a workshop maybe or a hands on course maybe all the four five colleges that are there cooperate with each other by participating in it and the that is the very essence of a program and you can see that in the number of people that have attended here not just here as sir said you know more than 400 people who have who are attending it online 
of course that is the power of the two speakers that are here with these few words i once again thank dr us krishna ayak sir and dr ravi sir for inviting me here for giving me this opportunity to be amongst yourself i i never uh, ever miss a chance whenever i want to whenever there is an opportunity to come to my alma mater i always take it as a pride and always try to come to the college just because not just to as a participant but also because so that i can interact with some of my old colleagues my teachers quite a few of them and also some of the students uh, in the department as well so it's always a very nice home coming for me whenever i get an opportunity and thank you very much sir for giving me this opportunity once again and i hope this program will be a grand success thank you one and all thank you sir may i now request dr a nand kumar professor department of orthodontics meenakshi amal dental college chennai who is also the resource person for today to share his remarks on this program good morning one and all respected people on and off the dais staffs and students before i start uh, i wish you all a happy women's day um i feel very nostalgic coming back to the college because after uh, so many years because i remember uh, um, doing my post graduation in the bunch hostel circle in a very small place where uh, uh, it used to be i i i won't call it as a college like home you know you have very less space to run around wherever you go you bump against each other coming to this mammoth structure here it feels really good uh, and uh, you be, you all of you are very lucky to uh, study here and being an alma mater um, very nostalgic and talking about uh, boss us krishnan naik uh, i would say he will be he is one of the best uh, head of departments uh, whom i have seen i also have been one uh, i have learned a lot from him uh, he used to give a very free hand to work okay come what may and when it needs to be when 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 it needs to be punished you are punished when it needs to be encouraged you are encouraged so that's how we were all nurtured and uh, hopefully because of that i am here today next is uh, dr ravi sir a uh, lot of memories with uh, ravi sir because ravi sir completed his uh, undergraduate in anamla university and his post graduation in anamla university and i completed my undergraduate in anamal university when i was a uh, final year sir was doing his first year pg so when i joined ab shetty and avenue sir would be here so when i entered the department and saw ravi sir's name it was like it was like a jackpot okay i know at least somebody imagine a guy coming from deep south chennai coming to ab shetty mangalore from one coast to the other okay it's quite a long distance so uh language is the barrier place is new and at least you should know somebody whom you know so ravi sir was there and i was feeling really happy that i know at least somebody uh, from my old college and uh, like ab shetty anamala university alma mater is also very very strong because that was the only college other than uh, government college in the south in tamil nadu which used to be there so either you you study in chennai or you study in anamala university only two colleges were there so you should know how many people must have passed out in alma mater strong and uh, i should confess and say sorry to sir because i used to torture him so badly uh, after college uh, 6:30 i'll be in his clinic sitting outside he will asking me again you have come today to irritate me yeah. from 7:30 to 8:30 he'll be with me that's not thing he'll say i'm hungry sir you buy something for me then only i'll go so this not this not one or two days it will be at least two or three days in a week i i, I hope you remember sir and uh, thank you very much for that sir for be- <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for sir, for all for all that and that's really paid off for me today and uh, uh, yeah thank you sir thank you for calling me uh, for one sec- uh, calling me for this uh, function and thank you very much thank you
Thank you, sir, for being with us here today. Uh, we also have amidst us Professor Dr. Chetan Jayde, who is the director for CORE, that is the Center of Orthodontic Research and Education, Hubli, who has joined us online. Sir, uh, would you please like to share a few words? Good morning to one and all, uh, present at the Abhishethi Institute of Dental Sciences, the wonderful auditorium that I can see here. I'm really happy to be part of this workshop, the Functional Jaw Orthopedics Principles and Techniques Revisited, the second program being conducted by the Abhishethi Department of Orthodontics for this year. When Dr. Ravi uh, called me up and he said that let's have a program which would be in conjunction with the PG convention because earlier the PG convention dates were late February. It was a double whammy for me. I knew that I would be with Dr. Nilan in his college and then I would also get to lecture in uh, Abhishekhi as well. But then as luck would have ha had it, the dates got uh, changed and therefore we had to have an alternate day along with a blended learning such as this. I'm indeed happy to be uh, still participating and I hope that we will be, both Dr. Nandakumar and myself, we would be adding value to whatever uh, is being shared on this particular topic. I must acknowledge that the people who are sitting on the dais and also I'm sure in the auditorium, the luminaries, have definitely paved way for a really large scheme of things in dentistry and orthodontics as such. Dr. Shri Patira, whom I knew from my undergraduate days because he used to visit SDM college very often, he used to spend time with uh, our principal, our dear principal, Dr. Bhaskara at that time. Dr. Nilan Shetty, whom I've always known as a very close friend. He was in fact uh, the first examiner, co-examiner with whom I had a BDS exam uh, as me being the internal and him being the external. Dr. Nanda Kumar, whom I've shared very fond memories uh, right from our PG days and subsequently, and all the other ABCT staff, Dr. Krishnanak, uh, not to forget because he's been the backbone for ABCT Dental College for a long time and all the wonderful faculty there. I'm sure that in the next month when the PG convention would be held, I would be able to meet all of you in person, but for the time being, uh, I'll be lecturing online. I wish the program all the success, and I would like to thank Dr. Ravi and the entire team from the Department of Orthodontics for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this program. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was an honor listening to you. As we've reached the uh, come to the end of this inaugural session, may I request Dr. Azhar Mohamed, Reader, Department of Orthodontics, ABSMIDS, to confer the vote of thanks. A very good morning to one and all. A happy Women's Day. On behalf of the Organizing Committee, Department of Orthodontics, ABCT Memorial Institute of Dental Sciences, NITTE deemed to be university, I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. First and foremost, we extend our wholehearted gratitude to the Chancellor and Vice Chancellor of the NITTE deemed to be university for all the supports towards our endeavors. I owe special gratitude to our Chief Guest, Professor B.H. Sripati Rao, and Guest of Honor, Professor Dr. N. Nilan Chetty who have graciously accepted our invitation and for being a constant source of support and encouragement. I kindly request Dr. M.S. Ravi to hand over the memento to guest, the Chief Guest, Dr. Sripati Rao. Kindly request Dr. M.S. Ravi to hand over the moment to the guest of honor, Dr. Professor Dr. Neelan Shetty.
I extend gratitude to our resource persons, Professor Dr. Chetan Vijayade and Professor Dr. A. Nandakumar for graciously accepting our invitation and imparting their vast knowledge and expertise to the students. I'm sure the students will greatly benefit from their lectures. I kindly request Dr. Professor Dr. Saidat to hand over the memento to Professor Dr. A. Nandakumar. Also request Dr. Saidat to symbolically uh, present a moment to, to Professor Dr. Jayde. I especially thank our Dean and Professor uh, Principal, Professor Dr. U.S. Krishnanayak, who is a constant source of encouragement. Sir, your guidance has helped us every step of this way. I wholeheartedly thank our head of the department, Professor Dr. M. S. Ravi, for his unstinted guidance through conceptualizing, planning, and execution of this program that has brought into fruition. I thank all the distinguished head of the departments, staff, and student delegates who have joined us both in person as well as online for attending the program. I thank Mr. Praveen Udupa from A1 Logics for technical assistance. Last but not the least, special thanks to all the staff, the Department of Orthodontics, both teaching and non-teaching for your cooperation. With all your encouragement, we hope to continue to have many more workshops and CD programs in the coming year. Thank you and all have a great day. Thank you, sir. This brings us to the end of the inaugural session. The online lectures will commence shortly. I request all the postgraduates to kindly be seated and make best use of the lectures. Thank you, one and all. Uh, good morning, sir. Dr. Chetan Jayade, sir. So if you if you are ready, can we start the session? Am I audible? Yes, sir. You're audible. So we're ready to start. Okay, that's that's a better view for me. Dr. Chetan. Good morning, sir. Yes, good morning. Very good morning. So we are all eagerly waiting for your uh, lecture. Uh, we have uh, tickets from 
Enopaya Dental College, Shrinivas, M. Cots, Mangalore, and uh, of course our own college. They are all waiting for your lecture. Thank I'm you. Really yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. And uh, good morning to everybody. Again, a happy International Women's Day to all the uh, ladies here. And I must say it's a happy men's day also, because if you keep women happy, I'm sure all the men would re definitely remain happy. Today's program is a special one because it's a blended program with a few online lectures. And uh, of course, my other co-faculty, Dr. Nanda Kumar, would be doing a live session with a hands-on program. Uh, without any further ado, let's start with the lectures because this is going to be quite intense. We're going to have three lectures in the morning and uh, then there will be a clinical session and we'll also try to keep space for an open session also. I hope my screen is visible, sir. Yeah, if, if you are ready to go, uh, I'll, I'll just start off. I wish I was here today at the A.B. Shetty uh, Memorial Dental College. Uh, always wanted to be a part of such programs in person, but the pandemic has taught us a few lessons. It's taught us that never take life for granted. Also make the best of whatever time and opportunities that one gives, uh, one gets, and that's the way to go forward. So today's program, which is titled as the Functional Jaw Orthopedics, principles and techniques revisited. Uh, I will be starting off first with a couple of uh, uh, rather three lectures in the morning, which would be on mechanism of functional appliances, followed by the treatment planning for a functional appliance patient, and then uh, the clinical regimen that uh, clinically I would follow for a twin block uh, type of an appliance. So during the course of this presentation, I would urge all of you uh, to make maximum use of whatever material I'm sharing by way of uh, pictures, as well as certain articles which I will be referring to, which are of utmost importance because I know the audience is mostly that of postgraduate students and many of them who would be taking exam in the near future. So let's start with the first topic, which is the mechanism of action of functional appliances. If you go by the textbook definition, a functional appliance is one which postures the mandible forward, downward or downward and forward in order to get the uh, condyle out of the glenoid fossa and stimulate mandibular growth. This is the way profit would look at it. But for us, we are going to look at certain other things as well when we talk of the mechanism of functional appliance. I would start off by explaining the complexity of class two malocclusion and I will be limiting to growing children only. We are not going to talk about adult class two patients just now. In this particular talk, I'll also delineate the effects produced by functional appliances using the current and the available evidence, uh, both in terms of human studies as well as the animal data that we have. And I'm also going to have uh, uh, give a clinical protocol for the growth modulation strategies in the following lecture. And after these two lectures are over, probably we'll take a short break where we could answer a few uh, questions and then come back to the actual clinical handling of the twin block appliance. So let me start with the class two malocclusion. In fact, Moyers had said that do not use the term class two malocclusion because it's more like a syndrome. And that's why I always put it as an enigma. An enigma is something that is totally, uh, is not completely resolved because of the variety of presentation that you see. And for us as orthodontists, class two malocclusion is definitely an enigma. It's the most common skeletal malocclusion that an orthodont, uh, orthodontist could uh, see, definitely. At the same time, you would note that there are innumerable permutations and combinations in which the maxillomandibular discrepancies occur. In fact, we had a couple of twin patients in whom we tried to assess, and we found that even in uh, the monozygotic twins, we did see some differences in the dental and the skeletal nature of class two that existed. So to say that there is a there is going to be immense disparity and variation that you'll encounter. 
and therefore not all class 2 patients can be treated alike. The other aspect that you should remember as postgraduates is, especially with class 2, that there is an additive effect from more than one skeletal dimension which contributes to the, convex, uh, to the complexity. What I mean by this is, we always look at uh, the class 2 malocclusion from the sagittal aspect. We would always say that the class 2 mandible is because of either uh, uh, the class 2 malocclusion is either because of an excess maxilla or a deficient mandible or a combination of the two. But many a times we forget and overlook the problem which is added on because of a transverse maxilla or sometimes because of a vertical descent of the ma maxilla which causes a downward and a backward rotation of the mandible. And therefore, all these need to be taken into consideration. I will talk about this in the next lecture when we talk on treatment plan. So coming for, uh, further, you should also remember that nearly one third of our population would have a uh, class two malocclusion, could be dental, could be skeletal, or could be a mixture of these. And almost 50%, especially in India and in Southern India, the number of patients who report to orthodontists would have a class two malocclusion of course, of varying severity. Some may be simpler to treat, some may be more uh, complex, and some may not respond at all to only orthodontic treatment and may need extensive correction at a later date. But we have to remember that this is the mainstay of orthodontics as such. Now, what about for postgraduates? Postgraduate students also should be very technically sound in handling patients who have a class two malocclusion. And when I say technically sound, you should know what were the concepts earlier, what are the present concepts, and where is it that we are headed towards. And that's where, what, what I'm trying to, go in, uh, trying to explain in this particular lecture. So now let's go back to the basics. Whenever we talk of problems in uh, the maxillomandibular region, we always remember this particular diagram by Prophet, in which he talks of the cranial complex, the maxilla, and the mandible. And let's look at a skeletal class two wherein the fault is with the maxilla. You could have either a maxillary uh, size, which is normal, but the maxilla is postured forward or uh, in excess in the sagittal direction alone. Or you could have simply a larger size maxilla, both contributing to a convexity in the profile and a class two skeletal malocclusion as such. As against this, you could have a skeletal class two with a fault in the mandible. And where would the fault be? Either the mandible is of a normal size, but retroposition, as would happen in some patients, uh, especially when you have a transversely deficient maxilla, or you could have a truly uh, retrognathic mandible because of a uh, smaller size of the corpus, ramus, or both. You need to identify which is the correct uh, aspect in a given patient and also what kind of combination exists. The third type, which is often missed or misunderstood is the one which is because of a backward rotation of the mandible. Now, in these situations, mainly it is the maxillary vertical descent that causes the mandible to rotate, sorry, to rotate downward and forward and thereby causing a relative mandibular deficiency and also a skeletal class 2 because the facial convexity would increase. Now, you need to identify as clinicians which of these components is involved. Is it a single component or multiple? And accordingly, try and address this particular problem. Added to this, as I mentioned earlier, in about 25%, that is one out of four class two patients that you see, there would be a possibility of a constricted maxillary arch. And this is from the data of Dr. McNamara. And uh, he, he propagates using the arch expansion for all the class two patients, irrespective of whether there's a crossbite or not. There is also the possibility of a vertical descent or rotation of the palatal plane alone, causing an opening up of the mandibular plane, which again needs a different type of intervention. And during the course of the next two presentations, I will show you a couple of cases in which even a high angle class two case can be managed if treated uh, at the right time. So that brings us to the question of where do the functional appliances fit in there? Because we are going to restrict only to the functional appliance growth modulation in this particular today's uh, lecture topics. 
So I would say that if you filter down the entire class to malocclusions of either maxillary excess, constriction, mandibular deficiency, etc., you would uh, it is necessary to have the emphasis on trying to target the jaw at fault. And I'm talking of this simply because there has been a differentiation in the way the class 2 malocclusion is looked upon by the European orthodontists and the way that the American counterparts looked at class 2 malocclusion. All of you are aware historically that the European orthodontists always promoted removal appliances, removal functional appliances, and growth modification techniques using removable functional appliances largely. Whereas if you look at the American counterparts, they would always look at the class 2 malocclusion as something immutable because it's genetically programmed. And therefore, they would simply try to restrict the growth of the maxilla using a different types of headgear and then uh, expect that the normal mandibular growth would occur and the class 2 would get corrected. Somewhere down the line in about 1970s, mid-70s, things started changing and the entire picture changed. And today what we have is more of an amalgamation in which we know that yes, there is a genetic involvement in the size of the mandible, definitely. You cannot change the size of the mandible truly. But at the same time, the condyle and the condylar cartilage is definitely amenable to growth stimulation at a particular age. And it would work by way of uh, different aspects such as condylar remodeling or the glenoid fossa remodeling. So we need to identify which is the jaw at fault and try to target it. Very important that it should be during the appropriate growth periods. Only then you will get a good amount of reasonable amount of success in a majority of patients. So I take you back a little bit into history. And we look at the year 1967 and 68, wherein there were two landmark articles, uh, both of which as postgraduate students, you should at least glance through, if not know it in great detail, uh, because there is a lot more that has come up in the last couple of decades also. But the two articles that I'm referring to, the first one was authored by late Dr. T.M. Graeber, the three M's, muscles, malformation, and malocclusion. And the second one, authored by a uh, Finnish orthodontist, Dr. Koski, which was cranial growth centers, facts, or calcium. Now, the, uh, this was a sort of a turning point because both these articles, especially the lecture by Dr. Koski, happened as a John Mershon Memorial Lecture in the year 1967 and was published in 1968 in the American Journal around the time when Dr. Graeber had also published this, uh, his article. And it opened the eyes for new research to be done, especially uh, considering what was the true nature of the condylar cartilage, whether the condyle could be actually changed, altered or not. Because till then, most of the people like Sisher and uh, others, Scott and others, had highlighted that the there was a genetic immutability of the condylar cartilage. So then people started looking at, uh, at uh, form versus function, whether any alteration in the function could affect the form. And there are numeric, numerous examples of such a thing being done wherein the several uh, South American tribal uh, tribals try to elongate the neck region by using these metal rings because that is considered more attractive by men in those regions. So you can see that literally this lady has a, a long neck, a tall neck, simply because of the number of rings, the metal rings that have been inserted around the neck and continuously holding the uh, cervical structure in an elongated manner. So this formed a sort of a theme or a scheme around which the functional appliance uh, therapy could uh, originate. So the basic premise that was post postulated by people like Lischer, Benno Lischer was that if abnormal function of musculature is responsible for a deviation in the form, that is especially the habits which could cause uh, a class 2 malocclusion, then Lischer argued that a reversal of this feature, especially during growth, should allow for a normalcy of growth. So this is nothing but simply interceptive uh, type of treatment wherein you are eliminating a cause which is causing an abnormal uh, functioning. So anything to enhance the musculature, the way in which the muscle function is occurring, should allow for normalcy of growth. 
And uh, this was highlighted not just by Lister, but subsequently by Dr. T. M. Graeber. And a very important name in this aspect when we talk of functional appliances is the anatomist Dr. Melvin Moss, because he was the one who, who gave us the functional matrix hypothesis, which laid the ground for understanding of form and function dicta. So as the Dr. Ravi was mentioning in his uh, welcome address that growth modulation has always relied on two things. One is trying to apply the forces to overpower musculature, what we call as the force application, thereby stimulate the bone remodeling. Or you could have the force elimination in which you are allowing for normalcy of growth to ensue following the removal of aberrant muscular stimuli. And the best examples you could see by way of different appliances themselves. Force application is the preferred method of all the removal, most of the removal appliances and all the fixed functional appliances. Whereas allowing normalcy of growth to occur is purely and beautifully highlighted when you look at the appliances such as the Frankel function regulator. There are others also which basically talk about improving the uh, muscle uh, force as well as the way in which the muscle contraction would occur. Now let's come to the basic question. So what is the effect of the functional appliance when you look at the entire gamut of skeletal and the dental uh, problems that a class two patient would have? And how is it based on the evidence, how much of the contribution is occurring because of skeletal changes and dental changes, etc. So as I mentioned earlier, it's not simply stimulating the mandible that one would look at as an orthodontist when you talk of class 2 malocclusions. Yes, definitely you should try and uh, improve the skeletal instability, whatever is arising. But remember that it, you, you may not be able to go beyond the genetic potential that is pre-programmed for the size of the mandible or the maxilla. You should also look at the various components of dentition that are involved in a class two. I mentioned about the transverse constriction of the maxilla. Likewise, you also have the mandibular dentition and the maxillary dentition, not just in the anteriors. When we talk of class two, we always talk of overjet, but we should also look at the posterior occlusion and the way that that can be improved Again, not just in the sagittal, but also in the vertical. Remember, majority of the class two patients that you would be seeing, in whom you would be giving functional appliances, would be those who have either a normodivergent facial pattern or a hypodivergent facial pattern, in whom you might have to actually stimulate dental eruption also, and thereby improving the overall facial height. So dental correction forms a very valuable contribution to the effect that a functional appliance can bring about. What about functional improvement? We talked about it earlier also. Correction of uh, the impervious habits such as the lip trap or any other habit that is coming against the way that the natural uh, skeletal growth would occur needs to be improved upon. So you can have appliances with multiple components. What have been coined by Dr. Wig as the hybrid appliances or what profit says as the component based approach in which you can mix different elements of a functional appliance in order to promote the functional growth also nobody stops you from using a lip pellet that a frankel regulator would have along with the lower block of a twin block appliance if the patient really needs it so likewise you need to modify your appliances to get functional improvement also. So this is one side of what the functional appliances could bring about. What is most neglected in most of the studies that uh, you would look, you would come across on functional appliances is the vast improvement in the soft tissues that the patient would have. No patient is going to come to you saying, doctor, please correct my class two molar relation. Would you? Would you ever think of getting a patient like that? They always come to you with two simple things. One is improve my smile, improve the way my face looks. And the improvement in the facial convexity, as I'll be showing with the, uh, uh, the soft tissue changes that are seen on profile, as well as the lip, in, lip incompetency being addressed because of uh, the functional appliance is immense, which in turn also helps in getting an improvement in the self-esteem of a patient. And therefore, whatever is the uh, associated psychological downturn because of peer ridiculing reduces. 
and the new area in which the functional appliance research has been progressing in the last decade has been on 3D analysis. 3D analysis of the condylar volume itself, a 3D analysis of the airway increase because there has been a lot of uh, effort being put forth by the, the sleep dental, uh, the dental association for sleep medicine in US in which they are trying to look at the 3D changes in prevention of a future obstructive sleep apnea uh, patient by simply treating them at the, in the, during the childhood. So these were some of the, or if you look at the overall picture. Now let's look at individually, what is the problem and how do you look at the skeletal effects that are produced by functional appliances? Most of the American literature has always equated functional appliance therapy to growing mandibles. And one of the biggest critics of functional appliances has been Dr. Lyle Johnston. And he says in one of his articles, he asks the question rather, can pieces of plastic grow mandibles? But unfortunately, the answer would be that we are not looking at only growing mandibles with functional appliances. The range of skeletal effects are seen in form of various components. Let's look at each of them individually. Condylar remodeling, which is definitely going to happen if you select the patient at the right age. Glenoid fossa remodeling, which is harboring the condyle, definitely has been shown by uh, uh, various researchers, especially the research group from Toronto. What about reposturing the mandible? Whenever you have a locked mandible, Lyle Johnston himself has talked of unlocking and allowing the potential of the mandible to be expressed, definitely from the sagittal aspect by way of reposturing. And very importantly, restraint of the maxilla itself. So whenever you are using an appliance to stimulate or accelerate the mandibular growth, there is going to be a reciprocal restraint on the maxillary dentition as well as the maxilla per se. All these put together would be the gamut of the skeletal effects produced. So, my dear postgraduate students, whenever an examiner asks you a question as to whether functional appliances do work and is there a skeletal change that is brought about, do not be stuck with only the condylar growth as, as the only way or lengthening of the mandible as the only thing that you are doing. You are in fact bringing about uh, changes in the skeletal area in all these, uh, all these places. If you are very lucky, in a patient, a given patient, where all these things happen, you know, it looks miraculous because all these get additive. Imagine a patient in whom there is a good amount of condylar remodeling and there is a backward and upward growth of the condyle as well as the ramus. The same patient also has a good amount of glenoid fossa descent and there is a restraint on the maxilla. The facial change is just dramatic. But some patients do not respond equally and therefore, you should know that the biologic variability is at hand. And therefore, the postulated figure or the expected figure for skeletal changes is somewhere to the tune of 35 to 40% only. So if I talk of an overjet of 10 millimeters and you expect the skeletal change to occur, it would be to the tune of 3 to 4 millimeters of skeletal change uh, in which the overjet gets corrected. The remaining 50% or more is always going to happen from the dental corrections that you're going to see. So let's look at the individual areas now. The condylar area and the glenoid fossa, because this is a very important aspect that you should remember. Now, functional appliances, as Dr. Ravi was mentioning earlier, is one of the important aspects, not just for your uh, practical exam, but also for your uh, the theory exam as well. During our time, it was paper three in which the entire growth modulation and functional appliances used to be asked. But nowadays, I see there is a mixture between paper two and three also in which these topics could be asked. So modus operandi of functional appliances or mechanism of functional appliances is one of the favorite questions for a theory examiner. So if you look at how do you actually explain the changes that are seen in the condyle as well as the glenoid fossa, there are two hypotheses that one can look at. One is the neuromuscular hypothesis, which has been proposed by people like Moss, Petrovic, and if you look at the, or if you read in detail, the Graeber-Rakosi-Petrovic uh, uh, textbook, you will get the entire 
theory, the servo system theory, which talks about how the mandibular growth stimulation would occur. I'll talk about that in a minute. The other hypothesis that has been proposed is the uh, one by the group from Toronto, which is uh, popularized by Dr. Woodoris as the growth relativity hypothesis. Now, both these have to be understood in order to explain the mode of uh, action of functional appliances in the condylar area and the glenoid fossa alone. So if you look at the neuromuscular hypothesis, what does it say? If you look at the, uh, the articles by Petrovic, he says that whenever you are using a functional appliance and you are getting the mandible posture forward, you are disoccluding the condyle from the fossa and the dentition also. What happens eventually is you are going to stimulate the lateral telegoid muscle and also the retrodiscal area. Because of which you are going to have an increased rate of condylar growth. And he uses the term coupling mechanism to explain the way in which the lateral pterygoid muscle conjuncts with the condyle and the, the stimulation of the lateral pterygoid muscle by way of mechanotransduction is able to stimulate the remodeling of the condylar growth or the chondrocytes themselves. And eventually, you would expect that there is a supplementary lengthening of the mandible. Now, this is a very simplistic way of looking at it. But you need to understand each of these aspects in detail whenever you are writing an answer for this. What about the non-muscular hypothesis, the growth relativity theory? In this, they did several animal experiments in order to find out what happens to the glenoid fossa when the condyle is displaced. Now, this is from the article by Woodoris which appeared in the American Journal of uh, Orthodontics in the year 99-2000, in which they were trying to correlate with uh, what was happening in the condyle, as well as the glenoid fossa. So le let me first explain this picture for you. The condyle is shown at the uh, lower right bottom, and the condyle is displaced from the glenoid fossa, postured and held forward. And what they tried to assess was, was there enough of growth, uh, the remodeling, active remodeling happening because of reposturing of the mandible? And what is shown here by the black arrows and what is seen as the highlighted golden uh, area here is nothing but the increased rate of remodeling that was taking place. And likewise, even in the condyle, in the distalmost area, posterior superior area of the condyle, you do see an increased rate of remodeling both going to say that when you posture the mandible forward, downward and forward, there is going to be a temporary, at least, skeletal improvement or an alteration in the rate of remodeling in these two areas. A simple question from biology. If you expect this rate of remodeling to convert itself into mature bone, how much time would it take? And this question was answered very well by the research group from Hong Kong, Dr. Rabi and others, who, sh who showed through their experiments on rats and could extrapolate the data. They said that you need to hold the mandible away from the glenoid fossa on an average for a time period of roughly one year for the complete conversion of this immature bone that you are going to see in, in this picture to something that is uh, completely uh, remodeled and mature bone after the period of functional appliance treatment. So if you look at the entire scheme of things, I will show you another picture in which this will be highlighted uh, because this animation did not work when we tried in the uh, morning. But what we are trying to highlight here is whenever the mandible is uh, brought forward, there is going to be a stretch in the viscoelastic tissues in the retrodiscal area. So in the retrodiscal area, there is going to be a viscoelastic stretch, which in turn increases two things. It increases the vascularity, and it also increases the secondary messengers. Now, these are very important because you should understand the term mechanotransduction, the transferring of a mechanical force into a biological optimal result. So what is the stimulus here? It is a mechanical stimulus by way of disoccluding the mandible from the fossa. The mechanotransduction that takes place is to help in increase the rate of remodeling by way of, uh, which is initiated when you look at increased vascularity and the secondary messengers being seen. 
and the end result is a good amount of bone formation both in the fossa as well as the condyle now this is a very brief summary of what the viscoelastic theory would uh, talk to you about now let's go a little further into animal experiments as well as the data from uh, old time animal experiments so the experiments have been done basically on two types of animals either its primates or rodents and the uh, studies which were done way back by people like Breitner, Meikle, McNamara and Woodside who are among the prominent people, they have shown certain characteristic findings and most of these are common to uh, most of the primate experiments. What they found was that the results whenever you uh, get the mandible forward would be an increased remodeling of the condylar head in the posterior direction. This is very important and that actually that is seen in the human experiments when you look at superimpositions or even MRI data that some people have done. What about the data from uh, in terms of the biochemical changes or the gene expression? You would see that uh, several studies have been done, but the prominent ones you should be able to note are the ones done by uh, Professor Rabi in Hong Kong, University of Hong Kong. So they did a series of experiments which were published in the early 2000s way up till 2007. And then there have been uh, people like Dr. Shen who have been talking a lot about the growth modulation. I would urge postgraduate students to look at two uh, prominent articles. One is the Journal of Dental Research 2007 in which Dr. Meikle has talked about the overall craniofacial adaptation uh, using all these hypotheses as well as the animal data. The other one is the changes in the condyle uh, again, in the Journal of Dental Research in the year uh, 2013, which has been mentioned by Dr. Shen, and he talks about the overall changes that these appliances could be brought about, uh, that could bring about. So what are the important uh, summary or the take home for you? The transcription factor SOX9, which is so very important in endochondlossification, as well as the type 2 collagen, which get upregulated in the glenoid fossa whenever you get whenever you do mandibular forward posturing. And this is an important attribute because Rabi found this not just in growing rodents, but also in adult uh, rats. What does that tell you? If you are to use a functional appliance, even in adult or younger adult uh, uh, individuals as such, you would still get some amount of increase in the remodeling rate. And this has been documented again by Dr. Panchers when he did his uh, studies, clinical studies using the herbs to plants. The other uh, main expression molecule that gets expressed is that of the Indian hedgehog, what is also called as the IHH. And you have another factor called as the vascular endothelial growth factor or the VEGF, which is again needed for increasing the endocondyl ossification. So all three, that is SOX9, the type 2 collagen, Indian hedgehog, as well as the vascular endothelial growth factor, all get in, uh, increased in terms of their uh, uh, formation in that area, in the condyle as well as the fossa, thereby bringing about a change in the mandibular size. So let's look at this schematically. So if you are looking at the condyle and the glenoid fossa, what was uh, done was, this is from uh, Rabi as well as Shen, they say that if you look at the chondrocyte, in detail and the nucleus of the chondrocyte, the secondary messengers that are there are going to cause an increase in the SOX9, thereby having an increase in the type 2 collagen. And therefore, what you are essentially going to get is the type 2 collagen which is required for the uh, chondrocytic differentiation or even in the, uh, the presence of it in the mandible. And this then gets converted into uh, the bone immature bone first and then the mature bone. So this is something that you need to look at. So if this animation plays, it will tell you the overall effects that are being produced on the skeleton as well as to some extent on the dentition. So what is being done here or what is shown here is that the there is an appliance that is trying to posture the mandible forward. There is going to be a stretch in the, visco in the retrodiscal area causing an elongation in the condyle, some amount of glenoid fossa descent, dentoalveolar changes, and altogether, it is going to convert the class 2 into 
trying to get the mandible forward and correction of the class 2 into a class 1 dental and surgical relationship as, as such. So this is a very crude way of schematically representing, but most of the attributes of what a functional appliance can do will be expressed here. Some amount of maxillary restraint, some amount of condylar remodeling, some amount of uh, glenoid fossa remodeling together with dentitional changes will bring about your uh, overall improvement in the class two. Now let's come to human studies. Some of the human studies which have been done uh, have, have prospective studies more mainly have shown that there is a lot of improvement in different parts of the mandible. And I'll also talk to you about those which have said that this growth may be insufficient. As postgraduate students, you should know both sides of the coin. So let me start with the positive study. People like William Clark, the originator of the uh, twin block appliance, showed a lot of discrete growth that was occurring in the condyles. And if you have heard him like, uh, speak at lectures when he came to the Indian Orthodontic Society Congress, he said that that is one of the most significant factors. And this has also been mentioned as the Stutzman angle. When you look at the condylar trabecular orientation and how it changes whenever you use the functional appliances. So this is believed to be responsible for an increased distal growth at the condyles. Mills and McCulloch, as well as Clark, have shown a lot of lengthening that takes place in the ramus also, not just in the condyle. And the studies by Mills and McCulloch, which appeared in 2000 uh, in the American Journal of Orthodontics, are a must quote for all the postgraduate students here, especially in the exam. The research shifted in uh, Canada and most of the uh, important studies done in Toronto by people like Woodside initially and subsequently by Angelopoulos as well as uh, Panchers in Europe have shown that there is a good amount of glenoid fossa remodeling which also brings about the overall changes in the mandible. And these are studies that you should be able to quote. What about the negative influences? Because I said that there is always a controversial aspect about whether this is significant or not. Lyle Johnston from US, he says that this growth in or increase in the length is insignificant because you're getting only a couple of millimeters more than the control group. I can definitely achieve this even with fixed appliances and class two elastics. That's what his argument is. Baumrin, Sheldon Baumrin, another prominent orthodontist of yesteryears in US, he also said that this effect is very similar to what that I would get with a headgear. So why should I use a functional appliance? And Murray Mikkel, who was earlier in the US and now shifted to New Zealand, he has written in his article saying that the condylar growth cannot be permanently increased. That is, you may be getting remodeling at a particular time period. But if you look at the permanency of change, this is going to be only a temporary acceleration and you are borrowing the growth which otherwise would have happened in a untreated individual when you look at the control group. And based on this, they say that functional appliances really do not help much. But what about 3D changes that have come up now? You've got a lot of articles that talk about the overall change. And I'm, I'm pointing out only one recent article, which is the condylar response to functional appliance with the twin block in which they try to evaluate the overall condylar volume, both in the, uh, in, in the three-dimensional uh, aspect. And what they found was an increase in the bicondylar width, as well as a increase in the condylar volume, along with an increased remodeling rate, which has been postulated earlier, which they could uh, only extrapolate from animal data. So all three together, they say, have helped in getting the condylar enlargement to occur, provided you use a functional appliance for a long, sufficiently long period of time. So this is in short, a little bit about the 3D data also. Now, the question that should arise in your mind is whenever we talk of skeletal correction, is this going to be a permanent change? Are these changes that you've got, are they going to remain permanent? Now, based on the long-term follow-up studies that, are, uh, that have been done, uh, prospective studies again, what has been shown is that the maxillary restraint that could be brought about by the functional appliance is surprisingly very stable. What does that mean? 
especially in some studies, such as the ones that have been done by Wieslander and Panchers using the herb stuff plants, they showed that, that there was a reduction in the angle SNA itself and some amount of maxillary restraint. And this remained more or less the same in the treated individuals, did not change much. Whereas in the control group, there was some amount of maxillary growth that occurred normally as a uh, continuing process. What about the condylar growth? There was uh, in, in the human data that, uh, that has been seen that overall there has been a subnormal rate of growth and profit shows this by way of a very beautiful graph. I will show that in a minute. So what, what is believed to occur is after the functional appliances stop, there would be a reduction in the rate of condylar growth. Again, we are talking in comparison to that of the untreated individuals. And together, what it does is in the untreated samples, there is a catch-up growth that is seen, which exceeds what has happened in functional plant. So this is the important aspect that as clinicians, we should remember that you cannot change the size or the length of the mandible beyond its genetic potential. But at the same time, whatever changes you are able to effect, you do them at the right period. And therefore, Prophet, what he has mentioned is, do not start treatment for uh, class 2 malocclusions very early. That means earlier we used to do a lot of two-phase treatment. We used to start treatment as ages 8 years, 9 years, etc. Whereas now we understand that we need to do it only at the appropriate time periods and we look at it using the cervical vertebral maturational analysis. I'll talk about that in the next lecture. But this is the graph that Prophet has shown. What he says is whenever you compare the acceleration that occurs in a functional appliance patient, as, as is shown in the dark diagram here and followed up uh, on top, what would happen is if the acceleration of growth that is seen here, a dramatic acceleration of growth that is seen, if it were to continue, the mandibular size would have gone past the 100 percentile, but that doesn't happen. Once you discontinue the functional appliance, there is a slow uh, and steady growth that continues, but it's not. there is no acceleration as such. Whereas untreated patients continue to grow and the eventual size of the mandible may remain uh, more or less the same. But dear friends, remember one thing, what we have achieved in this whole bargain of using the functional appliances is a lot of other changes that would have uh, taken place in a given patient when we were trying to temporarily stimulate the growth. And this picture I borrow from uh, Pancher's article, a very interesting article in which he has followed up the uh, herbs patients 32 years post-treatment. Imagine the patients were treated at the age of 13, 12, 13, and they have been followed up till they are in their mid-40s. And then he, he got about eight patients altogether in whom he was trying to assess what was happening. And what he has found is that the overall changes that he could make out where mainly in terms of, uh, uh, there was a lot of variation, but what they found was in different patients, there would be different growth that would be occurring. And 3D data from a selected sample of prospective patients also, what is shown here in this picture is representative of the same. What is shown here is in different types of patients, if you look at the overall superimposition, some patients grow excessively. That means if you look at this patient D, as well as B, there has been a good amount of change. But in patient D, you would see a true elongation of the mandible. In patient B, it's more of a dentoalveolar change. Again, in patient E and G, you would see that there is more of dentoalveolar change. So what Panches goes on to say is, in different individuals, there will be different responses. You try to do your best in getting the growth harmonized and accelerated. If it works well, it would work beautifully. But you should know that there are some patients in which you will get only dentoalveolar correction. So you need to remember this. So finally, coming to what are the dental changes that are produced, you should uh, have in mind very clearly that 50% of the changes that are going to happen roughly are going to be because of dentoalveolar changes. And what are these? It's mainly by way of the maxillary incisors tipping palately, the mandibular dentition moving, uh, the posteriors moving upward and forward, 
as guided by the appliance as you would understand when we talk of trimming of the twin block but also some amount of lower incisor proclination which would happen with any tooth bone appliance such as the twin block or any of the other appliances except the frankel remember all the other tooth bone appliances are going to have reciprocal effects on the lower dentition and you need to know how to control them and what are the variations in the appliance modif uh, appliances that have been modified so this is the uh, in short the overall changes that are going to happen the quantum of which i will discuss when we talk of twin block i mentioned that soft tissue changes are not explained very well because these are the least documented but there have been a couple of them which are very prominent and you should refer to the studies done by dr gd singh and william clark which talk about the soft tissue changes and they have shown that there is a positive change especially with respect to facial convexity a large amount of change that is going to happen and some amount of soft tissue chin growth i am awaiting some data from 3d analysis which is going to come up for uh, in terms of looking at the overall soft tissue alteration also that has happened along with the skeletal change so this is from the studies of clark and gd singh uh, using the twin block they showed that there is a good amount of change that would occur in the chin region and also in in the lower lip the mentolabial surface etc which we see in patients but they have actually quantified it using their data so i would urge the students to go through articles of these people so if you look at uh, some of the manuals such as the bristol manual which is the post graduate notes in orthodontics for mr they say uh, they they talk about the classic cases for functional appliances what are they so the functional appliances would be best suited for patients who are growing and they would uh, talk about the cvm3 uh, stage of growth the overjet should be within 10 to 12 mm though we may not be fortunate always to get this angle a and b of less than 8 degrees facial proportions in the normal range that is looking at the mid face to the uh, anterior face height ratio and they believe that the summary of effects that are produced by functional appliances is the following one would be a temporary improvement in the skeletal relationship mainly because of a change in the condyle and the glenoid fossa and some amount of maxillary restraint but they say that this is clinically less significant more number of changes or more amount of change would occur in the dento alveolar region and this is documented by way of the lower incisor proclination which would range anywhere from 5 degrees to 9 degrees of proclination and this is when we talk of the imp so imagine an imp of 90 degrees getting increased to 95 or plus which is going to actually reduce your overjet faster than the skeletal change that you believe should be happening for such patients and whenever you have large overjets that is more than 10 mm it is believed by some people at least that incremental advancement would be beneficial i would recommend this not from a technical angle but from the patient compliance factor point of view that incremental advancement would be suitable for majority of the patients because if they are comfortable with the appliance they are definitely going to use it so remember these important points also so uh, in terms of the values if some of you are interested you can take a screenshot of this picture based on the prospective studies and the randomized trials the maximum mandibular growth that has been in excess over that of the controls has been has shown uh, been shown by the studies of mills and macula and they showed almost 4 mm of increase in the time period that the twin block was used but if you look at the overall change or increase per year it would be you should be reasonably okay by stating 1 to 2 mm per year and the maxillary restraint about 1 degree reduction in the angle sna so when you use a functional appliance and you are trying to look at the changes that are being brought about in the skeletal area you would get a change in the snb no doubt but you should also be expecting some amount of reduction in the sna therefore your angle a and b is supposed to reduce from if it it was let's say 6 or 7 degrees to reduce to no, close to 4 degrees what about the duration of treatment based on all these 
uh, studies on uh, animals, one thing is clear that you need to hold on to the functional appliance or a fixed functional appliance for a sufficiently long period of time. And this has been recommended by Rabi as well as some others in the recent uh, past that you hold the uh, removable appliance and the uh, disocclusion of the condyle for as long as possible because that will stimulate acceleration as well as remodeling and the completion of remodeling in those particular patients. So just to summarize from what we have discussed in this particular lecture is that the functional appliances definitely are going to remain the mainstay of class two patients who report with problems in the mandibular growth. Irrespective of what time has shown or what research has shown in terms of the amount of skeletal changes that are brought about. But as a clinician, the anticipated changes that you should remember should be realistic. Don't expect that the functional appliance is going to bring about a miraculous 80-90% of skeletal growth. No. If you are thinking so, then it's not going to happen. We should be realistic and pragmatic. And a sound clinical protocol will maximize the efficiency of treatment. And that is where, where we will come to when we talk about the treatment planning part of this particular presentation. So I will end by uh, end this first talk and uh, ask Dr. Ravi if we should have some questions now or after the second lecture only uh, uh, so that we can have a continuity in the uh, lectures as such as well as the discussion. And I can see Dr. Nandukumar uh, Sitting in the front row, hi Nandu. We are going to have some interaction hopefully with the uh, audience today. And Dr. Nandakumar will be there to explain certain things uh, about the headgears also, I believe. So it's going to be uh, interesting. Is Dr. Ravi there? Or anybody from the faculty who could uh, help me decide how do we progress? So if there are a couple of questions, we could take them up just now. Or if you feel that we should take them after the second lecture, because we'll be having a short break. Sir, if you have questions, we'll take up now. Or else, okay. uh, or else we can start with the second session. Okay. So what I can uh, uh, suggest is, of course, in the audience, if there is anybody, they can feel free to ask. But from the online audience also, Maybe one of you could take the uh, questions down and uh, maybe at the end of the open session, we could try and answer for all of them. So if there is one or two, one or two people in the audience who would like to ask something just now, it would be uh, a good icebreaker, as I say, because since morning you have been sitting and listening to lectures, it's good to interact rather than have just a one-way traffic. Can I ask you a question? Sure, sure. <laughs> I think that's the best way, right? The faculty should start and then the students definitely will open up, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, the question is, uh, is there really a mandibular growth or is it just a, a condylar changes in the position? Okay. I, I think this is echoed by uh, all the participants also, I'm sure. So uh, I would refer uh, or rec recommend you to read the article written by Mikkel himself on uh, the condylar remodeling as such or the growth remodeling as he says. So what we understand presently is if the mandible is locked because of the maxillary uh, dentition or the transverse dimension of the maxilla and you are disoccluding the mandible after changing the maxillary uh, position transversely and vertically, you are going to induce a temporary acceleration in the condylar growth that I hope was clear from what I mentioned earlier. Now, whether this would be more than what a patient would have achieved is, is something that people have said is not going to work. That means the final genetic potential of that given patient 
would be expressed when you use the functional appliance. But my argument is that had this patient not been treated at all, let's say for example, and you would have expected the same amount of growth to occur with the maxillary strain, I think it would not have happened to the tune that you would get with the functional appliance. So you are temporarily raising the uh, or increasing the condylar rate as such. So you are not changing the condylar dimension beyond what you can actually stimulate. But at the same time, also remember that the entire mandible is translating downward and forward because of the glenoid fossa reposition. And that's something that would help in terms of the final changes that are occurring. And one aspect that we I didn't talk about much is when we look at the growth equivalence or the counterpart part principle of ENLO, the vertical alveolar changes that are going to happen, which will alter the anterior face of the patient also. So these are some of the components individually that you need to look at for the functional appliance correction. Sir, good morning. Good morning. Sir, I'm Dr. Subramanian Shetty. Oh, hi, Subhu. How are you? Fine, sir. Sir, is there is a auto rotation of mandible plays a key role while treating uh, with the functional appliances. Normally, when we address the vertical component of maxilla, hmm. well, it really helps to correct the class two effect. Yes, I mean, if you're looking at hyperdivergent cases in which you have held the uh, or prevented the vertical descent of the maxilla by way of a headgear combination with uh, increased bite block, posterior bite block, whatever additional change would be seen in the mandible is by way of the rotation of the, uh, the clockwise rotation or the forward rotation of the mandible, which would help in minimizing the overall hyperdivergence. And therefore, I think what you are talking about is the facial convexity or the class two pattern that would definitely get improved when you use this. Now, the same effect you are also seeing when you're using TADS, for example, in cases of uh, vertical uh, uh, increase or hyperdivergent patients, what you're essentially doing is trying to intrude the posteriors, both upper and lower in certain situations, because of which the auto rotation is going to occur. So the same effect you will be seeing in functional appliances if you prevent the vertical descent of the alveolus mainly. You cannot, again, uh, try to change the amount of vertical maxillary descent. That's the skeletal descent. It's very difficult to do. But you can definitely change the plane or the palatal plane orientation by way of using the headgear. That has been shown using certain animal uh, certain human studies. Etc. So answer is yes. Auto rotation will help in hyperdivergent patients. Thank you, sir. So my question is that uh, how much is the uh, contributing factor for condylar fossa growth versus the glenoid fossa uh, clock the condylar growth versus the glenoid fossa remodeling, and uh, how does it affect the eventual result? Okay, now that's a good question. I mean, nobody has tried to actually quantify the uh, amount of condyle and the glenoid fossa. It is believed to be 50-50 uh, based on what interaction I had with Dr. Rabi when he had come to Pune. We had this question, Dr. Jayesh and myself, we met him after his presentation and we spoke at length because he was uh, doing these uh, animal experiments at that point. And one of the things that he mentioned is we cannot actually distinguish exactly the fossa, uh, the amount of remodeling that would be occurring in the fossa and how long it will continue to occur after the appliance is removed. But you would expect or you can recommend that it would be around 50-50. That is 50% of condyle and 50% in the glenoid fossa. Good morning, sir. Yeah, good morning. Sir, you had told that in dental changes, there is an upward uh, growth of the, uh, the posterior teeth, sir. Will it not further worsen by uh, rotating the mandible downward? Uh, yeah, I think this question is appropriate, uh, again, because we need to look at, have you heard of Shudi's principle? Fred Shudi and George Shudi, they talked about 
this particular uh, phenomenon wherein there is a balancing of whatever alveolar growth and the dental eruption that takes place by way of condylar and the ramal elongation. So what I mean to say is when the dentition in the lower arch is going to erupt upward and forward, there is going to be a compensatory elongation in the ramus upward and backward. So together, they are going to prevent the mandible from rotating backward and downward. So that is why we always say that use the functional appliances in the growing period. Now, I would urge you, all of you, to look at, uh, I hope all of you are uh, having the Atlas of Diagnosis by Graeber and Rakosi, right? Go back today to the library, go through the chapter which talks about the individual components of maxillary and mandibular growth. What we are looking at is whenever there is a growth, forward growth of the maxilla, the mandible also should continue if, if it's a balanced phase. Now that doesn't happen. So you are trying to use a functional appliance to try and stimulate them. While you are doing so, in the sagittal direction, the mandible uh, growth gets accelerated, the maxillary growth gets restrained. Likewise, in the vertical, if you accelerate the dentitional growth, there will also be a corresponding skeletal growth in the ramus and the condyle, which will compensate. And therefore, the balancing of the entire facial form uh, improves from imbalance to balance. That's what I say. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Yeah. So... I think we'll move on to the next uh, lecture because, or is there any other question that we need to take up before? Sir, we'll break for a tea for a few minutes and- Okay, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. After so just tell me roughly how much time so that we'll reassemble. About five, 10 minutes? At 11.30, sir. Okay, sure. Uh, 10 minutes. Okay, okay, sure. Yes. So we'll take a tea break, come fast as early as possible. Just go out. We'll have a very short tea break. Any you can collect now, you can uh, keep it ready. Once sir is back, we are back. We can interact with sir. Okay. Yeah, just run and come back fast.
yeah welcome back one small announcement those who have not done the registration online please do so even if you have written in this still you have to register online a feedback a link will be sent to the registered email address which you have to complete to get the certificate okay so please note this only after you submit the feedback form you will get the certificate okay so this feedback form will be sent to your registered email id so those who are not registered yet you can still register using that jot form if anybody wants uh, that link you can ask one of our pgs or you can ask any one of us we will send you the link for registration anybody who has not done the registration here online registration all of you done no yes good so we'll start the session soon and uh, that youtube link is also there you can you can uh, type your questions if any in that also you can chat in that uh, youtube link okay whose phone is this Dr. Chetan.
और वर्बिक्स हेलो सर यस वी आर रेडी चेतन रवि सर यस थैंक यू थैंक यू hope my screen is visible sir yes okay so after that short break welcome back to all the participants uh, i took this beautiful quote which reflects what how our attitude should be in life and this is especially true for uh, all the post graduate students the capacity to learn is a gift the ability is a skill and the willingness to learn is a choice you have been bestowed upon this choice uh, and you should show the willingness to learn and that is how your motto should be in uh, your post graduate days try to learn from as many corners as possible i show this picture of a young boy 12 year old boy who aspired to dream i think some of you would have seen his photographs but he is the youngest chess grandmaster of india pradyananda who was able to beat the mightiest of chess champions kalsun recently and if a young boy could dream to or aspire to do so why not any of us or all of us on that note uh, let's continue with what we were discussing till now and uh, this particular presentation is going to be mainly a short one more of a clinical because the earlier one was purely a theoretical one and this is going to be on treatment planning for the functional appliance patient so diagnosis and treatment planning is like the main stay of any aspect of treatment diagnosis yes there are a lot of tools which can help you understand the problem computerized and 3d but treatment planning is like fitting the parts of a jigsaw puzzle now if you are not able to fit this in the right position you are going to go wrong and therefore this particular talk on treatment planning will try to sort of demystify the uh, class to mal occlusions based on what moyer said done way back in the 1980s and using that as a template ask four or five questions which all of you could use in your day to day practice in order to make class to correction more meaningful as well as simpler so let's get started i had talked about a bit of the prevalence of class 2 now if you look at the overall american population they show uh, the proportion of 15 to 20% uh, patients who might have or population which might have a class 2 uh, uh, mal occlusions as such whereas 70% out of these are going to have a mandibular component contributing to the class 2 situation so in the morning i had mentioned that emphasis should be targeting the jaw at fault and 70% that means 3 out of 4 patients are likely to have a problem in the mandible and therefore we talk of functional appliances more than the headgear per se to try and tackle it so the same line of thought i'm carrying forward dr nandakumar will be speaking about headgears later on so i won't uh, go into that aspect but what i'm going to try and give you now is actually the break up of uh, the individual components of the class 2 mal occlusion using certain guidelines so some important articles that you have to refer in terms of mentioning about the class 2 mal occlusion is the classic article by mcnamara in the angle orthodontist 81 the components of class 2 you need to mention or you need to know about it so moyers had rightly pointed out regarding the diverse mixture of dental and skeletal features in class 2 individuals and often you will be baffled by the variation in every each and every patient that you are going to see clinically or soft tissue wise they may look the same but intraorally there will be some differences so each patient is an individual patient who needs customized treatment and customization of treatment planning can be done only by an orthodontist and not any uh, artificial intelligence software till date so moyers went on to call it the class 2 syndrome he said class 2 mal occlusion may not be the right word 
because you have so, such a diverse feature. He in fact categorized or sub type class 2 into six horizontal types and five vertical subtypes. So we are going to look at the six horizontal subtypes in order to understand what kind of class 2 patients we are going to uh, address. Before that, I think whenever we look at treatment planning for class 2 malocclusions, ask yourself these three fundamental questions as are enlisted here. First is, what is the type of class 2 or what is the contributing factor to the class 2? How severe is it? This should be the first question. And that will help you in guiding whether the severity warrants growth modification, camouflage or something else. The growth status of a given patient. Is the patient at an acceptable time period? Is the patient a little early for growth modulation? So should I do something else? Or is the patient late and I, should I look at only camouflage or surgery as the uh, main choice of option <clears throat> of treatment? And the third important aspect, while you discuss with your patient and the parent, is to try and assess the expected level of cooperation. Because if the patient is not compliant at all, you are going to have uh, no success, in fact. So if you look at the equation of your effort to the time that or uh, versus the success that you get, in between there is this factor of compliance. And it, it plays a major role in a private practice scenario. So also would it for any any of you as postgraduates to know which patient is going to work well. So we are going to look at the ex, uh, the expected cooperation also. And using these three questions as your guideline or the basis, you will define what choice of functional appliance should you use. Now, many of you would know that for patients who are non-cooperative, there is a group of appliances called as the fixed class two correctors or the fixed functional appliances as such. So if there is even a small iota of doubt that the patient may not be uh, really cooperative, you could think of that option as well. And I will help you understand in the course of this presentation, I'm going to discuss two other appliances other than the twin block. The one is EVA, which is uh, a removable type of an appliance, which is used, uh, which used to be used very commonly when you're giving a lot of function, the removable functional appliances. And the other one is going to be a fixed functional appliance, which can be fixed inside the patient's mouth. So I'm going to discuss on all these. So let's start with the first question the type of class 2 and the severity. I'm not going to go into extreme details of cephalometrics because all of you are well versed with this. Clinical examination also, which I'm sure Dr. Nandakumar will help in understanding if you have a live patient over there as to what are the salient features in terms of clinical examination. Uh, cephalometrically, you should be able to distinguish patients in the horizontal subtypes that I'm going to enlist in the next slide. But what is also important is through your clinical and cephalometric assessment, you should be able to understand whether a class two patient is getting complicated by the transverse of vertical dimension or is getting compensated by these two dimensions. Most often, it would be a sort of a complication or an additive nature that increases the complexity of class two. I mentioned about the narrow maxillary arch. Likewise, there was a discussion about the vertical descent of the maxilla. Both, in fact, add on, and I'll show you one case later on in which there is a high angle uh, class 2, which needs to be tackled by both extractions as well as the functional removal, functional headgear combination. So let's look at the individual subtypes of uh, class 2 malocclusion as given by Moyers. And this is very important because I don't see generally all the dental colleges or all the postgraduate departments highlighting these individual uh, aspects other than looking at a complex set of cephalometric data in interpreting the class two. Yes, you should use composite analysis, which helps you to distinguish between a maxillary prognathism versus a mandibular retrognathism. You should also have several values to understand the vertical nature of the problem and also to understand whether the mandible is pushed back or not. But at the end of it, you should be able to highlight in a class 2 patient whether the patient is fitting or which subtype is the patient going to fit in. So what are these individual subtypes? The first one, that subtype A, as Moyers gave it, 
is a dental class 2 only. It's also called as a pseudo uh, class 2, wherein the, the skeletal nature of the problem is not severe. That means you will be having an ANB of 4 degrees or 5 degrees at the most and a growing individual. If you remember the cephalocaudal gradient of growth, you are going to have some amount of mandibular acceleration after the maxillary growth has slowed down. So these are patients who would also be called as pseudo class 2. The second category is a, a smaller proportion of the entire class 2, which is subtype B, also defined by maxillary prognathism, mainly causing the class 2. Remember that none of these are going to happen or uh, be seen in isolation in a given patient. But broadly, you should be able to express whether it is a maxillary prognathism that is causing the subtype B. C and D, subtype C and D, are the ones which are most favorable for the uh, functional appliance type of correction with some alteration. I'll talk about what's the difference between C and D. Subtype E is one wherein there is a maxillary prognathism also along with a bimaxillary dentoallular protrusion. Typically in southern India, especially even in Mangalore and Kerala, if you look at the class 2 patients, you are going to see there are going to be several class 2s with bimaxillary dental protrusion. Addressing only the bimaxillary dental proclination alone will not target the complete soft tissue envelope. Therefore, you need to uh, reasonably mix it with extractions along with a fixed or a fixed functional appliance. And subtype F is a mixture of the types of B to E, but could be a variation and a milder form between these three. And that is how Moyers went on to subclassify. I hope this, this is uh, well understood, subtype A to F. Let's look at the important individual points within the subtypes. So if you see a subtype A, in which it's a pseudo class 2, mainly with upper incisor proclination. Obviously, the best way to deal with it would be one of these three. One would be a headgear. If you also see that there is a, a skeletal growth which you might anticipate to be happening and therefore you want to restrain the maxilla as that, you cannot push the maxilla back, but you can restrain forward growth. And uh, the other option, obviously, nowadays, which is more preferred is usage of temporary skeletal anchors. And these can be used in conjunction uh, with a functional appliance, but most often, or, or rather a, a fixed appliance, most often a functional appliance would not be the appliance of choice in subtype A. In selected categories, if you want to achieve only molar distalization, you have multiple appliances for bringing about this as well. What about subtype B? Here you are going to have more of maxillary prognathism. So the only way to correct it would be one in the growing age, try with a headgear. But otherwise, later on, if it's not successful, then you should look at a TAD supported extraction retraction regimen. And why I'm highlighting the temporary skeletal anchors here is because the amount of retraction, bodily retraction, because of which the point A may get remodeled, uh, may get remodeled even in an adult patient is immense with any kind of temporary skeletal anchor. And therefore, this would be a better option than only conventional fixed appliances. What about type C, subtype C and subtype D? What is the difference? Let's try to understand. Often you would have seen a uh, mandibular retrognathism coupled with lower incisor proclination, isn't it? And in spite of lower incisors being proclined, the overjet may be eight millimeters or so. Now, this is a severe or a more difficult form of uh, class 2 because if you imagine, if you try to correct this uh, proclined incisors to an upright position, the overjet is going to be around 15 to 18 millimeters and that entire thing needs to be corrected. So, unless you actually work on the lower incisor proclination first, trying to address this only with a functional appliance is not going to work. There is an interesting study done uh, and published in either the Journal of Orthodontics or the European Journal recently, which talks about what is the incidence of lower incisor proclination when you compare with the pre-treatment IMPA values. I hope you get what I mean. If the initial IMPA is increased and you look at the results after treatment, obviously there would be a further inclination, increase in the inclination, no doubt. 
but the proportion of patients who ended up with severe incisor proclination were those who had increased IMP pre-treatment, which goes to say that whenever you see these patients, type C type of patients, first thing that you should try and do is try and improve the lower incisor inclination before giving any type of a functional appliance, be it a removal or a fixed functional appliance. In these categories, I would rather, uh, rather recommend usage of a fixed functional appliance because contrary to what is believed that for fixed functional appliances would cause proclination, yes, they do. But what I would do is I would try to first get the lower incisors upright with a fixed appliance and then use a fixed functional appliance to correct this. So this is type C, uh, typical cephalometric uh, observation such as this, upper incisors procline, lower incisors procline, and A and B of around 7 degrees or 8 degrees. And if you imagine the lower incisors to get uprighted in the, to the normal, then the overjet, uh, existing overjet would be very large. So it needs a special type of a treatment to be planned. Do not just think of a removable appliance uh, directly because you're going to uh, get more of dental defects, dentoalveolar effects. As against subtype C, the subtype D is more favorable for functional appliances because these are individuals in whom the lower incisors are more upright or slightly proclined. These would be very, very beneficial and these are the most suitable patients for giving a removable functional appliance. Of course, with any tooth bone appliance, make sure that you put in some effort to prevent uh, undue proclination. The subtype E, as I mentioned already, is coupled uh, is a coupling of maxillary prognathism along with bimaxillary dentoalveolar protrusion, and therefore uh, extractions, extraction-based fixed appliance treatment followed by a fixed functional or an appliance like a fixed twin block may be something that is necessary. Now, as postgraduate students, most of you would wonder, when you have a skeletal problem, shouldn't we address the skeletal uh, nature or the skeletal problem first? Yes, that is what is uh, recommended. But if the dental situation is not, if the dentition is not favoring it, it's better to do a small, uh, a short course of pre-functional correction and then go ahead with the functional appliance. And type F, as I mentioned, there is a variation. So you need to tackle as per the uh, requirement of a given case. I hope breaking it up or compartmentalizing the class 2 problem helped a lot. Now let's see certain patients. I'll start with a subtype A because this is also seen very commonly and you need to identify what, what to do in a subtype A. So 11-year-old female with some amount of facial convexity but look at the nasolabial angle. She has actually strained her uh, lips to close for the camera, for the photograph. But otherwise, she had mildly incompetent lips uh, at rest. A mentolabial sulcus, which is deep, no doubt. But she is a growing individual. And the upper incisors are proclined. If you see intraorally, typical features of a mild dental class 2 uh, or mild class 2 skeletal, but more of a dentoalveolar problem. So it's a pseudo class 2, as dictated by the angle SNA, SNB, the A and B being 3 degrees, width appraisal 3 millimeters, and mandibular plane being in the uh, uh, overall approximate range. The upper incisors procline, 109, upper 1 to SN, lower incisors at 92. So it's a good uh, case for initiating the control of the maxillary dentition and allowing the mandibular growth to occur on its own. So at that time, this was the time when we were using a lot of uh, big plants, even in our private practice and a headgear uh, combination to the big plants itself with soldered headgear tubes on the upper band. And this is how we could finish the treatment, uh, getting a good intercuspation and a posterior dentition. But more importantly, look at how the uh, the facial changes took place. This is just the occlusal picture. She had a couple of uh, deciduous molars which shed during the treatment and then uh, we aligned the premolars also, upper and lower arches. And you can see that with the upper, just the correction of the upper uh, incisors with the mandibular growth that took place, she had a 
acceptable and a good smile. And if you look at the cephalometric representation here, the lower incisors have been maintained well in the basal bone. The upper incisor proclination was reduced, but not completely retracted uh, because we had to make sure that the nasolabial angle did not open up much. The molars ended up in a class one relationship. And overall, if you look at the facial profile, there was a good improvement because the parent and the patient was more worried about the upper incisor toe as such. So if you look at the cephalometric superimposition, what is it that you see? That there is some amount of mandibular growth, but that's a natural growth that would have happened anyway. And you are trying to hold the maxillary dentition at the given point and also the posterior teeth. So the upper molars stayed more or less where they were. Some amount of growth anyway would happen. So there is some mesial movement there. Good amount of mesial migration of the lower posteriors and the entire mandible helping the overall change. Look at the face, soft tissue facial change also. So change in the lip, upper lip, change in the mentolabial sulcus and overall a change in the face. Now let's look at type C. I'm not going to talk about uh, the subtype B because that's going to do more with the headgears. Dr. Nandakumar will be speaking about it. Now let's go to type C and D. Now, this is a patient who is midway between a subtype C and a subtype D. And this type of a patient, I would feel, is most appropriate for either of the appliances. You could think of a removal functional appliance or a fixed functional appliance. I prefer a fixed functional appliance in this type of a patient for two reasons. One is the lower incisors being more or less upright and well aligned. The upper incisors are proclined, which is a very good thing for any of the functional appliances because the upper incisors will get tipped palately. And considering that she is a permanent dentition patient, we went ahead with a fixed functional appliance. So what was the nature of treatment? Start with fixed appliances to begin with. Control your upper and lower incisors. Do not allow the lower incisors to procline. That's very, very important. Complete your leveling aligning. Go to a rigid rectangular wires and then use a fixed functional appliance. Which fixed functional appliance you use is your choice. Ultimately, you should know the biomechanics that goes behind any of the fixed functional appliances. Any fixed functional appliance is going to throw your lower incisors forward. So make sure you apply suitable countermeasures to prevent the proclination from occurring. So in this instance, since I'm using a forces appliance, I make sure that I modify the force vector itself by giving a u-loop here and also altering the uh, the push rod of the forces such that the force vector goes closer to the center of resistance of the lower dentition and when i do so the chances of forward tipping of the incisors lower incisors alone gets reduced i wouldn't say that you can eliminate lower incisor proclination no nobody should claim to do so but you can at least minimize it and as that happens you can see that the patient goes from the initial overzit of 8 millimeters, keep a track of what's happening to the upper incisors also. There's a headgear-like effect. The upper incisors are getting retroclined. They, from being proclined, they're getting upright, and the lower arch continues. The important thing with the lower, uh, with any fixed functional appliance is, again, to remember basic biology. Use the fixed functional appliance for a sufficient period of time. So in this case, we used it for about seven months active and two months of passive. And then we discontinued, going to this stage wherein the finishing that was required was minimal. So all that you need is some amount of vertical settling in the premolars. And you do that with round, uh, round steel wires in the lower arch and rectangular steel or nitide, depending on the alignment, whatever is required. Make sure you uh, uh, incorporate your uh, second molars into the arch also by that time so that you get a good finish. And this was the way that we could complete her treatment. One thing that I failed to do or now I realize that should have been done was also to constrict the upper arch wire while using the forces because with any fixed functional appliance, there will be some amount of buckle flaring of the premolar molar region. And this needs to be addressed when you do the fixed functional appliance. So this is the patient at the end of treatment. 
and if you look at the comparison and this is her smiling photograph but if you look at the comparison between where she was in terms of the chin projection to where she is now definitely there is a change there's also been a growth in the nasal area or the nose as such and this is how she started this was the pre treatment and this is the present uh, or, or the photograph at the end of treatment and i i would say that this is an improvement in the face value of a given patient if you are targeting the right uh, things at the right time so let me show you one more type d patient in whom growth modification was needed remember subtype d are the ideal cases wherein the lower incisors are upright we'll talk about subtype e in the uh, uh, lecture on fixed functional apply uh, on twin uh, block also and if there is some time for uh, question answers i will show you a couple of fixed functionals with extraction as well so this is a patient in whom the lower incisors are relatively uh, well aligned at the same time not very much proclined if you if you look at the dentition late mixed dentition with the premolars about to erupt both upper and lower arches in terms of the cvm staging uh, we'll talk about that she was uh, close to the uh, cvm 3 so we needed to go ahead as soon as possible with a functional type of a, or a growth modulation treatment now because her upper incisors and lower incisors did not need much of correction within 3 months of the fixed uh, appliance phase we were at the end of leveling aligning and this is the point at which the fixed functional appliance that was decided was uh, chosen and kept this is a case from uh, one of the post graduate departments where i worked earlier and this is uh, a, a a student's patient so this is the forces again being used with the necessary modification a rigid rectangular wire that would be needed in the uh, both upper and lower arches this is at the end of the fixed functional phase very important here to make sure that you get a bit of over correction that is get the upper and lower incisors as close to edge to edge as possible one get the molars almost into a super class one relationship on both the sides because anticipating some amount of fine tuning and relapse to occur in the lower dentition and the lower arch you need to hold them uh, you need to get a proper interdigitation at the end of treatment so this is end of the fixed functional phase and this is how the patient ended again the finishing stage was minimal but what is important that you should note is end of treatment you should necessarily have a very good intercuspation in the premolar region premolar and molar region be it a removable functional appliance or a fixed functional appliance if you don't get this intercuspation your uh, case is likely to uh, be unstable or prone to relapse and this is not just me telling it but there have been long term data by pancher especially who worked on long term data with the herbs appliance he tried to evaluate patients who had relapsed and patients who had remained successful you know the single most uh, important factor that he found was those patients who ended with a tight inter intercuspation at the end of herbs treatment and the fixed appliance treatment were the ones which uh, who remained stable uh, almost 85 to 90% did not show any major type of relapse whereas those patients in whom the interdigitation was not a cusp to fossa were the ones who showed maximum amount of relapse so dentition the way you leave the dentition at the end of treatment helps uh, a lot in order to minimize relapse now what happens in the mandible if you look i'm showing only the mandibular superimposition pre to post if you look at or pre to uh, post uh, functional which is shown in green what you see is from black to green you do see some amount of condylar remodeling there upward and backward but between that period to the post treatment which is shown in the red what you can see is that there is some amount of uh, relapse that is occurring so this needs to be minimal and and once this happens and you have completed the treatment simple way of retaining these is to have uh, uh, either a fixed anterior inclined plane or to give a removable hollies with an anterior incline just to guide the mandibular dentition in place in and hold it well now this was about the individual subtypes the severity of the class 2 and 
how do you address it now we go to the next question the second question that i mentioned which is you should be asking you uh, to yourself when you see a patient is the growth status what growth status is the patient in now while initiating growth uh, modification earlier people used to believe that look at the chronologic age and you would be surprised even today in the uk if you go to any of the uh, nhs centers or any of the post graduate training departments they do not rely on skeletal maturation as per but in india we do uh, follow it and there is a reason for it so the skeletal maturation stages as dictated by both either radiographic methods or non radiographic methods both can be used and there is a lot of impetus being given nowadays to non radiographic methods for assessing the growth as a clinician i always make sure that my clinical examination itself helps me to understand a bit of the maturation stage so for a boy or a girl as you know the secondary sexual characteristics that are obtained during the pubertal period help us to delineate this so clinically itself you should have a rough idea in your mind and then confirm it with your skeletal maturation status let me in the next 5 minutes give you a little more detail about the current consensus now i'm not going to talk about the uh, method that franchi and bassetti gave but i'm going to talk to you about perinatal method so this is a very familiar graph or a picture to all of you wherein you know that there are six stages of cervical vertebral maturation three and four are the ones that will characterize the pubertal peak and the time at which the condylar growth is accelerated the maximum now this is from several studies that have shown uh, and one important one that you can remember is franchi and bassetti angle orthodontist 2006 the article in which they found out that a gonial angle of less than 125 degrees and cvm3 patient in cvm3 are the best suited for a functional jaw orthopedics so you can go through that article angle anyway angle orthodontist uh, journal is open access but let's go a little more in detail so if you look at the peak of growth that is achieved between cvm3 and 4 is the time wherein the peak of the growth occurs but remember after the peak also there will be a couple of years of growth especially in male patients so which is why i often recommend even fixed functional appliances in cvm5 as well because there is some amount of growth that is still occurring and if you are able to camouflage by way of dentitional adjustment and some amount of skeletal correction you can still go go for it but as post graduate students right now focus on the condylar growth period which is cvm3 uh, at the most and uh, also looking at towards cvm4 now i'll give you one more code which often most of you would be reading or presenting in the seminar and this is uh, given by perinetti several nice articles have been published by uh, dr perinetti and this is one from one of them which appeared in the ajodo 2017 what he has done is further he has classified the cervical vertebral maturation stage based on the concavity that is seen in the vertebra that's 2 3 4 and also the shape changes that occur in 3 and 4 so the flat to concavity flat to concavity for the next next uh, two vertebrae as well as the shape in 3 and 4 which is changing from trapezoidal to horizontal to square and then vertical rectangular and based on this he says that you can further sub classify the exact stage so you could have flat 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 that is no concavity would be flat and the shape trapezoidal trapezoidal that is 3 and 4 so this would be fff tt cv which would correspond with cvm stage 1 two concavities on all three that is second third and fourth and a vertical rectangular uh, shape of the third and fourth vertebra which would be called as cs6 so this is what he has given and you can go through this particular article and the details because this helps us to further sub classify your cvm stage and why this is important is because the cvm stage is a period of time 
it could extend anywhere from six to eight months to what Perinetti says is up to two years for some patients. Do you follow what I mean? You could have roughly about one year in which you will see the same CVM 3, 4 stage occurring. But if you look in detail about the concavity formation and the shape change, you will be in a better position to assess whether the patient should go in for growth modulation immediately or you should do a little bit of uh, uh, pre-functional correction and then go for the, uh, the main skeletal correction. I talked to you about non-radiographic methods. And are you aware of certain uh, research that is coming out from India itself? And this is from either Delhi or the uh, in Maharashtra, in Nagpur. Uh, and several studies have been uh, pointed out and have been uh, published in international journals in which they are trying to identify either the IGF level, that's the insulin-like growth factor 1, serum level, or even the salivary IGF-1 level. Though this is not completely acceptable just now, but mind you, in the next five years or so, the exact values of the salivary IGF-1 for different age groups, different ethnicities is going to be obtained. And once you have that, you can use that as a correlation along with your cervical vertebrae maturation to have a better understanding. And this is something that is going to come up in the near future. Now, this particular article, which appeared in 2017, again, it's an open access uh, journal literature that you can get from Biomed Research International. The review article on the reliability of growth indicators and efficiency of functional treatment, current evidence and controversies by Perinetti again. And this entire article, if you go through, uh, after understanding all the nuances, after reading some of the important books which talk about growth maturation or this uh, skeletal maturation, it will make it very easy for you, especially for an exam-going student. So I'll just put three points uh, based on the entire review that he has pointed out. So what he says is any single stage of the cervical vertebral maturation indicator cannot be very accurate in determining the exact amount of growth remaining. Because if you look at Franchi and Vesity, even McNamara, they say that 60% or 25% of growth remaining, etc. Now, unless you go ahead with the further coding, you cannot be very, very accurate. And he says the only way to customize this is for by doing the longitudinal assessment. And uh, by longitudinal assessment, we mean that you need to take uh, the indicator, whichever indicator you are doing, over a period of a year or two. Now, that's not possible with radiographs, isn't it? Because we know that there will be some hazards of radiation. So the best way, probably the next five years that's going to come up, is these non-radiographic methods as a supplement to CVM staging. And finally, what he says is combination methods are always better. That means physiologic age that a clinician can determine, the skeletal maturation based on the cervical vertebra, anyway you're taking a cell, but he also recommends that even the middle phalanx of the middle finger can be used. Uh, I hope all of you are aware of the method of Dr. Raj Gopal and Kansal, uh, which has appeared in the JCO. It's to use the MP3 alone as the uh, indicator for, uh, for the uh, skeletal maturation. And finally, use the non-radiographic method. So all three put together would be a better way to judging the uh, growth status as such. So the ideal growth status, we mentioned about this, would be around 3, CVM3. And patients who report early or late will have to be treated differently. Isn't it? How often have you come across a patient who is at the age of 9 and is in CVM status 1? And uh, you still see a... Uh, class 2 malocclusion, you are, are you not tempted to treat this patient? Yes, you would be tempted, but do not use a, fi a, a functional appliance immediately because that's not going to help you unless you retain with the functional phase or the functional appliance up to the age of 13, 14, etc., which is very difficult. So instead, patients who report early should be considered for two things. One is the predisposition to incisor trauma. And that's something that you need to know based on the recent Cochrane uh, review uh, done by Dr. Badri. Uh, what they found out was there are patients 
who have severe incisor proclination at the risk of trauma if they are not treated at an early stage. So try to correct only the incisor proclination. That's one. The second thing is to look at any psycho, uh, psychological bullying of the patient by the few years. And this could be one of the factors for you starting early. But then look for only interceptive type of treatment. Don't try to do a skeletal uh, growth alteration as such for patients who come in very early. And of course, patients who come later than four, you should be very specific and sure about what you are achieving. You are going to get only camouflage. And this camouflage, even if you use a fixed functional appliance, will be more of a dento alveolar correction and less of a skeletal correction. So that's what you're going to aim for. So let me show you one patient. If a patient who reports in CVM 1 or 2, what should you be doing? The most important thing is clinically examine the patient. Look for habits such as tongue thrusting, lip biting, and anything to do with the perioral musculature, which might be restricting the mandibular growth. Now, a typical patient like this, whom you know the mandibular growth will catch up later on, but who comes with a malocclusion like this, a Bugs Bunny appearance and is being ridiculed, all that you do is look at the transverse dimension also. And if you see that the posterior inclination of teeth is converging towards the occlusal, it means that there is going to be a scope for expansion, a simple rule, thumb rule. And then you also look on the at the model analysis. And then this is how the patient was. So what do you do in this particular uh, patient? Not much. All you do is expand in the upper arch, either with a removal or a fixed uh, type of an expander, slow expansion, no need of achieving or trying to be heroic in doing a, a rapid maxillary expansion and simply use a removal expansion in the upper arch. We also uh, used to use more of lip bump bumpers in lower arch for patients who are cooperative, especially to eliminate the lip trap. But what you can see is the patient used this for about four months and in those in that period of time, you can see that the molar relation from being a full cusp class 2 has come to almost an end on. That means the natural growth of the mandible is occurring. You don't have to do anything further. All that we did was use the 2 by 4 appliance to retract in this case. Do not have those photographs, but this, this was taken immediately after the etching was done. And then we continued to just finish a one phase in, in that aspect for the overjet correction, just to minimize the chances of trauma. So that's what you can do. Now, this was as far as the growth status was concerned. And I'm going uh, very briefly into these topics because of the paucity of time. Now, let's address the third uh, aspect, which is the compliance factor, and then which dictates the choice of functional appliance. I'll finish with the explanation for these two appliances, and then I'll talk to you about compliance factor also. So look at the dentition that is available for you after judging the growth status. So patients who have incomplete dentition, by that I mean mixed dentition and not fully permanent dentition, you could think of using two appliances, which we have used. So I'm, I'm talking about these to you, but you are most welcome to try and use other appliances also which work uh, well in terms of growth modulation. The first one is EVA, which can be coupled with a fixed appliance, or you could use a twin block separately followed by a fixed appliance. So how do you do that? I'll talk about it. But what exactly is the EVA? For those of you who are not aware of this particular appliance, it's a single uh, block appliance, and it has only the lower posterior bite block, so to say, and there is an additional U-loop, which gets anchored into the upper molars. I'll show you a picture of that as well. This appeared in the JCO 1994 and published uh, by Dr. Van der Schuren and Dismith. And uh, uh, this is in Dutch. That's why they call it EVA, because it represents experimental fixed appliance activator. So it's nothing but a reduced activator. But which would be held in the upper arch by a, a small wire. So what is done is the lower bite block has a projection of a U-loop buckley coming out. And then you need to have, a, if you're using a fixed appliance, a double tube of 0.9 millimeters with a 0.8 millimeter 
steel wire that goes in and engages into the upward. Now, this appliance fabrication is done after a bite registration, as we would do conventionally for a twin block or any functional appliance. And then you mount it on a fixator and then you uh, make this the, comp uh, the components of the appliance and actualize it. Now, how it works is, again, by way of posturing the mandible forward. And I'll show you a couple of patients which will make it simpler to understand. So 11-year-old patient with typical uh, class 2 div 1 appearance, and she also had a large uh, interdental uh, spacing in the upper arch, TVM3 to begin with. And therefore, we wanted to start off non-extraction, again used the backup plans to reduce incisive proclination. But this is immaterial because ultimately the fixed appliance that you're using is simply going to help in controlling the incisor positions and subsequently went ahead with EVA. So a two by four back setup, both in the upper and the lower arch to control the upper incisor inclination first because she had severely proclined incisors, subsequently went ahead with the EVA. And you can see that the EVA is posturing the mandible forward and while we do so, what you can also notice is that the upper incisors tend to tip further. And therefore, we had to add on the torquing auxiliaries at the end of EVA. This is a two-spur torquing auxiliary being added and then completed with the finishing. So you can see that the end occlusion has to be with good intercuspation. And this is how we could finish. At that time, we used to use a fixed lingual arch as a retainer instead of the fixed uh, bonded lingual retainer that we do now. This was quite some time ago, about 12 years ago. And this is how we could finish the patient. So from there to there, good change from the intraoral uh, correction, as well as look at the lower incisor position. Maintaining the lower incisors well, not allowing them to procline by using a labial rectangular wire in the uh, that's a braided wire which we used to use for controlling the incisor torque and upper incisors retroclined well and this is the overall change in the face so similarly you could use eva even in a class 2 div 2 i have not shown much of div 2 cases isn't it but even in a div 2 case you could use uh, eva or a uh, any fixed functional appliance also provided you time it correctly so in a div 2 case, what is the main challenge? The position of the upper incisors and also the distance between the central to the lateral incisors. So the upper centrals need to be torqued well and as well as uprighted, brought out. And the lower arch, which is locked behind, you can see that the lower incisors are slightly retroclined. They need to be improved well. And for that, you look at the growth status. It was CVM ending 2, 3 beginning. So it was a good time to start with a pre-functional and then go ahead with the functional phase. So this was how he was uh, to begin with. Again, treated with the big plants, but then you could use pre-existed also. Use the wire going from the molar to molar, but not engaging the incisors. So you're developing any way of one point contact, but a gentle force against the upper incisors. This is on the day of starting treatment. This is after two visits, only the upper arch is strapped up. And by the time the EVA is given, that is after the upper incisors are taught sufficiently, you go ahead with the EVA. And by that time, you should have the lower incisors also bracketed necessarily because EVA again being a tooth bone appliance is going to cause lower incisor proclination. So if you are not able to prevent the proclination by using a labial uh, appliance with a rectangular label rectangular torque that is built in using a braided wire which we used to use then you can create problems now in this case initially we did not use any rectangular wire uh, for controlling the torque because he had retroclined incisors subsequently it was used and this is to the time wherein the third stage and the finishing are occurring so over correction of some rotations uprighting wherever needed and in fact no need of a torquing auxiliary because it was controlled well at the beginning and the middle of the treatment itself. So this is the end result. Again, some of you who have treated patients with the beg plans may wonder whether this is a beg finish. 
where it's in your hands, the operator's hands. It's up to you how you can manage it. So this is how we could finish. And you see the overall changes in the facial form. This is how we could complete the treatment. This is how he was before treatment. And this is at the end of treatment. So class 2 div 2s would respond very well, especially if they're retroclined lower incisors. So this is how we started off intraorally pre-treatment. And the bottom line shows the post-treatment result. So uh, definitely a good change. Of course, uh, growth stimulation of this kind is only something that one can dream for. It may or may not happen in a given patient. But luckily, in this patient, we had a good amount of uh, mandibular growth in terms of the downward and forward projection of the chin and overall improvement in the vertical face also, vertical third of the face. That helped us. And look at the incisor top that has been built. So all put together with the soft tissue correction, it, he looks much better. Okay. Now coming to the last aspect of this presentation, which is on compliance. The patient compliance is a real challenge and you need to be prepared for it. And the facts of uh, compliance about compliance is that the percentage of pure, poor compliance is almost 50%. And this is across. In fact, there was a recent study which tried to assess what, what causes poor compliance. And it seems it is not just the peer bullying that, uh, that helps to uh, understand, but it's also the parental influence. If the parents are happy with what kind of treatment the patient is being given, the chances of compliance are much better. This appeared in the 2021 uh, issue of uh, Angle Orthodontist. You can go through that. But what is important is both the patients and the families or the parents misrepresent the extent of appliance uh, cooperation. So often you can come across a patient who has not been very regular. What do you do? You call the parent and ask whether the patient is cooperative. And the patient, the parent may actually tell you that the patient is cooperative, whereas he or she may not be using it at all. So that's because they are worried whether the treatment progress will happen, whether you will continue treating or not, and therefore they misrepresent. The worst thing for an orthodontist is that the compliance reduces the longer duration the treatment goes on for. So patient who is very cooperative to begin with, let's say in the first three months, may wane off in terms of his cooperation or compliance as the treatment goes on for a year or year and a half. And this is something for all types of orthodontic treatment we need to be worried about, which is why we should keep talking to the patients, motivate the patients, both for hygiene, for cooperation with elastics or any of these appliances. Now, this is the article that I was uh, mentioning about, the predictors of patient compliance during class 2 div 1 treatment. And this is in Angle 2021, recent article. And what they conclude is that the parental perception of the child's emotional well-being being altered is more important as a predictor of the compliance factor. The psychosocial effects as well as the oral function limitations, such as the ones caused by habits, are actually, according to the families, of negligible influence. And this is something that you can use to quote in your uh, answers also. A very recent study. And they have tried uh, or they have tried to assess from a good number of 77 patients and their families. So let me show you one example of a typical uh, case in which compliance becomes an issue. So this was a 13-year-old patient who started off with treatment. What do you see? A class 2 subtype, I would say, would be in the subtype between B and E because he has some amount of maxillary prognathism along with a mandibular deficiency. So what we did was initially we gave him a twin block appliance with a high pull headgear. Wanted to restrict the vertical growth of the maxilla along with stimulation of the mandibular growth, accelerating the mandibular growth. This was for some time what he was using for about four months, there was some amount of change from being a class two to an end on. But subsequently, from months of five, six, seven, eight, up to a month of eighth month of treatment, this was where he was stuck. This is the study model that was taken at the after the eight months of twin block correction. 
the problem was that he was still having an overset of 6 millimeters and he was still having endon molar and premolar relationship so it was not a completion of the uh, total skeletal correction and this is the point at which after asking the patient's parent repeatedly fifth month sixth month finally in the seventh month the patient's parent accepted that in the last three four months the patient the child was very irregular with the upmass then what was the option that was remaining we had to do the class 2 correction also so we went ahead with the fixed appliances and then subsequently used a fixed functional appliance nothing really uh, different in terms of the, uh, the treatment per se but the patient was ready for the postgraduate examination that's what matters ultimately to all of you isn't it as postgraduates you are most worried whether my case will finish for treatment or for the exam or not and especially for batches which have gone through the covid pandemic i really pity the trouble that you people might be taking now to try and hurry up with the patients but coming back to this case what happened was the patient turned out to be uh, finishing very well in fact this was from one of the postgraduates again in whom you can see that good interdigitation a proper overjet overbite relationship and we could finish treatment in this way so you can see a good balanced facial form good amount of uh, incisor exposure as is expected not excessive and a good change in the facial form from where he was so this is how it works so this in short my dear friends is what i had to express about treatment planning ask the three questions to yourself first one is what is the severity and the causative of the class 2 the second is importantly the growth status of the patient is the patient at the right stage early or late and third try to assess by talking to the patient and the parent whether a child is cooperative or could be cooperative or not for appliances such as this if you read some of the recent articles that clark has published in fact he has published a very nice article uh, of three decades of twin block appliances in the journal of orthodontics he says if you make the appliances comfortable to the patient the cooperation factor is going to be high because he was very annoyed with the british uh, literature quoting up to around 30% of dropouts during twin block and you know what his answer was he said you people are not getting good results because you are increasing the heights of the posterior blocks uh, excessively and this is from one of the articles that was published by dr jonathan sandler how to take a wax bite for a twin block and in that he says open up the bite by around 7 to 8 mm in the posterior area in the molar area and dr uh, clark's comments to that was if you do so you are going to end up getting poor cooperation so patient compliance is of utmost importance when you use a functional appliance give an appliance that is comfortable automatically the compliance factor will improve and doing that you can achieve very good results so with that uh, we complete the second part of the lect second lecture of this uh, course if there is any specific question on this i can address a couple of them i'll stop sharing now and then we can uh, go ahead to the third lecture so if ravi sir is there or any of the staff members you can let me know any questions please i'm sorry i had to rush a bit sir because uh, of the time frame that we have i do not want to encroach on nandu's time for his lectures yes i i can see a participant wanting to ask good afternoon sir good afternoon uh, so in the first part of your lecture you had mentioned about the duration of the appliance wear that you said it has to be of a minimal one year wear for the stability to be uh, good so uh, we also have heard about the early and the late pterygoid responses that we see so uh, could we uh, like is there any clinical way that we distinguish between the two or uh, Uh, like not in all the patients they have a pain but they uh, keep it repositioned anteriorly so how do we know that if it is achieved or uh, so in terms of the duration you mean or 
yes sir duration terrible yeah. response terrible. yes sir yeah i mean one is what have you heard of the phantom activator effect that is whenever the activator was not used activator was only a night time appliance isn't it so after it was discontinued during the day the patient used to posture the mandible forward after a couple of months that was harvard's uh, observation even andreessen has mentioned about it so they called it as the phantom activator effect so a similar thing you can notice with a removable functional appliance and as you rightly pointed out if you get a early pterygoid response that's the best indication but otherwise there is no other tool unfortunately other than a radiograph that can pinpoint whether you are getting a skeletal alteration or not and this one year time frame also that dr abi mentioned is not something that is going to be clinically feasible for every patient i hope you understand what i mean so for severe class 2 patient you need to hold on for roughly one year and this is based on the extrapolation data if you look at the data from uh, clark himself the twin block active phase is between 6 to 9 months and then the supportive phase of around 3 to 6 months so you're looking at maximum of one year to 15 months as as a whole for giving the appliance whether you get a pterygoid response or not you have to continue uh, using the appliance all that you can do is probably i mean this is what i'm speculating though i've never done it but you can leave ask the patient not to use the appliance for about a week or so after about 3 months and you are not eliciting a pterygoid response call them back after a week and see whether the patient is holding it in the edge to edge relation even now subconsciously do not try to make the patient conscious and see whether they are coming close to edge to edge which would mean that the appliance has started working but this is just a anecdotal uh, answer that i'm giving i do not have any uh, literature to substantiate that that's a good question i mean something that is thought provoking good afternoon sir yeah good afternoon sir in most of the cases uh, you had shown uh, the use of fixed functional appliances sir like herbs mm-hmm. or forces so uh, there are many literature which uh, says that it is more uh, it usually causes a dento alveolar change rather than a skeletal change and the relapse rate is more uh, so what do you think uh, what do you say about yeah, yeah i mean it's it's an accepted thing in the literature to say uh, uh, or based on the studies that the lower incisor proclination will be much more especially with a rigid fixed functional appliance like a herb stuff appliance because ultimately what do teeth understand do they know that you are putting in a twin block or a herbs they do not they just know what is the force being thrust upon them the force and the vector of force so if you keep the force anchored to the dentition you are going to get more of proclination if you get it anchored even to the skeleton and that's what has been uh, done have you you might have seen some articles which try to anchor the forces or a herbs appliance uh, herbs like appliance onto the bone plate which is kept in the mandibular symphysial region little lateral to the symphysis even those studies did show that there would be some amount of proclination that is a given so what and what about uh, twin block appliance does twin block uh, not cause proclination it does cause i mean even with the best of things that you do incisal capping and an acrylic squasher that uh, mills and maclock have given you still end up between 5 to 9 degrees of proclination that's a given how to minimize this is what you should be looking at okay so the best way to address it even if you use a fixed functional appliance is what i do is build in a bit of label root torque into the anterior part of the arch so one is use labial torque prescription if you are using mbt it automatically has it if you use a daemon you need to ask for those brackets which have a anterior labial root torque and then add on to the labial root torque in your arch wire itself then you can use a fixed functional appliance to minimize the amount of proclination so don't be under the impression that because you use a fixed functional appliance you are going to procline the teeth severely uh, if there is time after the, uh, the the last lecture is over i'll show you a couple of cases in which we have tried to balance out the extraction and a fixed func- uh, fixed functional appliance and still hold on to the lower incisors at 94 95 degrees okay 
So you'll have to work on your fixed functional appliance in a way that it minimizes the proclination. Use your knowledge of biomechanics. That's my advice to you and how you can do it. I would also recommend you go through a book uh, that is the Atlas of Jasper Jumper, if you can get it, which is authored by Dr. Schwindling. And he has shown two, three interesting designs by which you can minimize the proclination. One is, of course, the appliances such as the Mara and the Advanced Sync, which are a molar to molar appliance. And the other way is to use what is called as an outrigger, outrigger design, based on which I have modified the forces for. But all these cases that I'm showing you, the incisor proclination did not go beyond five to six degrees. So if that is a given and an accepted feature, use it for uh, to your benefit. I hope that answers. So we'll take one more question and then we'll go to the third lecture. Yes, yes, surely. I'm happy to see that there's so much of interaction. That's what I'd asked for. Sir, sir, yes. actually, during uh, my interaction with Dr. Sadashu Shetty, mm -hmm. he said that uh, most of the cases he'll he'll love to untreat and untreat and send them back. And he called them back and again, he takes uh, the picture of the particular patient. He finds a normal growth. Now, sir, is there any clinical para para parameter to assess whether the patient need to be subjected for functional appliances or just leave them like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting observation. In fact, even the morning after the question was asked, I would say that if the mandible were to grow to the normal size in every patient, would you at all see class 2 patients as adults or adult class 2 patients? No, isn't it? I mean, if the mandible were to grow to a normal size mandible, which is matching that of the maxilla, you wouldn't see a cl adult class 2 patients at all, isn't it? But you do see. What does that mean? That there is some amount of restriction because of which the mandible either may not grow in the same direction that is it is supposed to grow. And you do see many surgical cases, that is adult patients with severe class 2s, which end up getting surgery done. There is no clinical parameter, unfortunately, which says that you should treat this patient or you should leave him alone, other than what I feel in my clinical opinion, other than the severity of the malocclusion. So if a patient is so severe that even a, a, a functional appliance may not benefit much, then we are going to leave them, but try to correct whatever dentition you can during this period. That is my understanding. And in the last lecture, in the third lecture, I'll show you one modified method of what Dr. Dilip Patel of Gujarat uses. And that's a very interesting method of using the twin block. And he has shown dramatic changes with the removal twin block appliance uh, in the facial form. Now, if I were to not treat those patients and leave them alone and see them as adults to be normal after the end of treatment, then I don't think across the globe people would be using functional appliances at all. I think what Dr. Sadashiv Shetty sir has mentioned, maybe in a selected group of patients that he feels that they are anyway going to grow. So probably those are the cases in whom you expand the maxilla, leave them alone, let the mandibular growth occur. Uh, that may be the possible explanation. I do not know. But my opinion is you need to treat those patients who come to you with the given class 2 problem. With a functional fixed or tired combination, that's up to you depending on the diagnosis as such. Uh, sir, my question is on the dual bite, sir. Yes, there are yes. a couple of cases where we ended up with the dual bite. Uh, is it a condylar abnormality or is it abnormality in the occlusion? So how do you address these issues? Yeah, and just an added question to that. Were you using a removable appliance or a fixed functional appliance? It's a removable appliance as well as a fixed functional appliance. In both the cases, we ended up a couple of cases in a department. With uh -huh. the bite. Okay. So what is your take on this? Yeah, yeah. You do come across dual bites at the end of. I have seen more with fixed functional cases. That's why I asked you. Because with fixed functional cases, after the end of when you remove your fixed functional appliance, you just hope that whatever correction was seen with the appliance on is what is going to stay. 
whereas with the removal appliance you can actually look at how the progress has occurred also do the selective trimming of the appliances in such a way that you start getting proper intercuspation by the end of your retentive phase then the chance of dual bite is less however when you see a dual bite patient most of the time it is a improper adaptation of the temporomandibular joint that might have occurred and clark talks about this also so one of the possible reasons for a improper tmj adaptation is the lack of posterior contact and the entire hinging of the uh, end of treatment of functional appliances being on the incisors so you can probably cross check whether only the incisors were contacting at the end of your removal appliance phase also removal functional appliance phase if so then it's purely a tmj reaction and the way to address it would be to restart on uh, one is try to find out to what extent there is a CO cocr discrepancy and try to address that first before going for a fixed appliance also but i have seen it more with a uh, fixed functional appliance and i go back and put the fixed functional appliance for a uh, some more time so that i i achieve the necessary result that's what i've done in one case which had a dual bite but i've seen that with uh, some other students in departments also there is no no specific measure as such customization is the only way out yeah, any further questions you can post it in the chat box uh, i think we'll continue with the lecture uh, dr jethan yes sir Use so your chat box for any further questions, please. I'll share the screen and uh, go to. Hope the screen is visible and I'm audible. So let's go ahead with the last lecture, which is going to be more on the usage of twin block in clinical practice. So I'm going to switch gear and go only to a clinical uh, mode of presentation with some basics of the twin block, which is very much necessary. So the main focus or the objectives of this talk is to try and highlight what are the ideal requisites of a functional appliance. What is it that you look for while you are doing a removable functional appliance? Help to understand the twin block better by way of the articles that I mentioned, Dr. Clark and uh, also what has been published in recent European journals. Some improvements in the design, especially for reactivation of the bite blocks and the important evidence-based literature for all the postgraduate students, because this is very, very important. Now, what should be the ideal requisites of a removable functional appliance? Obviously, it should be a simple one to fabricate. This is where Frankel, the functional regulator was lacking because it was quite uh, operator sensitive and uh, time consuming, should be easy to use by the patient. And by that, I mean, the patient should be able to use it even while having food, while masticating, and should be more of a 24 hour uh, appliance, should be able to predictably reposition the mandible. And this is, I think, where the question of dual bite also would arise as to whether it is predictably positioning the mandible forward and then gives the scope for the dental eruption to occur and get a posterior uh, tripod kind of a bite at the end of treatment. And finally, should be capable of optimizing or redirecting the skeletal, dental and the soft tissues with modifications when it is needed. Now, this is my personal way of looking at a functional appliance. You can add certain things if you feel they would be needed. Now, we, using this as the basis, we would see that the twin block checks right on most of these. It's a simple appliance, simple for the patient to use, will reproduce the position of the mandible uh, properly, and is amenable for modifications. By modifications, I mean you can add a headgear if needed, you can add an expansion screw when needed, you can also use a lip a lot to control your uh, lip habit if the patient has one. So all these can be added on to a twin block. And that's why it's become probably the most popular appliance in uh, across the world. In fact, one of the uh, articles that talks about 75% of orthodontists 
in the UK and Europe prefer twin block as the appliance of choice. And the reasons being the uh, uh, checking of the, uh, the list that I mentioned as the ideal appliance. It's very versatile, not just for class two, but also for class three problems. Even the pseudo class threes that you can address very well with a uh, reverse twin block. It's versatile in terms of incorporation of the orthopedic elements in the screws and versatile for hybridization. Hybridization means you can add certain components of a different appliance altogether in order to bring about. And you can also modify the appliance in a way that you can help it. And there is there are some interesting clinical cases which I have seen in the publication. So one particular one that I would like to state is the patient, class two patient who has an impacted palatal canine in the upper arch. And the, the twin block has been modified in such a way that after putting a bracket on the uh, impacted canine after exposure, there was a provision in the lower block to apply an elastic and pull the canine down while the functional phase was going on. So some modifications and innovations that you can do as per the need of a in a given patient. But are you aware that twin block is 40 years old? In fact, I mean, I'm talking of 40 years old from the first publication. The first publication appeared in 1982 in the European Journal of Orthodontics. Though Clark had used it first in the year 1977, just a couple of years after I was born. So that, that shows the time-tested uh, device as such that we are talking about. An article published in 88 in the American Journal, which made it uh, an eye-opener for the American orthodontists also. And based on the surveys that are done in the JCO, the British and the European journals, we don't have one in the Indian journal, but it's the most popular among all the removable functional appliances worldwide. So often a question is asked in the exam, why did you choose a twin block? Why not an activator? Why not a bionator, isn't it? Those of you who are examiners would want to ask this question. And those who are going for the exams <clears throat> would be wondering what to say uh, as the good answer for this type of a question. So one is talk about the ideal requisites that a functional appliance should have and how it is suitable for your given patient with, of course, certain modifications if needed. I'm not saying that if the examiner wants you to use a bionator or a modified activator, reject that, you should be prepared or you should be knowing how to uh, fabricate a bionator and use it. But at the same time, if you are given a choice, why are you using a twin block? So the rationale, all of you are aware, I'm just quickly going through this. Uh, the mention of uh, by Clark is that you are simulating the occlusal incline in such a way that the mandible, which is shown to be retro position in this particular picture, gets advanced by way of the occlusal incline. And then you have the ability to trim the posterior part of the upper block and allow the lower premolar and the molar, at least the lower molar, to erupt to whatever extent that is required. So this is the fundamental design that Clark had talked about. Initially, in fact, there was a lot of discussion about whether there should be a labial bow incorporated or not, whether there should be some other retentive clasps in the lower anteriors. But this is the standard twin block that Clark mentions even today. The clasps that are used for retention, he modified. He talks about the delta clasp, but there is no harm in using the Adams clasp also, as long as you get good retention. And in fact, I'm going to show you the, the modified version of what Dr. Dilip Patel uses. And in that, he uses a C clasp on the lower molar as against to no clasp on the uh, lower molar that Clark talks about. But that's individual preference. But this is the standard design that is shown. Now, let me play one animation which talks about the overall changes that the functional appliance, like the twin block, is supposed to get. I hope this animation plays. This is from Dolphin. And this is trying to show a class two correction occurring with a labial bow and an expansion screw in the appliance. Now, not that everything is right in this particular animation, but this helps you to understand the basic stage of treatment. So the patient is able to guide the mandible forward because of the incline. And over a period of time, if expansion is needed, 
that's done here, but they have not shown the split labial bow because they believe that that will help in retracting the upper incisors. Subsequently, the posterior trimming of the upper block to allow the eruption of the lower molars. The upper incisors have also retracted and then the lower premolars erupt to, for the occlusion to be stabilized and then you have the fixed up lines to correct. So this is what is shown in the animation as well. I'm sorry, there is oh. computer has got stuck. Give me a minute. Am I audible, sir? Yes, you are audible. Uh, I'm audible, uh, isn't it? Yes. Okay. So I, I think it was only the animation that got stuck. I mean, this is one of the common problems when, <laughs> when we try to do online uh, video and animation blend together. So I'll just uh, stop on this because is my screen share still on? Yes. Uh, are you able to see it? Okay. So it got stuck. Let me just uh, close this. Please give me a minute to restart this. So I just need a minute because the presentation is not opening. Yeah, now it is there. So let me just share the screen. I hope now you can see the screen. Sir. Yeah. And go to slideshow. Okay. Now, uh, the animation was basically trying to show how the uh, further fixed appliance phase works. And a couple of errors in, in the animation, but more or less it, it is help, uh, it is useful to understand what are the stages. Now, this is one article that I would recommend all of you to go through, which appeared in the uh, Journal of Orthodontics 2010. And this is reflections of 30 years of clinical use. And in this, Clark has highlighted what are the most common problems or the mistakes that are done by clinicians. What he feels are the limitations because of which Winblock might not have worked well. And I, I talked about the increase in the bite, uh, height of the bite blocks as one of them. And uh, the other things are, of course, using the labial bow or not making aesthetic appliances because of which he feels that the cooperation would be low. Now, the design of the twin block, all of you are familiar with the 70 degree angulation that he came up after trying 90 degrees and 45 degrees. This, according to Clark, though it is not substantiated with any clinical data, it is supposed to help in getting maximum use of the forces of occlusion and the mastication, because of which he says it should be used even during uh, while having food. So the advantages are, of course, I mean, what, what he has given, but one specific advantage I would like to highlight among all the functional, removal functional appliances that have been tested and 
verified by way of clinical research, TwinBlock has compared the best in terms of the response to treatment, that is the skeletal response to treatment. And this is as close to the herb suppliance as possible. What I'm trying to say is, in terms of getting skeletal change, they compared herbs, forces, bionator, and uh, a headgear combination, uh, herbs and headgear combination. Out of them, Twinblock was right up there along with the herbs plants in terms of the skeletal correction. And herbs, as you know, is the rigid fixed functional appliance which is supposed to get the maximum skeletal correction. Now, stages of twin block treatment. I thought since I'm lecturing to the AB Shetty group here, I'll have a small mnemonic here and I call this as the ASR. Unfortunately, the uh, I, I didn't see Dr. Krishna Nayak here, but he would be happy to see this. This I call as the ASR or the AB Shetty Royal Steam since IPL is right around the corner. You can use it for the orthodontic premier league also, Ravi sir, if your team is going there. So I call it as the AB Shetty Royals. What does A stand for? A stands for the active phase. This would be roughly six to nine months of treatment. S for the support phase, which would be three to six months as advocated by Clark. And then R would stand for the retention phase or the nine month uh, phase in which gradually the appliance wear should be reduced also. It's not that the support and the retention phase is exactly the same. Remember that. So support phase is wherein you are using the same appliance or you are using an anterior incline, but you are keeping it on for a sufficiently long period of time, helping the posteriors to erupt and get a proper occlusion. Three-point occlusion or even the premolar, second premolar coming as close to the occlusion as possible. That's very important. Whereas in the retention phase, all you are doing is holding on to the correction by guiding the mandible forward. So there's a slight difference between the support phase and the retention phase. So remember ASR, it will be easy for you. Now let's talk about, apart from what is given in the book, let's talk about some changes that have happened in the twin block design per se and the modifications that people have used. Because this is from a various sources that I've collected and it's a compilation of those. So what are the changes that have happened? One is change in the appliance design, change in the treatment protocol I've already discussed from two phase to one phase. I won't be going into details of that. But integrating twin block with fixed appliances, <clears throat> which some of the orthodontists do regularly, I do not follow that because I use a, a fixed functional appliance instead. And what Clark has shown is the fixed twin block, which can be probably something that can be 3D printed also in the near future. In fact, we have an orthodontist, Dr. Digan Thakkar here in India at Rajput, who is doing it already using a 3D printed uh, twin block, which could be fixed into the mouth as well. So what has changed in the twin block design is people have tried to highlight how to minimize the incisor proclination. So several methods have been used. Most of you would be aware of using the incisal capping. You can see here that there is the incisal capping across the lower block and it tries to minimize the posterior, the anterior open bite also that might happen if you do not have an incisal capping. You also use a ball and clasp here to minimize the uh, proclination. But a recent study in which they compared the uh, incisal capping versus non-incisal capping did not find any uh, clinically significant result. That's just for information that you should remember. The other modification is by Trenoth. He used a lower labial bow in the lower uplands along with a south end clasp. And based on his data, this appeared in the 2000 uh, Journal of Orthodontics. Based on his clinical study, this design of the south end clasp in the upper as well as the lower arch minimized the palatal tipping of the upper incisors as well as the lower incisor proclination in the lower arch. And this is one particular design. I'm just giving you the designs. It's, there is no specific single design that can take care of the lower incisor proclination as such. As against this, Mills and Maculoff use what is called as an acrylic squasher. Now, what is this? This is nothing but a short uh, labial bow. So that's canine to canine. And along with that, you also have a labial padding more towards 
affects the occlusal surface or the incisal edges of the lower incisors. And along with that, in the lower block and the upper block, they also have soldered a, uh, or modified the clasp to have a soldered hook onto which you can also attach vertical elastics just to uh, help in getting better firm seating of the appliance even at night time. Now, this is one of the modifications. And remember that Mills and Maculock were the ones who showed the maximum response of twin block in comparison to the control group. They have shown up to four millimeters of increase in the mandibular size in comparison to the control group. What has changed in the appliance design is now you no longer use a lot of extra oral traction, that is the Concord bow that was shown in the first edition, and also elastic such as this. Labial bow is also discarded now, as per what Clark has mentioned. But then, if you have a patient in whom a labial bow would work, you can use it for the initial few months of treatment at least. Because what Clark believes is, if you make the appliance anesthetic, as would happen with the labial bow, the patient cooperation may die down. That's his understanding. Now, coming to the clinical protocol, I'll show you some more modifications towards the end of this presentation. But the clinical protocol should be to first identify the right patient as there was a question, which patient to use what kind of appliance. Definitely, you have to plan that out. Customized bite registration. I'll try to show you what modification I do in the bite registration by way of still photographs uh, and Dr. Nandakumar will highlight by way of a clinical demonstration later on. A customized appliance design which is very important for your given patient and all postgraduate students please pay attention here exam going PGs that the examiner is interested in understanding whether you can think laterally and plan for customization for a given patient. He's not, uh, I'm sure he or she, the examiner, is sure that you can make a good twin block. But if a patient has an additional lip trap, he will try to see whether you, you have thought of using a lip well or If the patient has a vertical uh, a hyperdivergent type of a facial pattern, the examiner would be interested in seeing whether you have planned for a head care or when there is a need for an expansion. So these things have to be customized in a given patient. Don't, don't think of this again as a cookbook approach. And then you have to manage the appliance properly. That is duration of usage initially and how do you manage it subsequently. That's what I'm going to talk about. Reactivation, which would be needed in cases with large overjets, that is incremental advancement. And then retention phase, support and retention phase. So identifying the right patient, we have already talked about this. I'm not going to go in greater detail. But one important point that I'm putting up here is a class 2 patient in the circumpubertal period, that is in CVM3, who requires alteration in the face height, that is increase in the anterior face height, is in my opinion the best type of patient to have. Because patients with already optimal or increased anterior facial height will not be good responders to any form of growth modulation as such. Crowded dentition, yes, you can use, but they should be close to the pubertal peak. So you do the functional appliance phase first and then address the crowding and the proclination at a later stage. That's something that you can plan. But you should also be aware of what is called as a pre-functional phase before giving the twin block. What is a pre-functional phase? Pre-functional phase, tries to address those teeth that can potentially obstruct the mandibular advancement. And very commonly, you will see that upper incisors, upper lateral incisors, which may be in standing, prevent the mandible from moving forward. You can check that in a given patient. Ask the patient to open the mouth. Try to When the patient tries to close, they will first bite on the lateral incisors, which are in standing, and then the patient glides the mandible backward. Now, this is a posterior displacement of the mandible from the first contact. Now, this could be something very useful because patients respond well in such situations. However, without addressing the, those two lateral incisors, you cannot get good activation of the appliance. And secondly, improving the inclination of teeth to improve or increase the chances of skeletal uh, alteration. And therefore, I always recommend that if the lower incisors are proclined severely to begin with, do a short phase of pre-functional correction 
to try and get the lower incisors as upright as possible. You could do it with a fixed appliance for a short period and try to blend your uh, twin block to fit against the uh, lower appliance also, lower fixed appliance as well. So that's something that you need to work on. So typical class two div two cases like this, wherein the mandible is completely blocked because of the position of the incisors. Retrocline two incisors, uh, or rather the four upper incisors. Also the constricted maxillary arch here. And the other one is wherein the upper lateral incisors are in standing, preventing the lower incisors from coming forward. Now imagine this patient being in the CVM3. Can you do a full fixed appliance correction here? No, it may not be possible. So what is the idea? You can do a sectional appliance, bond only from canine to canine, get the la upper laterals out quickly just by tipping. Don't concentrate on the root correction at that point. Use the twin block. And after the twin block is used, as, as is shown here, after the twin block is used, then subsequently go for addressing the uh, remainder of the problem. So this is just after using the completing the twin block active phase, wherein the upper incisors, which were in standing to begin with, have been brought forward. The mandible has been projected forward using the twin block appliance, and you are at a overcorrection stage, that is a molar at a superclass one relationship. So this is something that you can try. Most commonly, you will come across patients with a narrow maxillary arch. Now, what does Clark recommend? He says that you can use a uh, expansion screw with your upper appliance. Definitely that is possible. But in my opinion, there are three options that you have. One is a removable functional appliance with an expansion screw, as uh, Clark has mentioned. But sometimes you will notice that you need to expand both in the canine, intracanine area as well as the intramolar area. In those situations, you might need to add two screws, but that becomes a little cumbersome. So instead, I would think of using a modified Zacharyson TPA. I'll show you what that is. Or if you have a two skeletal crossbite, obviously use a RME. Correct the skeletal crossbite first because you know that the transverse growth always finishes first. And then use either a fixed twin block or a removable twin block appliance as such. Now let me show you what's a modified TPA, Zacharyson TPA. So this is from uh, Zacharyson's Modific modification of the TPA as such, but I have incorporated a small change here. Zacharyson TPA was published in the World Journal of Orthodontics in the year 2003. And he talked about using, instead of a Gauchgarian arch, an inverted triangle in the open-ended triangle in the palate and the uh, a double back or a soldered type of a TPA, uh, or, uh, Zacharyson TPA. Now to that, what modification I did was simply continue the double back, that is you make it a semi-fixed and you continue the anterior arm up to the canine. And what will happen is when you activate this TPA by giving a toe in bend for the molar correction, which, which are most commonly rotated in a class two, that's a disto uh, mesio buckle and a disto palatal rotation you need to correct. So when you improve, uh, when you try to expand the TPA by giving a toe in bend here, as well as some opening up of the U loop here, automatically you get good expansion in the uh, extended arms themselves. Now this works very well for me as a pre-functional phase for correcting the canine and the intramolar distance, both in one single shot. So in selected cases, I use the Zacharyson TPA as a pre-functional phase. So it's depending on your patient, ultimately. There's no standard rule that you should do this followed by that. No, you, you, you decide based on what, what situation you are challenged with. Now I'll show you a modified construction bite approach. This uh, Dr. Nandakumar is going to take in detail. But there are some points that you need to remember for bite registration. Now, based on what Clark has mentioned, and also there are several mentions of uh, how much should be the forward activation. The common consensus now is that the bite registration should be 3 millimeter distal to the most uh, post protrusive position. This is provided your overjet, initial overjet is within the tune of between 10 to 12 millimeters. If you have greater overjets, 
then you it's better to do a stepwise advancement considering the patient's comfort level the second thing is vertical opening there is some controversy we believe that opening it up by around 3 to 4 mm beyond the freeway space is more than adequate now how do you register the freeway space you already know through functional analysis that you are going to try the various methods that is the phonetic method or the combined method by which you can try to find out the postural rest position and therefore the freeway space you need to go a little beyond the freeway space to prevent the appliance from slipping out in the advanced position that's the main reason uh, why you do that the vertical opening activators and the other activators with very high bite blocks were to initiate the viscoelastic response so it's also called as the v activator phenomenon uh, and this was tried out by different people either uh, again by the toronto group itself in which they increase the block but that becomes very cumbersome for the patient to use so restrict your vertical opening to around 5 mm at the premolar level that's what is considered what do you do in class 2 div 2 patients the sagittal positioning is minimal first and the vertical opening is kept more so the rule of 10 that is supposed to be followed the rule of 10 which was given probably in the second edition of graber newman though i have not found a literal source for it talks that if you advance by 5 to 6 mm you open up the remainder of the 10 mm so 10 minus 6 is 4 so you open up the mandibular uh, height or the bite block by around 4 mm that is the uh, the rule of 10 that you will follow now we'll show you a simple method by which you can register the bite the most common thing and this is for exam going pgs what you have to do is look at the anterior face side the lower face side so you you put a couple of markers one on the nose and one in the chin region so one is the mobile area one is the immobile area the most important point is train the patient to look in the mirror and see how the bite is going to look when it is advanced that is with a favorable vto we often tend to neglect this we just try to guide the mandible into position where we want but if you take help and this is a patient who was shown for just about 5 minutes how the uh, face would look when the mandible is protrusive and the position that you are supposed to get in the bite it will be very simple so try doing this and bite registration methods usual horseshoe method is what people use i'll show you modified method which we follow and i'll tell you the reason for doing that the horseshoe method i'm sure dr nandakumar is going to explain later this is a modified method which we borrowed from the prophet second edition and in that he had shown this anterior cut out of the wax so what all you need is one sheet of wax modeling wax you can roll up only the edges which are going to fit against the uh, occlusal surfaces so a single sheet of wax in the palate and about four times the closure one over the other of the uh, in the occlusal table and then make sure the bite block is uniform on both the sides and then you ask the patient to advance the mandible now what is the advantage of this type of a bite registration you can see anteriorly very clearly how much is the opening here what is happening to the midline as well as the posterior disocclusion that is happening whereas i'll go back to the horseshoe method here in this case you are not very precise unless you keep marking against the wax after recording the bite that is you might have to repeat the bite a couple of times to be perfect with this particular method whereas in the other method this is modified profits method you can directly ask the patient to chew and guide the mandible in such a way that if you want some amount of midline Uh, correction to be happening there so that is the patient is otherwise having a coincident midline but when he is advancing and closing he is deviating to one side you can guide the mandible at that point along on a softened wax and this is the method that we uh, prefer uh, of course after it is done with the bite in place measure the distance that you had kept earlier so that you know how much is the overall opening in the bite that you have obtained and then 
you go to the actual uh, polishing of the bite and other things. So this is how the horseshoe shaped bite would look on the uh, patient's models. And this is how you would get the modified uh, on the modified method. Both are acceptable because they ultimately reproduce the advanced position of the mandible. So this is something that I thought I should show. And then transferring the bite onto the patients uh, uh, from the cast onto a fixator compulsorily. Because I've seen people use a three-point articulator, but if you are using a heat cure method for twin block, <clears throat> the fixator and the individual components being done there would be always more advantageous to uh, minimize the trimming of the twin block after it is done. So individual wire components are fabricated. You need to uh, plan this out what components would be needed for your exam when you see the patient, <clears throat> depending on the eruption of the premolars, etc. And then go ahead. Likewise, in the lower arch, make sure one of the common mistakes that people plan is to have some kind of attachment on the lower molar. Now, mind you, based on what Prophet, uh, on what Clark has mentioned, the lower molar should be totally free to erupt during the course of the treatment. And therefore, Try not to have any kind of attachment there. However, there are some changes that people have brought about. One interesting and important question that examiners often ask is how are you going to, after you insert the appliance, that's the second day of the clinical viva, what are you going to do with the appliance? What is the recommended protocol? So you should know the initial adaptation is most important from the patient's point of view. So Clark's protocol is Leave the appliance cemented in the mouth for the first two weeks. Simple. Just cement it. Allow the patient to eat with it. Be comfortable. After two weeks, you can make it a removable appliance. Removable functional appliance. My personal recommendation is I do not fix or cement the twin block initially because I want the patient to accommodate with the removable appliance itself. However, in a couple of patients who seem to be very notorious or in whom I thought they might just throw away the appliance somewhere. You know when you see such naughty patients, isn't it? So in those patients, male patients especially, I prefer to cement them for not just two weeks, but literally one month till I was sure that they would use the appliance as such. <clears throat> and the first one week, I always ask the patient to wear it only during waking hours. That is, the patient has school or call uh, usually a school and tuitions, etc. So after they come back home, they're supposed to use it for two to three hours so that they know how is the fit and for them to get used to speaking with the appliance on. You have to train how to make the patients aware of that. Once they are comfortable with it, then you make it nighttime wear for the next one week. And only after about two weeks, I ask them to make it full time. Now, this is a bit of a modification from the conventional but this is uh, what I have been trying to do and uh, getting good results in terms of the patient compliance. So this is my personal recommendation. And uh, whenever you have a expansion screw or headgear, etc., you start it or start activation or the headgear to be given only after the patient is used to the appliance. Do not start everything from day one. That is, if you have a twin block with a headgear and an expansion screw, I've seen students asking to activate the appliance, put the headgear and show to the patient and try everything on, start from day one and make it a 24-hour appliance. You are not going to get cooperation from the patient. You be assured of that. So try to make it simpler. Think as if you are a patient, a child, and you are being given this appliance. How would you like to use it? And then use it on your patient accordingly. And during the course of treatment, obviously, as was discussed earlier, you should be able to initiate a pterygoid response, after which you start getting the trimming of the appliance to be started. Trimming should be done only in the upper block, more in the uh, distopalatal area. That is, you start going towards the distal most part and trim maximum from the second and the first molar, if the second molar has come. But most of the time, it is the second premolar and the first molar which need to erupt. So at least allow the first molar to erupt. And continue doing this till you are left with only a ledge in the upper block 
for the mandible to be guided forward. And thereafter, make sure you end the uh, functional phase after there is some amount of contact in the molar region. Now, I, I discussed about this, the pterygoid response. It is nothing but the pain that occurs whenever the patient tries to close back. Now, it may or may not be seen in every patient. However, in majority of the patients, an uh, early response of the pterygoid would be seen, uh, early pterygoid response would be seen because of the vascularity. It also tells you sometimes, you know, whether the patient has been cooperative or not. If the patient has been using the appliance very irregularly, you may not uh, get a pterygoid response at all. So you have to be a little careful. The active phase, we have already discussed this, and the retention phase, uh, till the occlusion is settled. In fact, the supporting phase till you get posterior occlusion and then the retention phase till you get maximum intercuspation. Now, I'll show you two cases quickly and then we'll open up for the question-answer session. So, a typical class 2 div 1 patient, a 12-year-old boy with the permanent dentition. Now, such patients, if they are kept for the exam and they ask, what is the ideal line of treatment that you would like to go for? Again, ask those three questions to yourself. What is the severity of the problem? What is the causative? Is it a mandibular deficiency or a combination? So that will tell you whether you should use a functional appliance in the first place. Second is the growth status. Is the patient favorable? And also look at any pre-functional correction you might need to get. So if, if there is a transverse deficiency, and you can incorporate a twin block with expansion screw, might as well go ahead with it. Otherwise, you might have to do it separately. And look at the lower incisor inclination also. So the lower incisor inclination, if it is more, then sometimes what I do is, I uh, and the patient has some deciduous teeth. In fact, I've used uh, the interproximal reduction against the lower ease, that is the second deciduous molars, and used a labial bow to try a removal appliance just to retract the lower incisors and then go on ahead with the functional appliance. Now, this was a more of a standard design, the appliance being fitted. Sometimes, or more often than not, if I use a twin block, I always encourage that you have a south end design so that you don't allow the upper incisors to retract very vigorously. And then continue the appliance usage till you get the necessary pterygoid response. And this is during the supporting phase after the active appliance is over, but you have just a removable appliance with these ball and clasps for retention and an anterior incline to hold on. Most important thing here is not to have a large posterior open bed. I see patients or students making that mistake. End of functional phase, large open bed, posterior open bed. That can predispose to two things. One is uh, the dual bite as we were discussing and secondly some excess strain on the TM joint because you can't have the anterior uh, occlusion and no posterior tooth contact that will be very strenuous on the TM joint and then you can expect a lot of relapse to occur. So this is the end of uh, functional phase for this boy. You can see that there is a projection of the mandible which has improved the lower incisors have been maintained in a decent position. And if you were to compare the uh, overall change, he was not a severe class two. This is, I'm just showing you a standard twin block type of a patient. But I'll show you an extraction case also next. So overall, we were able to hold on to the lower uh, incisors and upper incisors retracted, which is something that is going to happen anyway. So let's talk a little bit about the other modifications also. So as you are aware, if need be, you need to add headgate tubes. Now headgate tubes, you can get preformed or you can make your own. I mean, if I was there, I would have shown how you can make a headgate tube yourself using a round uh, laboratory wire, using a 1.2 mm wire as a support and over which you can coil uh, another 0.7 or a 0.8 mm wire. So the other modifications, these are known. We won't go into the details of these just now uh, because of the shortage of time. But I will show you one case in which we have used the appliance for a high angle correction. Okay. Some other modifications that people have shown, 
one is the lower block with an expansion screw now that is for relieving the crowding and allowing some lower expansion i wouldn't recommend this but in order to get better contact of the posteriors after while the trimming is going on you have one more option this is from one of the articles that i say uh, recently read uh, in which they have done a modification by way of putting a bracket on the upper second pre molar and there is a, a bondable tube on the lower molar and then they are using these elastics for achieving that intercuspation at the end of after doing the trimming in the upper block now this is something that you may uh, wish to do if you want to finish and get a good, good posterior contact at the earlier stage now let me show you two cases one case okay. a mixed dentition case and the other one is a extraction case now this is uh, a simple straightforward case there is nothing spectacular in this but what happens in the mixed dentition patients who are going to go for a twin block phases you will have a challenge with the retention of the lower block the lower member of the twin block needs to be very well uh, seated and as you can see in fact this patient after giving all the necessary uh, appliance components like the ball and clasps etc multiple teeth which are erupting or teeth that have got shed they they pose a special challenge for the seating to occur nevertheless she was a very cooperative patient in whom we could finish but then i was not happy with the crowding and therefore i started the fixed appliance immediately along with an anterior incline so that's not seen here which was cemented from the upper molar to molar it's like the reconator appliance something similar to the reconator just to hold the mandible forward during the course of treatment and this is how she could end i mean after the end of about one year one year uh, three months i suppose this is the overjet that we have obtained and waiting for the upper premolars to erupt molar stops kept there just to prevent the uh, not to allow the molars to migrate mesially and certain teeth yet to come in so the important difference here in the mixed dentition case especially if the patient is skeletally advanced but the dentition is slow that you might need to go to a fixed appliance phase a little early than the typical uh, uh, thing that is mentioned in the book so that's what i follow and this is how the patient is permanent teeth are just erupting the deciduous canine haven't shed yet and we are planning to extract that but look at the change in the face this was how she was to begin with and this is how she is presently so from the bucks bunny appearance to the present appearance okay i'll quickly show one last case of a hyperdivergent facial pattern with increased incisor exposure because you are likely to get yeah, that nice. kind also so based on hierarchy of profit the best suited appliance for a high angle case is functional appliance with increased bite blocks and a headgear all combination of all of these the next would be a functional appliance with a bite block alone no headgear third option intrusion splint with a headgear and finally the headgear to the upper molars only so the best suited would be an appliance like a twin block with a headgear and increased height of the posterior bite blocks which do not need to be trimmed as frequently as you would do for a uh, the regular uh, low face height patients so this is one of the recommendations and you need to follow this for all your high angle patients so typical patient class 2 deficiency deficient mandible bimaxillary protrusion i would put him in the sub type e wherein you have a man maxillo mandibular problem along with a bimaxillary dentoalveolar proclination do you see here upper lower incisor proclination this is of course he had advanced the mandible while taking the step also but otherwise he had a overjet and uh, so the problems were that he was hyperdivergent crowded incisors excess upper incisor exposure so what we decided was use a twin block with hypul headgear considering that his growth status was al already cvm3 then knowing that he would not respond well or he would not show positive vitlo 
obviously would be to extract extract first then treatment and in this case uh, the student was given a tipeds appliance but you can also plan it in a way that you can use a fixed functional appliance also so let's see how this patient went ahead so the patient with the twin block increased vertical bite blocks necessarily in those patients we prevent any kind of a tongue thrusting uh, possibility so you increase the incisor capping both in the upper and the lower to get a oral seal so as, uh, so to say and i'll show you the modification that dr Pat patel uses also which is interesting and then when you finish this you are able to uh, i mean this is when we started off this is with the high pull head care continued the treatment for almost a year with the twin block six months with the head care then extraction tippage and this is how the patient ended a complete set of treatment with the entire uh, range of appliances so functional appliance increased bite block head care extraction fixed appliances and end of treatment so you can see that the occlusal objectives are achieved but at the same time if you notice the bimaxillary protrusion deficiency in partly at least it has got improved i wouldn't say that he has got a solid chin that you would expect for a uh, in as you would see in a class 1 patient but it is decent enough uh, for him to especially from the front view when you look at the overall facial form so it's not causing any lip incompetency as such and this is because he was more of a subtype e in home extractions also had to be done this is the superimposition more to do with matching the whole thing not much of mandibular growth as would be expected in a high angle case and uh, now finally i come to the modification that i was talking about which is uh, published by dr dilip patel in fact he is one of those few indians whose name appears in the clark's uh, twin block uh, the fourth edition of the twin block and uh, i had the fortune of listening to him and he has given me this case to show to all of you as to how he modifies and gives that occlusal indentation in order to make the appliance fit better so i'll show you one case that he has shared also but basically the appliance modification is such that you would have the occlusal indentation as you would receive in a class 1 dentition made in both the upper and the lower blocks so you can see over the incisors what is done here it's not just the incisal capping but actually giving an incisal guidance like the lower incisors it's as if you have put in a rpd a temporized rpd in the given patient the block is cut at 70 degrees as as you would expect and you can see on both the sides the patient with the advanced mandible the only difference is compared to the conventional twin block he uses the c clasp against the lower molar now let me show you one of his cases i will have to go to a different uh, share screen sharing and i'll show this are you able to see my screen now yes sir dr chetan yeah so I'll, i'll quickly run through this case sir dr dilip patel has been very kind enough to share this particular case record and this is what i would like to highlight when when i say that should we or should we not use functional appliances now this particular patient a uh, severe class 2 div1 reduced vertical face height now if he was not treated at all do you think he would end up in a skeletal class 2 or would end up in a skeletal class 1 my question would be that to all those who feel that we can leave the patient untreated and the growth will catch up not necessarily that it would happen so let's see what was done in this particular case so typical class 2 div1 quite severe in fact because the overjet was to the tune of 21 mm it was not like it was 10 12 mm look at the overjet the overjet being very severe holcus class 2 and if you look at some of the values here the anb value and the other values so you will notice that the it was a severe class 2 8 degrees of angle anb 
upper incisors 110 lower incisors imp at 96 luckily not very much proclined so this would come under the subtype c d together because it is a severe case but at the same time not having incisor proclination let's see how it was treated so i won't go into the cephalometric uh, details he had a mixed dentition so erupting premolars on the left side which uh, were, were taken care of later on but look at the severity of the overjet now this is how traumatic the bite was it's very evident from this that it was a very severe overjet and in whom he modified the supplants and he has used the occlusal indentation now he's he's been pioneering this I heard him way back in 2016 and till date he has produced excellent cases with long-term data. He is one of those few uh, Indian clinicians who has long-term data and beautifully maintained records in his private practice itself. So the differences that you see are that there is a labial bow in the upper along with an attachment there and you also have a C-clasp against the lower molar. Now this is how the uplands would look. So this is to show that there is this occlusal indentation which helps in posturing the mandible forward. According to him, this gives a better proprioceptive stimulus for the lower posterior dentition. And this is how the uplands, I showed this picture some time ago. This is how it would look. And uh, expansion screw whenever needed, if you need to expand. This is how the uplands is during the course of treatment. And trimming also goes uh, as per the uh, recommended method. But this is the kind of treatment midway that he could achieve, the mandible being advanced and continuation with the stepwise advancement because this was a severe uh, mandibular deficiency case. I won't go into the CEF values here, but I'll show you later on. So continuation of the uh, appliance for more than a year and then this is at the end of the functional phase. So you can see that there is some amount of posterior contact on both the sides. So this could be a little better uh, to begin with uh, before we go to the fixed up lens phase. But he continues with the supportive and the retentive phase. Now look at the facial change. Look at the dramatic facial change that you are getting. And this is not just in terms of mandibular projection but also the vertical height that has improved. And this is something that was much needed in this particular patient. So this is how he is before the fixed appliances are placed. So this is just a comparison, pre-treatment to post-functional, pre-treatment to post-functional, pre-treatment to post-functional. This actually shows you the mandibular projection much better. So increase in the facial height as well as the projection. And this is how he was. So much of uh, incompetency, deep mentholabial sulcus with the appliance and post uh, functional appliance. And this is therefore uh, from that point went ahead with the fixed appliance phase. This is straightforward because all the spaces had to be closed and went ahead with the treatment, completed the class 2 correction and all the occlusal objectives are achieved. So have a, let's have a look at the completed facial form. So this is how the patient ended post-treatment. Look at the nice upper and lower incisor inclinations perfectly matching and compared to where he was from this type of a mandibular setting. In fact, he has uh, long-term data, but in this particular presentation that he has shared, he has only the uh, values till, I think the photographs till post-treatment. So if you look at the upper and the lower incisor inclination, so the lower incisors did procline some, but the interincisal angle has maintained well, and that is what, what would matter the most for this type of a patient. And in fact, the long-term data that he had shown earlier is also something that is remarkable. So from this point to this point, I thought I should show you this 
with this case as an example of how you can innovate okay. from where you are uh, or or the protocol that we follow till date so i i hope this case makes it clear to you so to all of you just to highlight the kind of extreme facial changes that we can bring about not to say that it will happen in every patient but put the question to yourself that had this patient not been treated at all and you expected the mandibular growth to catch up because you think that the mandible has the potential to grow do you think you could have ended up with this result that's the only question i would pose to you see from where he was pre treatment to where he is right now okay so i'll stop sharing this and go back and complete the presentation that we have, we were on so i'll quickly end up showing you some uh, data of modifications of the twin block so for class 2 div 2 this is an interesting article you can go through the uh, journal of orthodontics 2001 in which they have shown how you can add these torquing uh, spurs as they are used in bar supplants or even in tusher supplants so these springs themselves will have the torquing effect and then you can use or you could use a uh, modified double cantilever spring etc clark has also shown his own method of modifications in a class 2 div 2 i won't go into that but this is something that i would like to highlight whenever you need to reactivate the appliance that is you are planning stepwise activation you can plan different ways so one of the method is as is given, given by carmichael and banks in 2004 journal of orthodontics in which they are using a expansion screw like design in which once you open up the threads of this the appliance gets activated the other method is what is called as jesserix method in which you have an expansion screw with a inclined plane itself a metal incline which when you incorporate into the appliance and you open up the screw what happens is it acts as if the upper uh, block has moved forward thereby pushing the lower part of the twin block further ahead so this is another simple modification that you can do but you will have to purchase these screws which are available uh, i have not seen this in india but that's something that you can look for another modification of the twin block is called as the mini block and this Dr. is Chetan, done by one yes sir your screen is not visible is it okay i'll stop sharing and try it again sir because sometimes yeah i thought i had <laughs> sorry about that just the last Perfect. slide yes i will share it again i think the computer has also got bored of me now talking so much uh yeah this yeah. till now this it's point sir yeah yeah now it's fine so the mini block appliance which was introduced by an indian origin orthodontist by name dr daljit gill they have shown using this torquing spur that is used in the bas appliance so it contains a spring a helical spring which can actually activate against the cervical part of the upper incisors and the the blocks are minimally sized so they call it as the mini block appliance you can go through the article in american journal of orthodontics so these are some of the modifications that you can look for fixed twin blocks are something that people are trying out quite a lot so you have multiple designs so you have design like this wherein you have a tpa supported with the upper block and the lower lingual arch with cemented bands and the lower blocks that are holding the mandible forward i somehow personally did not like the idea though i used it only in a couple of patients uh, i would rather go for a fixed functional appliance so i'm not using that but clark had shown one particular design which could be commercially available he had said uh, which would have the liberty of you using a twin block along with a fixed appliance setup so in this the upper block upper block is anchored directly using a e chain on the upper premolar and the molar uh, bands whereas the lower is anchored on onto the lower arch by way of another e chain so these are some of the modifications that you can look at especially while writing 
uh, an exam paper on the twin block and the recent changes. I'll end with uh, three or two or three important studies that you should know about twin block because I think it's too much of theoretical knowledge today. I can definitely share some of these articles with Dr. Ravi and uh, you can pass it on to the participants since you have your email IDs which have been given for online registration. So one of the earlier studies that you should be able to quote apart from Mills, Macula, Clark and uh, Woodside, etc. For twin blocks especially, if you are to look at, this was one of the first uh, systematic review in 2006, AGODO, uh, authored by Koza and Bessetti. And they compared the herbs and the twin block uplands, and they showed that the twin block was as good as the herbs uplands in terms of getting the skeletal change. So remember this, AGODO 2006. Likewise, there have been multiple studies on short-term and the long-term data with uh, twin block uplands. So one of them, which I take from the European Journal uh, in the mid 2000, I think around 14, 2014, is this particular article, which talks about the overall change that was seen. This is similar to what we have been discussing since morning. So I'm not going to go through this. You can take a screenshot and read it up later on. But this is something you should be able to quote if a question is asked on uh, twin block and the evidence base. The last part that I'm, the last article that I'm going to quote is something from the recent uh, articles. This is from 2020, 2015, sorry, on whether obstructive sleep apnea can be prevented in adults by using appliances such as the twin block. So they have found a lot of change in the airway. You are, I'm sure all of you are aware of some of the uh, airway analysis that has been done. The entire volume of the oropharyngeal airway increases when you use appliances such as a twin block. There is no uh, doubt about that. But whether it can sustain for a long term and prevent these patients becoming adults with OSA is something that needs to be checked. So even in this study, they end up saying that uh, pediatric sleep apnea will be corrected, but they do not have enough long-term data about the uh, adult OSA patients. These patients going to adult stage and whether they will have OSA or not. So these are some of the articles I thought would be very important for all of you to have in uh, with you while you are studying about twin block per se. So I would like to simply summarize by saying that twin block with suitable modifications, of course, is perhaps the appliance of choice for majority of the class two malocclusions. And this, uh, I'm, since I've been using it, and uh, also comparing with fixed functional appliances, whenever you, you need an increase in the facial height, twin block would score much better than any of the fixed functional appliances also. Usage of the appliance for a sufficient duration is very critical and achieving the posterior occlusion, at least molar contact is very, very crucial for a successful outcome. And immediately after the twin block and the retention phase, Make sure you get the occlusal, uh, uh, the six keys to occlusion achieved as close to uh, as possible so that you won't get much of relapse. So on this note, uh, I will have to end here. I know it's gone way beyond what we had planned for, uh, but I would really like to thank Dr. Ravi and his team and Dr. Nandakumar also for having made this particular type of a hands-on course possible. I end by a small quote uh, to all the PGs here. What you can do today is really something that you can improve all your tomorrows. So today's course is something that you've been attending with all the, uh, uh, with, with so much of keenness. I'm very happy to see that. And also the interaction that we could see. However, make sure you don't make it end at this you listen to all the other lectures also carefully use your time to understand about the hands-on the bite registration and i would like to thank the entire team from abishetty uh, institute of dental sciences for uh, inviting me as a speaker also for making this opportunity possible to interact on an online mode and i can assure you when i come for the pg convention we will definitely meet up so thank you so much, Ravi, sir, and uh, 
Dr. Krishna Nayak in his absence, all the team of faculty as well as the postgraduate students, and of course the technical team for having made this possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chetan. That was indeed an extensive lecture. You know, you have been lecturing since 10, 15. Uh, very useful and I'm sure most of our PGs have benefited quite a lot about the functional appliance. Uh, I hope I have not put which, them into a meditative stage. No, the very That's fact they're all here till even, if, even though yeah, it's 2.15, you know, they have not moved out of the hall. So that itself shows that uh, they're, uh, you know, glued onto your lecture. Thank uh, you so much. Sir. It Thanks was to a, all the postgraduates. And I was really happy to see a good amount of interaction, which otherwise doesn't just happen with the online lectures. Yes. Uh, in fact, I'm itching to get back to uh, offline lecturing, but I don't know when that's going to happen. So I wish you, you are here, you know, is an open invitation for you to be here yes, anytime sure. uh, possible. Uh, we will have more interactions. Uh, possibly when you come down for a PG convention, we can have one more lecture. <laughs> I know it is asking I, I, too much. No, no, not yes. me, sir. I, I, I pity all the students who are sitting and being <laughs> forced to listen to me. Yes. So yes. another big round of applause to Dr. Chetan. Thank you. And I would like to wish, wish all the exam going students the very best. I do not know when the exams are. I think for ABCT it's in April and May. April and May. And, yeah. So best wishes. And on behalf of core, can I say one sentence? Sir? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So this you've been seeing this logo of core, isn't it? It's uh, Dr. Ravi did mention a bit about it. It's the Center for Orthodontic Research and Education. We've been uh, conducting activities right from the beginning onset of the pandemic. So we conduct the orthodontic elements for the first and second year PGs, and likewise we conduct what is called as the orthodontic summit for the exam going PGs and it's likely to be in uh, May this time, unfortunately, for you people who will be finishing the exam. But that's a two day, uh, uh, two days or three weekend program in which we'll have about 10 to 11 different uh, speakers on very important topics for all the exam going postgraduates. So if anybody is interested, I would like to welcome you for that. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chetan. So we can offer only uh, online lunch for you. <laughs> That's thank why I said so you much. wish you are here for you know yes. to receive our hospitality. Anyway, uh, the lunch is ready. Uh, any any doubts? Any questions? Anybody wants to ask, sir? Uh, so, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. sir uh, is there any exact periods, exact time we should start trimming with tin blocks, sir? So, actually, we do after six months with the treatment. So, but if we do trimming in two months or four months, can we get the uh, better results, better treatment outcomes? Can we get if we start trimming in two months and four months, sir? Yes. So, uh, there is no hard and fast rule that you should trim only after six months. Uh, it depends on the initial overjet also. So, if the overjet, my uh, basic rule is, if the overjet is anywhere between 8 and 10 millimeters and you are doing a single stage activation, after about four months, it is the fourth recall visit, after four months of treatment, I start initial trimming. So I don't wait for six months and then start off. So I don't see a problem to that as long as the, uh, the guide, upper guide to hold the lower block is intact and it is keeping the mandible forward. So I, I, I think after four months is perfectly okay to start uh, trimming for a average overjet. If you're planning for an incremental advancement, then probably wait for another couple of months. Okay, Hope that you. answers. Yes. Yeah. So that will uh, end this session. We will assemble back here by it's uh, two o'clock now. 2.30 is okay. We'll have fast lunch and uh, Dr. Nanda Kumar is waiting for his turn. You know, we are all eagerly waiting for his lecture too, followed by uh, 
demonstration. So we'll have lunch now. We'll break for lunch. Chetan, excuse sure, us. Sir. Oh, sure, sir. I would like to apologize to Nandu for approaching <laughs> so no much problem. on his time. So uh, I don't see him there in the... Oh, he's there, right there with the mask. No, right no problem, Chetan. As far yes. as uh, the PGs have benefited, it's uh, good, actually. It was really nice, uh, very extensive lecture and very yeah. apt during this time when uh, exams are on. Right, right. Thank you. In thank fact, you, For functional appliances, we usually take a two-day full program, but uh, it's not possible now. And I know. Uh, good luck with your byte registration and the ATR protocols. Yeah. Uh, if, if sir allows for uh, online, then I'll try to join in for it that. It would be nice if you're here too. Yes, yes. yes. It's a long time since we have met also. Yes. True. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Nice yeah. meeting you and best wishes. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Small meeting. Okay. So thank you, sir. Ravi, sir. I'll, uh, thank you. Thank you. Very now. Yeah. We'll okay. see you soon, Chetan. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Bye. Bye.
Yes, good afternoon. So we'll uh, start our second session, post lunch session now. Uh, before that, uh, the feedback link is open. It is given in your YouTube uh, link. Okay, if you go to the YouTube link and go to the description, uh, the feedback link is given there. So you can uh, answer that anytime from now. So please do it uh, before, uh, say, around six o'clock in the evening today itself. Okay, so tomorrow morning onwards, it will be deactivated. So by six in the evening today, please uh, uh, give the feedback and automatically the, uh, your uh, certificate will be mailed to your email ID. All right. So please tell your friends to complete the feedback form before six in the evening today. So now we will have uh, the lecture by Professor Nanda Kumar. He is uh, titled as uh, Geared Orthodontics and he's going to talk on uh, uh, headgear and functional appliance combination. So you all know Professor Nanda Kumar, uh, Professor of Orthodontics in uh, Meenakshi Amal Dental College. Over to you, Dr. Nanda Kumar. I just ask for... Harish, call her mic, please. There. Ah. Yeah. <clears throat> Am I audible? Am I? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I usually start my presentation in this small sloka. All of you must be knowing. As a postgraduate, I, I will definitely tell you that you have to be in depth at your teachers because they have taught you so much, which is going to put you onto a big pedestal, right? And these are my guru and mentors. And so, um, of course, Dr. U.S. Krishnaik, sir, who was my boss, Ravi, sir. Thank you, sir. And Dr. Jairaj, if most of you don't know, as a postgraduate in orthodontics, he used to visit uh, Abhishetty from Coimbatore. And uh, his, his days were only Saturday, Sunday. So imagine we were there on Sunday, full day from morning 8 to evening 4. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Jairaj. And these two are uh, the head of department in, in college where I'm working. And she is also, uh, now he was the past head of department who was working and she is the head of department who is working now. And this man, he taught me about clinical practice and apparently he also used to be an orthodontist who passed out from Government Dental College, Chennai. So I have mixed of everything and uh, thanks to all of them. And this person, I think Sir knows him. He is uh, Dr. Naidu, Munaratam Naidu, a prosthodontist, a very close friend of Sripati Rao Sir. And uh, he, it is only because of him, I'm an academic student. Right, now I have uh, kept this topic as geared orthodontics. I'll be focusing more on headgears. Okay, and headgears is something uh, uh, which has always uh, been uh, very difficult. That's what my postgraduates tell me. How about you people? Is it very difficult to understand and comprehend? Okay. I think that's an universal truth, I suppose. Okay. So um, it has always been uh, very difficult. When I was a postgraduate also, I used to feel it very difficult to comprehend and uh, understand how it works and to which case, uh, which type of uh, 
a headgear you need to give how you need to place your inner bow how you need to place your outer bow and what should be the angulation what are your results and if you go through literature i think most of you would find that a very few articles have been published okay whether it could be different types of bows or meta analysis or long term studies so very very few articles are published so i somehow started developing interest in uh, headgears and we do a lot of uh, uh, headgears and headgears with my functionals in my department and now i have structured this particular uh, uh, topic in such a way that if if you get a 3 hour essay on headgears and orthodontics right if you get a 3 hour essay on headgears and orthodontics uh, and this would be the manner in which you might have to uh, pen it down in your answer sheets okay with supporting articles and a few studies we have done in my department uh, so that i have just put into that so that it will also help you to understand why we are cho- cho- why we are using uh, those type of uh, uh, attachments in headgears okay right so uh, <clears throat> for anything you need history and evolution so it is almost around 100 years back and thanks to kingsley who first uh, reported to use of occipital anchorage uh, uh, during treatment i think you must have seen these two pictures in profit as well right so now uh, it was in uh, 1866 66 and in 1870s the first uh, headgears was uh, uh, they started to think about and start to use about headgears In 1880, Goddard had described the making of a vulcanite casing by molding black rubber against anterior teeth, which was attached to head caps for dress hooks with rubbers and elastics. In uh, 1888, Angle described this extraoral attachment. The use of this appliance was limited to maxillary dental protrusion in patient following upper first, pre- first bicuspid extractions. In 1898, Gulford talked about the direction of pull. by activating rubber bands on the skull caps above or below the ear <clears throat> in 1907 angle referred to extra oral anchorage and illustrated as occipital headgear and traction bar in 1921 k started using extra oral therapy and he described it as sliding buckles or j hooks uh, for patients comfort which had two different applications for maxillary retraction and anterior open bite cases and for distal movement of upper molars okay 1930s controversies prevailed uh, if angle uh, angles baker's anchorage would really try to restrain maxilla and bring about mandibular growth 1936 o- opperham reviewed the idea of headgears and would serve as a vulnerable luction urgent to treatment after his exper- experimental treatment approach to an actress who rejected vis- uh, visible appliances 1940 there was Uh, supplementary was introduced and a lot of thinking went on using headgears 1950 colon which we generally now use uh, devised cervical traction where he removed the top half of the head cap to make it more acceptable to the patient 1953 fisher william and downs achieved great success by combining face bow and dental bow that is the inner bow of 0.45 inch to molars tubes occlusally and still we use the same thing around 1957 rickers was su- surprised to achieve great results using high pull or they called it as canine head gears or j hooks 1959 paulton designed the geometric center where we now use it as maxillary serrus okay or center of resistance just been the between between the roots of upper bicuspids and also studied the line of force of of for optical head gears occipital head gears i'm sorry era of headgear combined with fixed appliances just opened up broad thinking and then in 1966 wells uh, lander used colon's headgears with neck strap around 300 to 400 grams of force and showed remarkable skeletal changes in 67 crevera modified face bow for class 2 division 1 in 70 shudi paulton and tweed gave us an insight on rotations of mandible during the treatment using headgears 70 this is a very landmark article by alex jacobson explaining the biomechanics of uh, headgears it's called as understand extra oral forces ajo 1976 i think all of you must read that article in 1978 to show for the first time combined headgear with my functional appliance and achieved amazing results 1980s the golden era for my functional appliance because lot of work was done combining headgear with my functional appliance 
which gave good results in growing patients. From 1990s to till date, Headgear Myofunctional Appliance is able to stand the testimony of time thanks to Clark, where he used his Concord Facebook along with uh, his headgear and he has published article like Dr. Chetan there as well, a long-term article and thereon started, people started using headgears along with my functional appliances. Now, you know what headgear is? Uh, it's an extra oral traction. In undergraduate, we must have learned that anchorage means extra oral anchorage. We see say headgears. But here, as postgraduates, we should know that any anything you need to redirect the growth of maxilla or redirect the growth of mandible, which is a resultant of a redirection of the maxilla, we use headgears. Okay. So, definition is a device by which external forces are applied to the first molar via face bow and strap, usually anchoring the head, neck, or chin. Now, how do you classify? According to the means using face bow, which slots into tube shoulders to bridge of removable appliance or fixed appliance. So, you have either an inner bow or, or a, and an outer bow. Now, J hooks, J hooks we don't use nowadays, but initially it was used. Now, we use burst on intrusion hard drives. We use bypass arches. All those things came, came after J-hooks are used. How do you use a bypass arch? You start from a molar, you buy, bypass your premolars, come to your canine and continue. Now, J-hook, the same thing was done, but only at the level of the canines, two hooks were given and it was attached to your headgear so that you get intrusion and retraction of your anteriors. For everything, there should be a starting. And this is the starting for all your bypass and your bypass arches, continuous bypass arches. Okay. Force elements, you have an elastic strap, you have elastic bands and uh, spring-loaded straps. I don't know how many of you must have seen these elastic bands. When we were postgraduates, we never had those straps. So we used to give extra oral elastics from the outer bow. We used to make a small hook here and give it to them, depending upon the diameters. <clears throat> Direction of pull, cervical, straight, high pull, which is occipital, reverse pull or face mark, combination headgears or uh, different modifications and chin cup, it could be either occipital and vertical. Now, purpose. So, you can either protract the uh, protraction or reverse pull, retraction of high pull, straight pull, cervical pull and combination pull to what control the vertical, chin cup, space regaining, molar distalization. Either you can do bilateral molar distalization or you can do individual one side molar distalization or intrusion of your maxilla. Now, types you have plenty high, medium, low, combi, high pull headgear with J hooks, medium pull with headgear with J hooks, low pull and reverse pull headgear or face mark. Components you either have the force delivering unit, which we generally call it as uh, face bow or J hooks, force generating springs or elastic bands. Anchor unit can be neck, head, and chin. Right now, face bow. Uh, uh, you have the face bow has an inner and outer bow. Inner bow is available in uh, 0 0.045 inch or 0. Uh, 0.5 inch. We generally get it as 0.5 inch now. It can be outer bow is usually in uh, 0 0.072 inch and available in special shot, short, medium, and long. Okay, uh, we don't get special shot unless you ask for it. Or what we generally do is we buy a shot and then cut it and make it a special shot. In case I'll tell you when to use that one. Okay. Right. Now headgear tubes. So initially when uh, initially the headgear tubes are placed occlusally and because uh, of your insertion and taking it out by the patient, they started making it. Uh, uh, sorry, it used to be gingivally, but now they're making it uh, uh, occlusally so that your insertion and taking out uh, is easier. So generally it is uh, round in cross section and over, five, over 4 or 5 inch and uh, 0 5 1 inch you get uh, two, uh, two uh, diameters of your tubes. So in a bow you can either, you can either get a U loop, you can either get a bayonet, either you can get an inward bayonet or an outward bayonet. You can have friction stops, you can have stop screws or uh, uh, Hamel safety bows. So all these modifications are there. Force generating unit, it is designed to give at least 2 to 3 kilograms of pressure or probably around two, 227 grams or 8 ounces of force. And again, now the recent one is you get either medium force, mild force or heavy force. 
So the straps are designated to give you medium force, they're designated to give you mild force, and designated to give you heavy force, and all the straps now are with safety hold. So now decision making of headgear selection. Now, how do you think that you need to select a headgear? You need to know about growth assessment. Then you need to know about the growth trends. Then uh, you need to do some extra oral, intra oral examinations. And then you need to have a composite uh, supplementary evaluation. And after that, you should stick on to go on to your specific designing of your headgear. Right. So uh, we know that growth is an inherent potential. You cannot stop it. You can redirect it. For example, like Dr. Chetan, J. J. Was, Chetan was telling that in case you're going to get your uh, mandible forward, you have no, you cannot stop your lower incisor to procline or your mandible to rotate downward, backward. So the best case for any propulsion would be a deficient mandible with an upright lower incisors. Okay. And an upward forward or rotated mandible. Right. So don't think that I'm given a headgear, your maxilla will stand like this, nothing will happen to the mandible, no. It's only a reactionary force, like how Newton has said, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, right? If you have to stop one, the other one will take over. How many times you have seen cases in a mandible, your body is less, but your ramal length is more, right? Generally, in a low angle case, where it is hypodivergent, where you have a mandible is rotating upward forward, what will happen is you can find the body length will be very less, the lower ganon will have closed in much more. And to compensate to all these things, your ramal length will increase and the width also will increase. Today, go and see your supplement. Chef, chef uh, you can find out. This combination is very weird and it's very difficult to treat. So maxillary growth, you know, uh, that, that's what been taught to me. It grows like a plane landing with no strip down and it grows down like this. So you should understand how it grows so that if you need to restrain it, you know where to do, how you have to restrain it. First of all, you should be able to assess in which in which stage it is in and how it is trying to grow. And then you need to decide how you need to restrain it. And uh, mandibular growth, expanding V principle. So even that you should know. So that uh, we know that transverse, right? Then uh, sagittal and vertical. So that's very, very important. Keep that in mind always. Growth assessment. Uh, I think a lot have spoken by Dr. Chetan. You have your CVMI, then you have your frontal sinus, uh, then you have your uh, <clears throat> lower molar, then you have your uh, <clears throat> canine uh, eruption, and there's a recent article which talks about your maxillary palatal suture. So that also can be used as an uh, 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 indicator for your growth assessment. These are some, uh, if you want to take a picture of this take, these are some... Uh, a uh, thing from Nanda that uh, the changes, transverse change for a female and a male, anteroposterior change for a female and a male, and a vertical change for a female and a male. So you should have these numbers in mind before you think that, yes, I'm going to either control my anteroposterior, I'm going to control my vertical, and I'm going to control as well as exp expand my maxillary arch. So you give it probably after 19 years headgear and say it will not work on the maxilla but will be acting only as an anchor unit. Understand? And same way, soft tissue chin maturation. Okay. Uh, nowadays, we don't use chin cups. Okay. But uh, to know that how much of change you get and between 12 and 17 years for males and females, because every time you try to give a cervical pull headgear and try to get your molar down, you get a downward backward rotation of mandible. You do that and find that the chin is growing more. It look like a vertical class two with a chin pointing out like this. Understand? So you should be very careful in uh, uh, knowing this too. So growth trends. So Tweets has given excellent growth trend, type A, type B, and type C. Generally, we call it as a class one growth trend, class two growth trend, and a class three growth trend. So you should know how the growth is taking over. And depending on that, you'll have to decide on your headgears. Right. So I mean, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Chetan has spoken about uh, Moyer et al.'s uh, classification of horizontal and vertical type. I'll just run through. You want to, can I just run through? Yes. So this is type A where maxillary dental uh, protraction is there. Okay. This is this side. This, this is uh, uh, what it is normal. And this is the variant, right? So 
so you have a maxillary dental protraction. In type B, you have mid face uh, uh, prognathism. In uh, type C, you have maxillary and mandibular retrognathism with bi dental with uh, a proclination, right? So type D, you have maxillary retrognathism, mandibular retrognathism, and maxillary dental uh, protraction, right? Type E, maxillary prognathism and dental protraction plus dental proclivancy. Then you have mandibular retrognathism. This is the case he told it is very good for any functional appliance. You have a retrognathic mandible with lower upright incisors and vertical type. So vertical type, vertical generally type, he classifies it uh, depending upon three planes, maxillary, mandibular, and your uh, um, occlusal plane, right? So this is, uh, which is type one, which is a high angle where you can find that there is a, a downward rotation of all the three planes. It can be a palatal plane, it can be a occlusal plane, and it can be a mandibular plane. Okay, and this is a type two, which we call it a squarish pose. It's just the opposite of type one, where everything rotates upwards. Huh? So you have a deep bite, 100% uh, uh, deep bite, right? And this is type three, where you have, is we call it as a divergent growth. That is, you find the maxilla going like this, mandible going like this. We call this as a divergent growth. So type one, we call it as downward backward growth. Type two, we call it as upward growth. Type three, we call it as a divergent growth, right? And type four, it is, it is all the three going down plus a descent of your maxilla. Okay, all the three going down plus a descent of your maxilla. When we do MIS, maxillary intrusion splint, VME, vertical maxillary excess is there. Even identify. So what happens? You try to hold, try to intrude your maxilla. So those those cases uh, will be uh, uh, coming coming under type four. Now, the reason why I'm telling you, because every time when you try to use a headgear, uh, we say that I'm, I'm going to rotate my maxilla. I'm going to push my maxilla. I'm going to distalize my maxilla, but you should know when are we supposed to do that, right? Unless we don't, unless we know this, we cannot apply it. Now, the question is how much of uh, uh, intrusion of maxilla I need depends upon how much of maxillary downward rotation has happened, taking place. How much of uh, rotation of maxilla are going to take depends on how much of maxilla is tipped upwards. Okay, that's why I tell cephalometric analysis is very, very important because it can quantify how much you need to do. So that quantification will tell you how much of outer bow we can, um, uh, we can probably try to uh, adjust and how much of force is necessary to get a proper outcome, right? Okay, now you have a deep bite. Um, it, it, it is purely because that your alveolus along with the dentition moves up and your alveolus along with the up maxillary dentition comes down. Okay. Uh, this, 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 if you see in this case, you can see the alveolar height has increased more in the mandible. So it is just moved up like this. There is no change in your planes, but only there's a compensation only in your dentition and your alveolus. Right. Okay, composite analysis. Uh, I generally go by um, SNA, SNB, SND. SND will tell you my chin position at space, right? And uh, I'm, I, I, I like Biog's uh, analysis, like the upper gonial, lower gonial, saddle, uh, because that will tell me how my condyle is in relation to the glenoid fossa, how is my upper gonial, how is my lower gonial, whether I have an inter or intramatrix rotation, whether I have a type 1, type 2, type 3 rotation of the mandible so that I can plan uh, where I need to give my outer bow and where I need to keep my inner bow to, depending upon whether I have an inter or intramatrix rotation or type one, type two, type three, right? Whether it's the whether rotation at the, at the incisor or at the premolar or total at your condylar level, right? <clears throat> so all of us know by theoretical, it's the center of resistance of maxilla in the posterior superior aspect of this agomatic or temporal suture. Okay, and uh, um, Prophet has said that if you're going to uh, draw a line uh, between the premolars and go to the most sulcus step, that will that is the point which could be related to your center of resistance of the maxilla. But we hunt, we we it's very difficult to find out the center of resistance of maxilla. So we generally take this as the standard goal point to see to that. And that is why in recent articles, when I told you that Alex Jacobson's uh, understanding extra oral forces, he said, please don't tell that point, tell this point is related to this as center of resistance, call it as line of force, LOF. He says, that's the line of force. So two things you should understand. Either you can direct 
the force directly to the center of resistance or you can get the resultant to pass to the center of resistance. What do I mean by resultant? Like Marquardt has told the parallelogram theory, right? If you have two forces and you try to derive, it's, it comes under vector physics. The resultant force is always at right angle to the primary force, right? So you can either get the resultant to pass to the center of resistance. Oh, now, what is your guide? Your guide is your line of force. So that we 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 can say 95% or 98% of the time, the line of force and center of resistance would probably match. <coughs> So we need to have three things in mind, magnitude, direction, and point of force application. So these three things are very, very important so that uh, we can try to uh, see to that whatever whatever you've decided to do, it should, you will have to uh, try to manage with your magnitude, direction of force, and point of force application. Now, uh, so how, how can, uh, in a headgear, the two things, two things are, three things are very important. I mean, four things are very important. One, your outer bow, two, your inner bow, three, whether you're using a bonded appliance or four, whether you're using a banded appliance. Now, let us talk about bonded and banded appliance. What do I mean by bonded appliance? Uh, uh, like, like you make a splint, like an, a maxillary intrusion splint, you uh, cement it onto your maxilla and then you use your flying extra oral tubes and then you put your head gear, right? When you say that I am want to restrain my maxilla, I want to tip my maxilla up. I want to hold my maxilla, not allowing it to come forward. All these things can be done only with the bonded appliance. You cannot do with the banded appliance. Now, why I say you cannot do it with the banded appliance is what do you do? You strap up the entire arch, okay? You go from a semi-rigid archway and you go to a rigid archway. Right? After you go to a rigid archway, you try to put the inner bow into your headgear tubes. Right. How much of a force or how much of a decomposition you do, the primary force is only going to go to your molar. So either the molar is going to move distally or rotate downward. That is your uh, missile cusp will come down, a distal cusp will go up or your distal cusp will come down, a missile cusp will go up. So this will only try to give a change in your mandible, not the maxilla. So if you have to really say that I'm going to try to control my maxilla, then a bonded appliance is only possible. Okay, take that off from a hat that I'm going to ban, I'm going to put a 21, 25 rigid dodge. I try to put my face boy in and try to give. No, you cannot. You cannot do it. You cannot ever do it. You want distalization, you want anchorage, you want extrusion of your molars, you want uh, individual distalization or bilateral distalization only. Then you can do a bonded appliance. Understand? And what are your possibilities you can do with your outer and inner book? So in your inner bow, as I told you, your inner bow is, is constant. You cannot change your inner bow. What you can do, you can either give a bayonet bend, okay? Or you can put a stop with a spring, try to displace one end, okay? Or you can put a, a buckle tube can be placed vertically and you can do a bend and put it in so that you get an intrusion of your molar, okay? Or you can get a bayonet bend. Either you can give a toe-in bayonet bend or a toe-out bayonet bend, depending on whether you want the intrusion or a mild rotation of your molar. These are the only changes you can do in an inner bow. Now, what you can do in your outer bow, <clears throat> as I told you, outer bow can be changed into either an angulation and length. Okay? Either an angulation or length. Now, the combination is uh, how much angulation do, am I going to give and how, what should be my length of your outer bow. So, that combination is very important. You have to decide. And that decision making is very important for different types of cases. Okay, now suppose I say my center of resistance is here and I'm going to increase my outer bow. Okay, yes, my outer bow is very close to the center of resistance, but where is the point of force application this here? Understand, away from the center of resistance. But if I, if I want to restrain my maxilla, okay, and not allow the maxilla to grow at all, then I have to shorten my outer bow, see to that it points my line of force or center of resistance of maxilla with uh, angulation, then I'll say that, yes, I'm able to restrain my maxilla. That is an example of what I'm telling you. Only two things you can do with your outer bow. Either you can angulate it or shorten it. That's why you have special short, short, medium, and long. Okay? So depending on that, you can do. Yeah, now, a lot of articles to find out a line of force. This is one article uh, by uh, Gisela et al. in JCO 1982. He used a... Uh, um, he, what did he do is he took the in, uh, center of the eye, 
draw, draw he drew a line then your uh, junction of your uh, upper and lower lip he drew a line then outer canthus that is outside outer canthus he drew a line and he keeping a uh, hand finger inside near the premolar he just made a point here and said okay this is what is your line of force so we said no between two premolars he draw a line just kept a finger inside and whichever comes here he just put a dot and hopefully it should be the center of your center line and he said that should be the line of force and uh, this is uh, supposed to be a stanley brown's article which most of the postgraduates uh, follow he used to take a plunger amalgam plunger inside keep it and you have to swivel it around wherever the plunger gives a small elevation he used to mark a point and keep it here but i follow in my clinic is this one this is very very simple all of us to have a divider all of us have a earbud cut it put it inside the divider go you have two arms of a divider put one in between your premolar hit your uh, uh, sulcus depth and close this out here and these two are will be the same mark a point you get your line of force easy so we need not have extra radiograph put a plunger inside draw lines and all these things so i wanted to know whether this is going to, this is uh, is right so i put a metal ball at the point of uh, where i marked and it, i took an x ray and it was bang on target where it was in the center of resistance of your maxilla it's very very simple you need not have any arm empyrean we already have a divider as an as an orthodontist we have a instrument box with us all we need to have is a earbud i think every clinic will have a earbud to use your lignocaine gel prior to injections so it's very simple technique you can follow it and okay right now i know my line of force but i need to know whether both my both my outer bows are in a same plane suppose i keep one outer bow higher and one outer bow lower then i get a canting of my occlusal plane right i should know how it is so best way is put it in direct your dental light and go behind stand before the patient and check your shadow your shadow should be at the same level on both the sides so once you see that the shadow is in the same level then you know both your arms are fine if you find any difference try to adjust it do the repeat the same thing again till you get both your planes together this is something which you can do in your day to day practice in your clinic itself it's very easy <clears throat> right now the next challenge is in case i use a bonded appliance not a banded appliance bonded appliance okay for as how many of you must have kept your uh, extra oral flying tubes and made an mis and found that one is higher and one is lower raise your hands i have done it many times with a problem so whenever i make an appliance keep your extra oral tubes out i find that one will be higher and one will be lower again that again will give you a canting so what i do is i generally draw a line here on the occlusal okay mark it to both the cusps transfer the line here right place the extra oral tubes with wax take take straight length wires you have it in our department straight length wires just put it in it should come and join in the center in the midline okay in the center and keep one one uh, one more wire in the center here right and if you don't get that if you get this plane off try to correct it see the both of them join and see to that it's in the center line how do you draw the center line from the pa from here to this rugae to the palatine fovea here you draw a line okay and see whether all the three are in are coordinating at the same point then you know your extra oral tubes on both the sides are equal they are not off okay then you start processing it and then you can use it <clears throat> so now next you come is your outcome determination of headgear selection this uh, de decision and type of headgear inner bow modification and outer bow modification so i told you inner bow modification outer bow modification inner bow not much of modifications can be done only with bends your outer bow I, either you can keep it above center of resistance on the center of resistance or below the center of resistance right either you can use special short short medium okay or long so depending on that so you already you already have your line of force here you now have to decide whether i'm going to get above it or on it or below it that's why i told you yes angulation now selection of headgear depending on the case whether you are going to say high cervical or uh, combination headgear or reverse pull age so profit says 8 years ideal time okay uh, where you need to uh, try new headgears and uh, uh, done between 8 to 9 years in, sorry 8 to 9 years in girls and 9 to 11 years in boys impa less than 25 suitable for cervical pull headgear 
So between 25 and 30, combination headgear is used, more than 30, a high pull headgear is used. More than 30 means what, do you, what means? That means you have a rotated a hyper, hyper divergent case. So you can use a high pull headgear. So depending, this is this, you can take a screenshot of this if you want to. This is depending on how you can maintain your occlusal plane, right? So whether you need to uh, cant your occlusal plane, steepen your occlusal plane, and open up your occlusal plane, or uh, you want a distal movement, or one side distal movement and one side normal movement, depending on that, these are the types of headgears, or you can have a combination of everything. And uh, this is, uh, I don't know how many of you know this book, it's called uh, Biomechanical of Headgears by Nikolai. And uh, this book, uh, th this is an excellent book, but the only problem is we being medical graduates, most of the most of the theory there is only on uh, trigonometry. So it is, you should have a liking for geometry and trigonometry to read this. But this particular picture I took because it tells you that you can how you can get a growth 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 uh, restriction and rotational. So he says that he has made it into three triangles A, B, and C. First triangle is growth restriction. Second B and C are rotational uh, triangles. He says that the vectoral sum of forces, if it is going to be above the center of resistance of maxilla, you get growth restriction. Okay, if you're going to go slightly above the cent above the uh, center of maxilla or onto the center of maxilla you get growth restriction. But if you're going to go below, as I told you, you get rotational component, right? Rotational of the maxillary effect. So you can get a rotational component of maxillary effect. Okay, so I told you, you have a divergent growth at some sometimes. So what you need to do, maxilla will be in this direction. You want to get this, then you'll have to go, you have to go beneath the center of resistance so that you get a rotational growth of your maxilla. Now, if you go above the center of resistance of molar, rotation of the maxilla and intrusion of upper molar comes. Okay, if you go, now we are talking about the center of resistance of upper molar. Then generally center of resistance of upper molar is between the bifurcation and trifurcation of roots, right? So if you're going to go above that, you get rotation of maxilla in a bonded appliance. Okay, not, no, not no, sorry, in a banded appliance, not a bonded appliance. Then if you go below the center of, uh, center of rotation of upper molar, rotational effect of maxilla and extrusion of upper molar will get like a cervical pull head gear. You have a very low angle case, where you have upward rotated maxilla, then you try to get your molar down so the mandible rotates downward, backward. So now we'll talk about cervical pull headgear, as I told you. So if you're going to go <coughs> above and give a force, you're going to get a distalizing force, which is going to be distalizing and downward in your molar. But if you're going to be slightly short and before the center, like what I told you, what I spoke in the last slide, I'm just showing pictorial here, right? If it's going to be a little shorter than the center of resistance, then you get a clockwise rotation. Or if it's going to be higher, then you get an anti-clockwise rotation of your molar. Right, now this is this is the angulation of your bone. Now we'll talk about uh, different angulations. Like if you're going to bring down to uh, outer bow bent upwards, if the outer bow is bent upwards, what happens? Right, if you're going to bend your outer bow upwards, then what happens in a cervical pull head gear? Right, so you bring down, bring down the occlusal plane, increase the mandibular plane angle, increase your mandibular plane angle, you worsen your class two relationship. This is uh, good for patients with a forward growth rotation, that is vertical maxillary deficiency, not vertical maxillary excess deficiency. You can use this one. Now, outer board bend downwards, you get steepening of the occlusal plane, okay, and a little bit of uh, distalization, and for patients with less incisal show. When outer bow is at the level of the center of resistance, no movement is produced, you get net distalization. I have got a PDF format, if anybody wants, I can share it with you, you can, I can give it to Ravi sir, all of you can take it, right? Now, now, we need to know about different lengths, no? Different lengths of the bow, right? You know, we have are, we are now only known about the angulation. Now, you should know about the length. Now, outer bow is shorter than the inner bow. The force applied to the center of resistance, steepening of the occlusal plane occurs. If the outer bow is longer than the inner bow, then there is a tendency to flatten the occlusal plane. And, uh, sorry, okay. So, only two, you have a shorter outer bow and a longer outer bow. One, you get steepening of the occlusal plane or flattening, other will get a flattening of the occlusal plane. Right, now I hope this works.
this is just an animation regarding a cervical pillar here. So you have an upward forward, uh, forward mandible, VMD, vertical maxillary deficiency. Okay. So you're using a cervical pillar. And it comes down. Okay. It's, it looks very simple, but it's not as easy when you do it. You don't get it that easily. Okay. So this is the change you get, but it's it's an excellent uh, uh, cervical pull uh, is very good in cases when you have uh, um, class two division two, right? You would generally say posterior retro position of mandible. It's not a retrognathic mandible. It's a retro position of mandible. But if you have an adult class two, right? Class two division two, and if the mandible is already retro position because the patient is being kept on using it, and the mandible is pushed more back. And then if the patient comes to us in adult class two division two, if you try to procline it thinking the mandible will come forward, it won't come forward because it's an adult class two division two. So at that time, only nighttime wear of cervical pillar gear will try to extrude your molar and rotate the mandible downward backward. You understand? So that, that in such cases, it will be nice. Not in cases where you have a growing uh, child where you have an class two division two, that is, you just need to take off the lock and the mandible will automatically come forward. Okay. So now high pull headgear. Now this high pull headgear. <coughs> so uh, generally high pull headgear, what, what we saw, it's given in cases when you have, when you have a hyper divergent, that is your mandible is rotated downward backward, right? So you need to hold your maxilla up so that you get some amount of upward forward rotation of the mandible or try to intrude your posteriors. So the mandible will try to come upward forward. So if you're going to come, if you're going to keep it uh, uh, in front of your uh, center of resistance of your uh, molar, you get a translatory effect that is mostly a distalization effect, which is like this in this direction. So you go posteriorly, but it'll go up. Okay. And if you're going to go beyond the center of resistance of your uh, uh, upper molar, then you get a clockwise rotation, which is which rotates and goes back. Okay, so when it rotates, you have your mesial cusp coming down and a distal cusp going up. Okay, and if it's going to be uh, much ahead with an angulation, okay, much ahead with an angulation, then you're going to get anti-clockwise rotation of the maxilla, which is just the opposite of the upper, where you get the posterior cusp coming down uh, and a mesial cusp going up. going above the head no right okay let me let, 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 let us be very simple now imagine you have a bucket okay and it's in front of you right you know a bucket right that in front of you you have a handle okay and you have some water in it understand now i'm standing in front of the bucket and if i have to lift the bucket okay and it, the bucket has to come up like this where will i hold you hold in the center of the handle. You stand like this, you lift it. Okay. Imagine if this, this handle is slightly anterior, not in the center, it's slightly anterior. If I lift it, what will happen? Which one will come? Which one will go away from you and which one will come to you? Okay, forget about the handle. Suppose I hold the outer rim. That is the rim which is outside, away from you. The rim which is away from you. I hold it and I lift it. Where will the base go? Will go away from you or come back to you? Okay. Now, if I take the rim, which is closer to you. Okay. If I lift it, what will happen? It is the opposite of the other. Now, try the same bucket here and try to you see. If you're going to use a cervical pull or a center pull or a pull from the higher. It's going to be the same thing that's going to happen. Either you're going to use a bonded appliance or a banded appliance. Now you are able to figure out something. It's slightly clear, easy, right? Imagine you have a bucket in front of you. You want the bucket to you want the bucket to be lifted up. So you use both the hands at the rim and lift it up. It moves up, right? Now the same thing. If I want if I want the maxilla to rotate in the opposite direction, I use both my hands in the center of the rim and lift it up. What happens? The, the base comes out and this opening comes towards me. If I want the opposite side, I take both the hands, hold it here, and put it up. The same thing, try to keep it here. 
if I want, so let's say we had a divergent growth, right? If I have a divergent growth, your mandible is down, your maxilla is tipped up, or JN is up, PN is down. ANS is up, PNS is down. So what do I need to do? I need to get my PNS, ANS down and PNS up. Okay. So if I need to rotate my maxilla in this direction, clockwise, then where will I give my uh, thing? I need to give something below the center of resistance so that when I pull, it will rotate. Correct. Suppose I, I have a maxilla which is growing more. Mandible is not catching up with the maxilla, right? And I have to hold my maxilla and advance my mandible where you have a combination of act with my function with the headgear, like what Dr. Ch J Chetan told. Okay, then what I need to do, I need to give a force which is in line of my center of resistance, so that I hold it tight, like how I'm lifting a bucket from the center. You understand? Suppose I have, like, my mandible is rotating upward forward, I want it to go down, then I have to give a force down, like what I'm going to do like this, from the, from the rear end. So, the mandible rotate downward, backward. It's as simple as that. There's nothing very difficult to understand. It's only that you need to close your eyes and try to imagine a bit. Okay, the reason why books cannot make it, uh, cannot do this is because they talk about center of resistance, they talk about center of rotation, they talk about line of force, then they say outer bow should be shorter, it should be angled at 45 degrees, it should be shorter, all these things. Just keep this concept and try to understand, you will, not, you will never forget it. And two things you should always keep in mind. You use it either with a splint, which we call it as bonded, if you're going to control your maxilla per se fully, or if I want something to do with my molar, which will give a secondary effect on the mandible. You understand, right? Either I want to dislice, I want to, uh, the, to rotate the molar a little bit, or I want to extrude my molar a little bit or hold the molar as an anchorage. Then you have to use the inner bow in your headgear tube, which is banded to the molar. Okay. You can never say, I put this and restrain the maxilla. No, not possible. Okay, now clear with this, parietal pull, right. Now high pull with short outer bow. Now imagine I have, I'm going to use a high pull where the force, where, where I'm going to hold your maxilla, I'm going to give a very short outer bow. My line of force is here, my outer bow is only here. Okay, so what happens is I get the force passing through the center of resistance. I get the force passing through the center of resistance because my line of force is here and my outer bow is here. So I get the first passing through the center of resistance. So I can just hold my maxilla, not allowing it to grow in any direction anterior posteriorly. Right. But now imagine if my line of force is here and my, uh, and, and my outer bow is longer. Okay. But I'm not going to pass through the center of resistance. It's going to be beyond my center of resistance. But I have to design in such a way that at least my resultant would pass through the center of resistance. So what I will do, I give an angulation down or up so that it will pass through the center of resistance. Okay, so that is how we need to decide. So, so a high pull with shorter outer bow create displaced an intrusive component which is used in vertical maxillary excess. You want intrusion? No. So now how you get intrusion? If I pass through the center of resistance, I will get the maxilla to be held like this tight. But I need intrusion. What I do? I can use a shorter outer bow. Instead of giving 25 degree angulation, I can give a 45 degree angulation. So what happens? I'll hold the maxilla like this. So when I hold my maxilla like this, I will get slight intrusion as well as very mild distillation. My intrusive component will be greater than the distillation component. Whereas in vertical maxillary excess, I want an intrusive component should be more. You understand? If I, if I keep it on the line of force, my distillation component only will be greater. My intrusion component will be negligible. But I want an intrusive component which is more, so I keep it slightly higher. With longer outer bow. So intrusive and distillation force of this system might be in vertical class two open bite patients. Okay, because I can tip my maxilla downwards as well in open bite cases. Understand? Go back, go back. See that angulation here. Can you see this angulation between the outer and inner bow? 
So if this angulation is going to be more and more, if the angulation, now this is your occlusal plane and this is my, this is your inner bow and this is my outer, outer bow. If my angulation is going to be more and more, what will happen? I get more intrusion and distillation. If my angulation is lesser, I get only distillation. Intrusion is not possible. But imagine if I'm going to keep it more shorter. If I'm going to maintain the same angulation, to a 35 or 45 degree, and I make it going to make it more shorter, what happens? My force is going to pass through the center of position. I get better intrusion and better distillation. But I'm going to keep it more longer, then my, my force is going to be here, right? So I'll be only lifting it but to a certain extent, not fully, either it will go up like this or go down like this. It lift and go down like that. That is why having a longer outer bow away from a center of resistance is good for open bite patients where you can just swell your maxilla down and close your open bite. You understand? So you get like this when it's slightly longer. So you either have a straight pull or a combination pull. So now uh, you can you can either have a pull from here or you can pull from your occiput or you have a combination of occiput and your so, uh, or your cervical pull. So when I'm going to use an occipital or cervical pull, high pull head gear uh, and cervical pull, uh, <clears throat> you can change your line of force a little bit. Main advantage is pure posterior translation. So now we know um, parallelogram theory, you have two forces, one force here, one force here, and you get a resultant from here. Where is it? It's along your occlusal plane. So when it's along your occlusal plane, you're going to get only pure translation of your uh, maxilla, right? So class two with no vertical power, anterior migration of maxillary treat, translate them posteriorly, buckle force to molar, which you get expansion of your inner bow. Now, this is what a combination headgear will do. You get pure, tra pure translation. You get a clockwise rotation when this, which is away. And which is longer with an angulation, you get an anti-clockwise rotation. Look at the resultant force. It is exactly bisecting your cervical and your high pull, right? So that 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 will become your force direction. Now vertical pull. If the vertical line of force is through the center of resistance, pure intrusion may take place. If the outer bow is placed anteriorly, the force produced will be flattening the plane. If the outer bow is placed posteriorly, the moment will be clockwise and intrusive. So unilateral fo face force. It's an article in AJODO, 1981 March. You can have four types, which can be power arm face bow, soldered offsetted face bow, or a civil offsetted face bow, or spring attached face bow. I told you, you know, spring attached face bow can be used if you want unilateral distillation. Okay. Right. Now, power arm, uh, power arm type, outer, uh, one outer bow is longer or wider than the other. Longer or wider bow tip is located on the side anticipate producing the greater distal, distalizing force, effective in producing unilateral distal, distal forces, also generate lateral forces. So this is taken from that uh, understanding extraoral forces by Alex Jacobson. Please go through it. That's a very, very good landmark article. You can always quote it. So these are different types. So I, I, I have a PDF. You can take it. I don't want to read through and waste time on this. Okay. Um, so Yoshida et al. Uh, did a study in uh, age of 1998 to find out how you can have uh, uh, unequal outer bows. You can have one side shorter bow, one side longer bow, or you can have equal bows. So we took this as a guideline and, and we, just, we did a study in 2006. Okay, uh, we uh, did, uh, we have trans, we have transudas, you know, the stress gauges, transudas. We did it with the help of the IIT guy. And these are the uh, transudas, which are connected to your uh, uh, computer through a stress management gauge machine. And uh, we kept it in an Instron. We used uh, a one side a standard one, and we had different hooks. For every hook, we generated a force. And what did we get? We found that good molar distillation obs observed where you had a shorter inner bow to lengthened outer bow. Shorter inner bow 
to the length and outer bow on the opposite side the sh the sh the shortened uh, sh the short the shorted one had lot of dissipating lateral forces molar distension force on the distillation side showed a gradual incre increase in mag magnitude so as the molar keeps moving the magnitude of force obviously would increase right because your molar tube goes more posteriorly your magnitude would would definitely increase so reverse pull so we know reverse pull is generally used in cases where you have a maxillary deficiency in the anteroposterior plane right maxillary deficiency in the anteroposterior plane so here the most important thing is when you do you see to that your point of force application for the reverse pull should be at a 45 degree angulation from the center of resin to the point where you're going to engage your elastic so if you don't do that what happens is your maxilla will start coming down like this and your mandible will start rotating downward backward but instead because you have a deficient maxilla you want the maxilla to translate anteriorly not move like this with an ans pointing downwards understand so then you'll have a rotational component of your mandible okay so that is that is better but not too much so that's why whenever you try to have an attachment you have a face bow right? you have a face bow right you give elastic from your bonded one to here but that force when you are going to given should be equal to your line of force 45 degree angulation from your occlusal plane you understand then only you will be able to get your maxilla forward nicely be so nice if you get like this now i know wow. very very difficult to get especially maxilla forward okay so now uh, every time when we say that i'm going to use a reverse pull we say that the best is you have a recent article by ultramac where you opens and close with a with the hyrax appliance but i actually wanted to find out if hyrax is really useful or not so we did a study to find out whether hyrax is useful so uh, we 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 used john sig and uh, hyrax we did a holographic study to see whether the forces gets dissipated on all throughout our maxillary sutures because that is what this, they claim to say no that it split your sutures and then it brings your maxilla forward so i we i wanted to know whether it really happens so with the help of one of my post graduate we did it so if you see this uh, the hyrax appliance uh the forces the holographic forces are almost around all your all your maxillary sutures so so hyrax is the appliance if you think that you want to get your maxilla forward right you have to open it up and close and see to that your maxilla comes forward so it 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 gave us a a a, a great avenue to open up when you compared with the spring jet appliance which actually works the same same as your hyrax appliance <clears throat> the chin cup we don't use chin cup uh, nowadays because uh, we say that when you're going to hold this up what happens your ramus will increase more and your vertical will open up more more that's why chin cup is uh, not used but chin cup can be used in combination with uh, uh, with your vertical pull as well as your parietal together so that you don't open up your uh, ramal length any any doubts in this when i'm going to hold my maxilla when i'm going to hold my chin like this okay i told you, you know energy you cannot stop the growth it should get redirected well you get redirected it the condyle goes and hits in your glenoid fossa okay so you're going to hold up like this so you're not allowing the mandible to grow in this direction so what will happen the ramus will start increasing okay and the width of the ramus will start also increasing so what happens you're going to increase your vertical the vertical will increase rather than trying to hold your mandible so that's why you don't use a chin cup nowadays either it is very necessary in a combination so mis maxillary intrusion splint i told you that it can be used when you want to get your uh, maxilla up we generally call it as gummy smile for patients who having gummy smile j hooks i told you that in case you want any intrusion of your anteriors okay uh, let's say you don't have your posterior so still you want to intrude your anteriors nowadays we have tads so you can do wonders but when we were there we never had something called as tads so that time probably we can use your j hooks for intrusion in case you don't have your posteriors at all now what are the innovations you can have uh, this is a very nice article in uh, uh, jco it's called as uh, uh, timed head gear uh, you can ask a patient and say are you wearing it regularly yes i'm wearing regularly they might not be wearing 
So what they did is they put a small clock in it, an electronic device. So every time they pull the uh, strap, it clock it runs around. Then you know how many hours the patient has on, whether the patient is telling lies or not. So it's called a timed headgear. And this is something called Genia Molar Anchorage System. So some kids say that I don't want to wear these helmets and all these bows. They took a chin as a unit and they started getting a maxilla powered. And this is one article published in uh, JCO. I am very fond of JCO because it's more clinical, not like AJO has too much of uh, theory in it. Okay. And uh, again, there's a vertical tube headgear where uh, headgear can be placed either instead of, uh, instead of horizontally, you place it vertically, you bend it and put. So you get intrusion of your posteriors. Uh, so you can uh, use uh, this, this modifications also can be done in case you want. This is also one good uh, article published. They say that in uh, reverse pull, instead of giving an up, instead of giving an uh, uh, something like a splint and trying to get your maxilla forward, a periodontist extracted uh, both the deciduous canines and then uh, he inserted it. So once he inserted, what happens is it uh, get anchored to your to, uh, to the bone. He put a small button and asked the patient to wear elastics on there, so the patient does not have a, a splint in it. So we and. Uh, uh, this is uh, the Ultramac uh, protocol. Uh, it's it's quite known by all of your postgraduates that uh, you open, close, open, close. Now you have Marpe also, um, a mini implant assisted uh, uh, Hyrax. So that also can be used. And uh, this is the bolage plates. We do a lot of bolage plates in our college. Uh, uh, many plates uh, where you can use mini plates here and then give class three elastics directly from the bone. I think Dr. Jada also, Dr. Chetan also was telling that if you want to give some uh, my function up, fixed functional appliance screwed on to your uh, mola to your bone directly, you get better amount of changes rather than any dental change. So probably you can use <clears throat> mini plates. Okay, uh, this is also a small study which was done. You can, uh, uh, this is AJODO December 2000. And this is one case where it's a class three, we used uh, uh, bollards plates, okay, and uh, we uh, corrected uh, the uh, class three situation. And uh, this is, as I said, uh, the, the, this is one more patient where what we did is instead of uh, using a splint, we, give, we gave tads. So we gave tads here, uh, from the tads, elastics were given and uh, almost uh, uh, it got uh, uh, corrected instead of using some splints. Now coming to headgear with functional appliances. So we know activator can be used with uh, headgears. Uh, binator also can be used with headgears. We know twin block can be used with headgears. Okay. And uh, 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 this is uh, twin block. He advocated headgears with Concord face post so that for class twos, you can use uh, this one. Uh, then uh, I think uh, Dr. Chetan spoke about uh, this Owen et al. JCO where it can, my functional plans can be uh, used with headgears also. Ah, this you can take a pick so you, you know uh, in headgears how much of point A change you get. Uh, in class two elastics, in activator by torquing or class three elastics and uh, in face mask, how much of uh, point A changes uh, you can achieve. Yeah, we'll go to case reports. A quick, a quick some some cases what we did in our department. Uh, this is a patient who came with uh, uh, with uh, excessive uh, show, so we thought we'll need to use a high pull headgear, try to intrude your posteriors, and uh, we did it. Uh, he was in his growth phase, and uh, we have achieved a, a good amount of uh, occlusion. Right? This is your uh, pre and your post. You can see how much of uh, intrusion we have achieved and how much of the upward forward rotation of the mandible. There's again a case where we used uh, 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 the high pull, but with a little more of a shorter outer bow with a greater angulation. And uh, this is how we uh, completed this case. Right, this is the pre and the post cephalogram. And uh, this is a case also with a, a deep bite. We used a high pull head gear and uh, we had a good amount of a change. And uh, uh, this is yet another case. We again used uh, uh, a shorter outer bow with a greater angulation and uh, uh, pre and post uh, thing. Uh, this is a class three where we used a face mask and we got a change. So 
again we use uh, we used a hyrax to open and close and we got the maxilla corrected and this is a cervical pull headgear he was a deep bite with uh, severe crowding uh, so we wanted distalization of the upper molars as well as extrusion both together so uh, we got that done and we got it corrected and uh, this is also uh, yet another patient we used uh, the outer bow which is down with a combination headgear so that uh, we can get some amount of extrusion as well as a minimal amount of distalization um this is a, a case with the twin block with the headgear so we wanted uh, advancement as well as restraining effect right uh, yeah this is just a quick uh, run through i think all of you are tired i can see people yawning uh, okay uh, thank you um, this is the best what i could do in a short time sir i think i finished on time best what i could do in the short time i could uh, have any questions uh, you know i know a lot of doubts are there i i know that's going beyond the head now so all are tired after long session and lunch Uh, any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nanda Kumar, for that uh, rapid fire presentation. Good. The no, with the this is how you know with the limited uh, resource now the mean the time. Uh, how best we can make use of the limited resource so what we have given him is only 45 minutes he said he was you know held in the throat and said okay finish it by 45 minutes i could take that liberty with nanda kumar so thank you very much so you are right on time uh, so if there is no questions we will stop here our um, online friends please note we have more than uh, 400 people viewing this program online. So it was indeed a great pleasure for, for all of us to have you online. Yes. So because of the constraint, we could not make it here. And uh, we wish all of you visit this place uh, and uh, be here, be part of uh, our uh, coming uh, PG convention is coming up in Mangalore. So please do visit us at that time. Uh, we will now go on to the department just for uh, another quick fire round of uh, byte registration uh, demonstration it's um it's already four o'clock uh, our patients are waiting so we will just go ahead there uh, before leaving i again remind you to complete the feedback form immediately thank you one of the feedback, Dr. Nanda Kumar, I would like to share with you is that the one of the feedback that we got is uh, this is too short a period. So all of us are expecting minimum of two days program. So that, that is for your credit. So we will plan a two days program from next year onwards, definitely. Yes, one half a day program for headgear and uh, exclusively half a day for uh, clinical demonstration. This is the first time we are organizing a, such a program here on this topic. So I did not expect it to be this hectic and uh, uh, this overwhelming uh, response. So anyway, thank you all for participating. We'll see you in the department in the fifth floor. Thank you.